most programs in these in these smaller areas in terms of proportion and comparison that you can see and even at the larger scale though for example one of the most striking factors was the, the amount of mixed use that existed was just one percent that sort of highlights the monocentricness of things so i broke down the landscape as a mosaic trying to understand what are the potential areas that i could intervene in and uh, at what scales that could happen and looking at the terrain as well and how it can impact it so inverting that sort of mosaic i was able to isolate some of the uh, zones that i could be uh, looking at as potentially as for intervention and trying to also understand and segregate them through the areas of the female cities which is basically a one mile radius and how they can form their own sustainable centers across the entire area around the park which is essentially very huge and uh, I sort of collaborated with another team from the studio which is working on a light trail proposal and this blue uh, line that you can see is the new addition that they are proposing in adjunct to the current Uh, metro rail light rail corridors which is everything on the left with the green the pink the yellow and the light blue line so i sort of took off from the idea of connecting the airport through the tesla uh, giga factory which is uh, going to propose here and under construction right now going to the park and reaching all the way to main earth so that sort of became a part of my zone and just to visualize the site sort of this it has a highly past- pastoral uh image to it and it's it's filled with road infrastructure that is not designed for the capacity that's not going to be there for at least another few decades so it you you get basically these large roads around undeveloped landscapes so uh just to understand and place my project into this hypothesis where the current peri urban fabric is agriculture and then you have transit and then you have community which is all separated and segregated the diagram that sort of i started looking at is what would the, what would a community be when the agriculture becomes part of the city and then it responds to ecology and becomes a part of the lifestyle and the community as well also giving identity to it so these are some of the few sketches that i was sort of experimenting with and trying to understand how the agriculture community and this hypothesis can be converted into a project so uh getting started with the with the design this is the current uh site skeleton you can see the lake and the park here at this dominating edge in the highway passing through the center sh130 and this main road on top and the rail lines that are with the stops that are designed for it and the red the, the lighter red lines are sort of the existing road network that is on site and then the contours sort of highlight the, the flood plains and the low lying areas so the, the first response towards this was to look at uh, the flood plain which is very dominant on site as a productive landscape and converting into an agricultural corridor because that's that's one of the ways that I did not want to isolate the flood plain that we take that line and move away from it but how can we actually make it a part of the design and the project and then the low lying area sort of start becoming uh, there was and ponds across the entire landscape and then you you have this sort of land situated between the two dominating factors of the park and the and the flat plain and then overlaying it with the base grid of 300 by 300 feet just to start understanding the scale and uh, one of the things that i also wanted to do was have uh, variations of block sizes across that can have permutations and combinations like 300 by 300 300 by 600 and 300 by 900 based on the program and usage uh So I started under, also understanding the transit network and what are the opportunities of uh, uh, ahead of it, and then the highway sort of connects the project currently at, at this area where this is the point of entry to this land. Uh, there are some ex- more points of entry that I'm creating across connecting the park and the and the corridor. There are uh, larger transit routes passing towards the community here, Hornsby, which is Hornsby Bend, and then moving up towards Manor. And on the right, uh, there is uh, on the far right is Webbable. So how can this connect to its context in terms of what are the ag- main axes of interaction? And then the, the the dotted green lines are the current urban trails, and then I've added uh, the urban trails around this agricultural corridor to, to sort of feed into this network of pedestrian and biking corridors. Uh, splitting them up, uh, the first there are four scales of streets. 
uh, that sort of uh, stem from this block diagram as a, as a schematic diagram. So you have your existing streets and your ecology, but the idea is to have uh, 300 feet blocks that are separated by four uh, streets. The first are uh, greenways that sort of go across and cut the whole thing and connect them through public transit, which is which are around 80 feet wide and the primary streets that, that get within them, which are essentially these small ones and just three feet wide and then move into some secondary streets which are in woods which are 40 feet and then within all of these there'll be residential development of that can have internal and social streets which are 20 feet and then the variations of streets sort of allow for this built relationship of the built fabric with the, with the road that create various streetscapes and opportunities for people to always be placed within an interesting proportion of City. Uh, the next sort of step was to bring all of this together through, through ecology. So the road network comes together from both sides through these fingers that sort of start coming in from the agricultural corridor, becomes a part of the city on the right. And on the left, the park extends itself into the city as well, creating this uh, first linear expression along the main axis that connects and then interspersing itself uh, as, as parts and green spaces across the entire uh, In terms of land use, the first uh, understanding was that it's going to be an agriculturally based, productive uh, community. It's, it may you need to have a few industrial zones which are sort of responding to it and they're close to a station so as to use it and become a part of the larger network of distribution and also be self sustainable. The next one is the schools, which are uh, strategically placed to create micro communities where uh, people who live around there can have access to education. And they're also aligned to most of the green uh, areas and parks in the in in the plan, so as to have uh, open areas and grounds and places for recreation for students to always be there. Then, as public and administrative buildings, there are the three station buildings that exist and the civic buildings sort of come along this line, which is essentially the, uh, I'm, I'm converting this entire area, the, the line, which is the watershed line that exists beyond which the slope goes either left or right uh, into a biking and uh, walking corridor that connects to the urban trail. So the idea is to have all of the public and administrative buildings along that line to make it more prominent in, in that sense. Uh, commercially, yeah, the buildings sort of align towards this green edge buffer, which exists on both sides of the highway, which is this dark green patch that you can see here. So all of the land use uh, closer to that edge is commercial to, to block the noise towards the residential community as well. And the mixed use starts placing itself on the central spine, which sort of comes in from the highway so, so that there is ample amount of uh, the retail and other functions that are on the street whenever people want to come into the community. The next is retail and market, which is sprinkled across uh, smaller housing typologies and other parts of the city uh, to maintain the 15 minute city logic of having multifunctional zones everywhere. And there's a larger public market area over here to which I'll come to. Remember. So comprehensively, this is uh, the proportion of everything and then the rest of it, it's sort of white which is types of housing that, that exist. And the overall framework comes about to a plan like this, where the, the agriculture sort of starts responding within the city, connects the ecological layers across and the parks are aligned, aligned to it. Buildings scale starts shifting in as, in as you move toward the center, like you move towards from the industrial zone to the housing and then the schools and then there's commercial on, along the edge. Uh, in terms of uh, the water on site, uh, so this, this larger line that is the watershed line is the highest point uh, beyond which the water starts going either ways. So the flood plain actually becomes like a retention of all of the water that sort of starts coming in and it helps with the agriculture. And then over here, the pond becomes one of the sites of retention of water. And then you have along these axes, you have bioswales that sort of connect the entire area in the, in the slope that again go back into this network of water. Uh, in terms of production, there's, so again, going back to that shifting from the peri-urban scale to the urban scale, uh, there is, you start from the farming and river farming, which is the right, and then you move towards 
permaculture houses uh, farming and then you have greenhouses hydroponics aquaponics and then moving in at the smallest scale you have community farms within housing typologies and group crop farms as well so there is a there is a shift of a uh, gradual shift of scale of scale of production that goes across the community and all of this sort of feeds into the industrial uh, zones that are here and but the, the idea was also to create like a public community market over here with farm to table restaurants with people selling the produce and it's a sort of closer to the highway so people who are traveling here can always come here the people in the community can also it becomes like a marker of identity and it also feeds into the larger network of distribution where you connect towards the main or on the top web of on the right it goes out to the airport and then using sort of these light rail linkages it can also come back to austin and then a dafen which is closer to this uh, a new neighborhood closer to this area so it sort of feeds into the larger network of distribution uh zooming in so this is a schematic diagram of housing typology that exist so we start from uh they don't necessarily exist in the same configuration but we start from a farmstead which is closer to towards the edge of the agriculture with two units per acre in density and then we start moving towards single family homes which have street access and then uh homes which have alley access of uh, along with some retail and community uh functions on the plots and then you have courtyard housing where again there's option there's scope for having retail on the ground floor where people who stay there can always uh convert it into a commercial opportunity and also have you no know, houses and central courtyards and community farms sort of uh, responding to that local scale and then you have row houses moving towards eight units per acre and then moving up towards town homes apartments and condominiums and essentially gradually increasing in the density and then towards the larger plots we have uh, the smaller housing projects that sort of situated in a 300 by 300 feet block this is a larger 300 by 640 feet block where you have opportunities for two types of mixed use so one is where you combine the ground floor community uh, buildings and public functions with the commercial and then you have housing on top and the other kind is where you have ground floor retail largely and then you have housing on top along with some roof gardens and roof farms and you they the the longer plots sort of allow for this kind of a street network where the streets are wider and the, they're longer uh in terms of the network and hierarchy of the street networks uh the second typology is again of the mixed a which is commercial is community but of a different configuration of uh, of uh, volumes and then here this allows for smaller streets to start coming in into the 300 feet width for the larger streets sort of start aligning in themselves the longer width of the block and how it also comes together is through uh through visualizing and looking like something like this where you start from the industrial zone which is towards the bottom of the uh, the agricultural belt and then you move in towards if you see the scale of the building that's sort of large over here and then you have you have schools coming in with uh, along the rivers and parks you have permaculture farming and greenhouses coming in and through these fingers of uh, of agriculture and then you have the green uh pedestrian biking and walking trail that connects to the the river and the park over here as in when you move up the scale of the building starts shifting and then now now it's become more smaller you have farms that's coming in closer to the park for people who sort of work there to always have easy accessibility you have greenhouses entering the city uh which connects on either sides to the existing communities and people can always have access to local food and local produce uh you have uh, the walking train biking trail again continuing over here and then sort of civic buildings along it having uh police stations fire station there were civic buildings and and so on and so forth and then you have apartment buildings along the river edge and the park to sort of commercially make it more viable and moving towards the center of the community you have the large park that sort of connects on uh, either sides which is in the center which is essentially over here and then you have schools aligning on that edge and largely apartments and condos sort of uh edging the school and along the park as well you we have apartments and mixed use that sort of has an overview of the park and uh, there's commercial buildings over on this side along the central spine and more mixed use buildings going on over here further on the other side where you connect to the park edge uh this is the the light trail that sort of 
exists along this entire line. There's underpass towards access to the park, and then the park itself ex- uh, extends itself into the community through this linear, uh, through this linear patch, and then becomes a part of the agriculture and intersects and creates these interesting uh, patches for uh, for access. And then there's apartments and commercial uh, and other buildings sort of looking over the park as well. And moving inwards, you have sort of smaller scale housing, which is single family homes, courtyard housing, and then so on. Uh, this, these are just some of the visualizations of how, how things I look at. This is closer to the highway where you have the buffer corridor, and then you start having commercial uh, buildings along it. And then this is somewhere uh, within the agricultural landscape where you have the river farming, and then you have trails and people walking around, and you have people performing and working uh, in, on the farms. And uh, this is sort of largely the, the visualization of how the entire community would come together through this elements of the landscape city, which is uh, agriculture, uh, landscape, and water. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, sorry, I, I missed it. This was the work of the whole studio, right? Or no, no. This is oh, this, no, is, this is, is the work of Sanket. This wow. This, uh, yeah. I mean, that's really impressive. <laughs> it's a huge amount of work, and uh, um, congratulations. I mean, it's it's just uh, really quite wonderful, and uh, the graphics are really clear, and your ideas are. Um, I'm really impressed. Uh, I will say one thing, Renee. I, I, I might have mentioned it in the email, but it's an interesting mixture of students. We have uh-huh. New York students, MARC 1 students, and post-professional urban design students. Uh-huh. Uh, Sanket belongs to that latter category. He is a post-professional urban design student. Okay. Still. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> Uh, the uh, you were mentioning. Uh, um, I mean, I, I I repeat, and I'm really impressed. So I, I just have some questions in relation to how some of the aspects of what you've done uh, might be working. For example, in relation to the trails, I live in an area which is um, not terribly dense and. Uh, the schools, uh, the kids, particularly in the middle ranges, go to their houses. Uh, they don't use public transport and go through the trails. So the school is connected to trails which lead into um, the residential zone so that the students never have to cross traffic. Or And it, it seems to work really well. And you mentioned uh, trails and you mentioned schools, uh, but the trails seem to be connected, correct me if I'm wrong, to a more general um, system uh, to do maybe with recreation, uh, but I didn't hear you explain the trails in relation to the more uh, domestic uh, school relationship. And I imagine, am I correct? Um, yeah, 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 that's it. so. And I imagine that would be a relatively easy thing to do, uh, but uh, it, it's something which I, I, I repeat in the area of li- living is working really, really well. And I would imagine it, it's something uh, you could incorporate relatively easily. It means that there that the trail system becomes. Um, more of a capillary system than this more general um, bicycle trail you have. And um, maybe that, uh, you also mentioned the bioswales, um, which might be, again, in this area, are are really connected to bioswales um, and little parts are connected to this uh, trail system, which then connects to the schools. Um, making for a really successful um, 
system, which I, I think you could easily incorporate. Uh, the other thing related to this, and again, I'm, I'm really impressed. I, I do, uh, Berkeley does have a post uh, professional urban design um, program, and I rarely see one student do uh, work of this caliber. So again, um, any comments I make are just for a conversation or suggestions. They're not. Um, uh, it's yeah, just really I impressive. Work. Yeah. Um, um, sorry, in speaking, uh, is to do with the the vegetation itself. I didn't see. Um, and maybe this is just asking for way too much, but uh, I sort of, it seemed all really well organized, uh, but in, in the end, I lacked in a sort of a, a sense of what this place was all about, um, sort of as a, as a place. And I mean, I understand that it's really well anchored in relation to the water and the airport and, um, it seemed extremely well organized in a very sensitive way. But um, if you were to ask me what, what do you think this place looks like or what does it feel like? Or um, given that you guys are speaking of our garden city or what do you call it, landscape city, what does the landscape look like? What do these trees look like? Um, I keep thinking, uh, because Juan has mentioned um, the, the book I, I wrote, there's a, there's a city uh, called Mendoza in Argentina, which is basically in a desert area, and it's irrigated by a system of acequias, which is a, it comes from Spain, actually the Arabs introduced it into Spain, and the whole city in the middle of the desert is, sort of full of these uh, amazing, beautiful trees. And um, I, I sort of missed that uh, some image of, I, I know you showed some images in the end, but they seem a little generic to me. Um, I didn't get a good sense of where as a, as a, as a new city this wanted to go. Um, I repeat, I think it's incredibly well organized and so on. But, just more speaking about an experiential, and I should stop here. I, I don't know why I started speaking in the first place. Um, well, you're happy that we you started, Rene. <laughs> well, we cannot we cannot hear you, John. You don't seem to be muted, but for some no, not now you muted. You're unmuted, but you we cannot hear you. I think it's the microphone. Yeah, the microphone may not be. Without the microphone. Could you hear me now? Yep. Now, now, yeah. now we do. Okay, very good. I'll take the microphone up. Okay, good. So, <clears throat> thank it. You know, first of all, um, congratulations eh, for the, the work you did. Eh? I think it's quite amazing. I think Rene already uh, mentioned to that, but I think it's quite complete and it touches all different dimensions and the scale. I think uh, really congratulations for that. But of course, uh, probably you, you expect from us certain type of um, moving beyond your project or giving a certain orientation, further orientation to your project. Eh? Probably, I think there is one question that relies very much with the, the topic of the studio, which in fact is this idea of the landscape city, no? it's a way which is very interesting and very, and. In a certain way, the landscape in your project is very much um, having a certain component in my eyes, very urban. No, it's the way I feel that your project, by using a certain decomposition of the grid, which I think is very intelligent, the way that you are deploying the grid and then also accepting how the the water cuts the grid or makes the grid in different labyrinthic form that acknowledge the topography and the uses. I think that is very well treated in, in your project. But it seems to me that the component of the agriculture, that is the way you are using several times to say, well, that I think is, is very minimal in your project. No? Uh, Sam Kett, in the way I think sometimes it's very important when, when you, do, um, you deploy one scheme like that, 
and then to imagine what are the real programs that are the way. It seems to me that when we look at this image, it's a little bit urban, it's a little bit, we can imagine that there are even some industries, certain activity, but I don't feel that we can call that there is a real agriculture in that scheme. Okay? And that, that then I think it's better that perhaps these type of parks that could be more gardens or what in Europe we call allotments in a way that people can have certain space that they can they can grow vegetables or this type of that I think will be more appropriate. There's a way that you are creating a, a place with a certain level of density, which I think is is fine. Yeah? I don't know. My question to you will be how do you fix the density in your scheme? Do you have an, any any idea or if you feel that certain sectors the density will be higher? I appreciate yeah. very much in the way you deploy the project is this capacity of allowing different uses and different morphologies is the way that the things could happen and they can change and doesn't affect the project is the way and that is the power of the grid. I always feel if the grid is properly placed into the territory, into the topography, the grid in itself can be the, the leading of the project in the way. And that is something that your project is showing the capacity. You change certain density in one place or the other, or you change the users, and nothing happened. Nothing seriously happened against your project. And I think this is probably the way that the American city has been always created. This idea that you have certain rules that they are beyond the architecture and the open space. I agree with uh, with Rene that probably more effort into the way that the public space or the space in between the blocks can be defined, it will be a good strategy to move this project forward. Yeah? I think that we imagine if some of these places, uh, the spaces, they are more park or, or what, what is the, the feeling of that? Is the space near the school where you create a, you call a small center, how this center will be organized? Will be through a plaza, through a, a common place? I don't know, yeah? but uh, that could be a, good way that your project can move on. In some way, I feel that this project should a, a little bit take more into consideration what we usually call the intermediate scale. The scale that is in between the blocks. It's not just one block after the other, but takes two or three blocks. You try to do in a, in a certain way when you are organizing some of these pieces and you are going and you said, well, here there are certain allow me to say that there are certain neighborhoods that they are having a little bit lower density. I mean, that I think it shows this capacity of working at this scale. Right? But for me, I don't know if you can agree that perhaps by taking that more into the, what we can call the, more the subsector, and at the moment your project is, could be perhaps a good way of composing mixed mix uses, but at the same time to make them together. Yeah? Probably for me, one of the problems of the, of the outskirts of the Greek city in America is the need for this intermediate scale project. Okay. If I could say an example, for instance, one of the big successes of the Radburn scheme, one of the famous schemes from Clarence Stein, is this capacity of putting several things together and to have an idea about the public space next to the, to the block. In a way, yeah? each block is related to the other. Yeah? That those are things that probably you still have the capacity. If, if you uh, can uh, continue, or you like to to develop in the way you you can you can move on. Yeah? But again, I'm not saying that as a critique, but more as opening windows from your scheme. Is the way yeah? probably, for instance, the space along the the highway. That you mentioned in one of your render, yeah? thank it. I think those space um, could be also uh, fantastic opportunities for not making the render that you are presenting is a little bit, I would say, uh, naive, no, because of the way you accept the, the highway, but the highway how it could be treated in the future. Yeah? Probably we know that in the future will be driverless car. How are they going to be in your in your idea of the future? Are you going to have a special lane for it, or are you going to detach from trees and uh, watch with the traditional cars that will coexist for several decades? Perhaps I don't know if you have any idea. But if you have, um, if you are so kind, 
you would like to, to respond, Sanket. I think it's a fantastic scheme. Do you have any idea about this, um, how the intermediate scale can help you in moving that? And also about the agriculture, how do you feel about this um, point that I make about that? Eh? But uh, except uh, that those are more um, positive uh, the evaluation and remarks to your scheme, which is uh, fantastic. Eh? And I appreciate very much that you come to this area after looking at the region and understanding how the water, how the ecology of the place is. Eh? Congratulations, thank you again. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I can just follow up with congratulating you. Like it's so rich detail. You know? like, uh, it's, uh, and I think it's already uh, at this version already better than, than most, most builds. So like it's, uh, I think def definitely already like contribution. When I, when I think how to spin it further into future, so you offer in a way already two departures with two kind of diagrammatic drawings, which maybe have to, to think that further then. The first is you show this opposition between large scale agriculture, the cooperative agriculture and kind of little nesting of the, the existing suburban. And, and then in a way, like you make this collage, what happens when I'm in a way uh, going to more like a Jefferson-like self-sustained, like completely you know, interweaving again the, the agriculture with the, with the housing or the farms. Which of course, like it was always the, the, the idea of a self-sustaining uh, farm and like you know, uh, one, one farmhouse, uh, it's, uh, it's acre of land. It's always a romanticism. No? And, and I think you offer in a way the, the entry that, that you say, yeah, what actually happens when we begin to take care about generally about farming and uh, you, you also, you, you begin house farming. So what you actually now bet is much more greenhouse, which anyhow vertical farming will be one of the most radical revolutions, I think, uh, how we consider anyhow a relation between hinterland or not hinterland in a way disappears with that, the idea of that. So, so that's interesting that in a way, there's, a, there's already you offer in a way the idea to think a continuity no, because this will be corporations which take care about this kind of artificial, uh, not like agricultural actually landscapes. And, and then you show like a second thing is that you show this kind of existing streets in this kind of like really, I mean, the existing landscape is like, well, no, it's flat, it's like with shrubs and it's actually, it's not pleasant. It's not like a pleasant landscape. It's not when I'm currently living in North Austin, when you have, have these majestic trees everywhere. And the reason why you have these majestic trees in Austin is not that they are by nature made, but because people care. So they grow because also people water those. Not like, and, and this we have to understand that we, we come to a stage where if you want really to, to foster a, a flourishing landscape, we come to a stage that we have to care about it. And you have this, this kind of entries um, that of course, like single person cannot take care about that one. So by, by bringing this in, in a way, the idea of caretaking at first of the, the agriculture notion, but what happens now when I'm much more merging that also like what, what Rene mentioned, like when I, when I need these, or it would be very good for communities pathways from, the, uh, from schools, but the same is for groceries or not, how I come, with a bicycle or per feet, how I can anyhow access the, 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 the fabric no? outside my home. So I think there's an entry really to, to get a, a, a new version uh, in a way how you really integrate uh, in a very realistic way, actually, landscape. So this, this I liked actually in your, your project as a, so it gives me a lot of thinking. So thanks. Well, I think that uh, uh, Dean. I think we probably need to move to the to the to the next group. But uh, I would say that the the especially for those that are not familiar with with Austin, the trees are so important that in a way I think Sanke the comment about the presence of the trees and how that has been becoming inherently part of the growth of the city is a very important aspect. So those a lot of the a lot of the trees in Austin were planted on land that was formerly agricultural land that it became so it's an urban forest it's a man-made forest but it is a very interesting notion that these 
trees could make more of a presence in, in, in your in your in the experiential side of your city. I think that Dean, if you agree, let's move to uh, Ramsey, Andrea, and uh, and uh, Riley and Anna. So reviewers, this will be a, a team project. The one that we're going to show you now is uh, these are four uh, undergraduate students. And they're working in, in another site within this general area. Just to start sharing the screen. Go ahead. And uh, it is uh, um, they they work together in this case developing the the whole scheme as a team. Hi. Hi. Oh. So much echo. Hey, I'm Andrea. Yeah, if you guys have two computers in the same room, like one of you is going to have to mute your audio so it'll only come from one computer. Okay, is it better now? Yes. Yep. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> okay, I'm Ramsey. I'm Anna. I'm Andrea. <laughs> and this is um, our project Colorado Oxbow, and our focus is on bringing Austin's green identity into the eastern periphery. So we started to analyze this area in East Austin, um, and looking at the site, we noticed first uh, the proximity to downtown and um, to the left, you can see the Longhorn Dam, which marks the end of the waterfront area, which is um, beloved by Austinites and really central to the downtown area, the you know Lady Bird Lake or Town Lake area now, um, which is really um, celebrated and integrated with the identity of Austin. So we wanted to retain this um, waterfront identity and really celebrate it, and so that was part of the inspiration for choosing this site along the water, uh, the river, sorry, the Colorado River. And then additionally looking at the gray areas, which represent um, future development projects that have been approved by the city of Austin, we began to notice that um, these areas that are quickly growing further to the east of the river bend there, um, compared with the density of downtown, leaves this um, area that we're calling the oxbow really drastically underutilized and um, underappreciated because of its nature currently as a floodplain. So by inserting a new dam, the oxbow dam further along the east of the river, we hope to, and then diverting water along these canals, we hope that um, we can you know, eliminate its nature as a floodplain and really create um, lots of more usable land that um, is located ideally really near downtown um, with great access to um, eastern downtown area and um, great waterfront um, identity, which is retaining that beloved, you know, green identity of Boston. And yeah, just going off that, considering like um, Austin's, um, some of these like key spots for Austin's identity and um, increasing like biodiversity and using like native plants and things. They were just considerations that we wanted in this um, point on the map that we thought was really crucial and a huge um, development potential for Austin. And uh, these are some existing values that we had from our Utopia project that we thought served us well going forward with this one. And some main ideas, we wanted to have it be very accessible and less reliant um, on cars. So everything's very uh, walkable and bikeable. And we wanted very diverse housing. And there was a big emphasis on um, the landscape, both recreationally and um, with productive landscapes. And uh, yeah. And this uh, fishbone system is a strategy that we developed also for our utopia where the spine acts as the waterway, or yeah, spine acts as waterways, and it has um, these canals and things that break off of it, and there's just a diverse landscape embedded within um, the skeleton, and that provides opportunities to pack in parcels of um, activity with like a string of uh, transportation around that. 
This shows that fishbone strategy. Like if, you, if you guys can speed it up a little bit because we we're a little tighter on time, so it would be good if you can get it. Just 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 move it a little faster. But, okay. but we'll, we'll try to make it. so that's this is that fishbone just um, kind of abstracted across our site, which inspired uh, our design process through the semester and um, the desire to have um, access to those amenities and parks and the waterfront. So these are just some of the potential um, relationships to the green space and the river and some of the early explorations that we did earlier in the project. Um, and this is more of just like a zoom in of the relationship of rivers to development in different ways in which the communities and neighborhoods could relate to the water. Um, so this is just a um, abstract diagram showing our overall system of organization within the OXPO with the um, blue outer um, area being the Colorado River and then the inner uh, blue strips and green strips being the canals and um, green spaces and then the hubs being uh, the, or the neighborhoods being the circles in the middle. Um, and then this diagram just shows our process of um, how we created our system with the um, uh, parkway first, and then um, the village boulevards, and then the village boundaries, and then um, the village centers. And then we implemented canals um, to separate each of the little neighborhoods um, and green belts also. Um, and this just kind of shows the overall integration of neighborhoods in the land. So how and how it's, it creates valuable land for each neighborhood, um, valuable land that's close to the canals and the green space. And um, looking at the site, there was um, some roads in that river bend currently, um, but a lot of that is undeveloped and unused. And so looking at um, implementing new roads, we had several connection points. Um, we wanted, like Riley said, we have that main boulevard down the middle, but we also have several points that connect to um, so, sort of like over to East um, Cesar Chavez and 7th Street, um, having a crucial connection point for downtown. And there's a layering of these roads, like we saw and how those um, interact with the river canals. And a little zoomed in so you can see some of those connection points a little bit better in the layering of like the primary, secondary, tertiary systems. And during our site visit, we noticed a um, large variation of housing typologies and all the neighborhoods were very separate. So that was something we wanted to combat um, and create um, a new model for moving forward. And a lot of this area experiences um, high rates of poverty and there's a strong connection to displacement and gentrification in East Austin. And so these were important considerations for our design um, and being thinking about like having improved housing, job opportunities and access to transit. Um, like Anna said, after visiting the site, we did some more research about the current housing. Um, right now there's a variety of housing types within the area, um, but there's a lot of different densities. Um, but we also found that there's a lack of middle class housing, especially like permanent middle class housing. Um, so we were really intrigued by that and um, that kind of inspired um, us as we moved forward to create um, a more permanent type of housing that is accessible to middle class. Um, and so these are the different housing typologies that we created. Um, and by mixing all of them into the neighborhoods, we our goal is to create a diverse community um, so that it's accessible to a, a wide range of income levels from like high income, mid income to low income. So <clears throat> this shows a little bit, this was a really early kind of like RT analysis of this concept, but the idea would be that there, the amenities are um, dispersed in a way that allows for everyone to have access to them and um, also cater to different income levels by, you know, things that are closer to those amenities are perhaps um, higher income levels or have greater density. And so then it levels out a little bit more with 
um, other housing that's closer to the roads. And so it just becomes um, mixed use with everyone having access to those areas. And then this was a little bit later, just emphasizing um, that the areas with the higher property values will be areas of greater density. So in the second and the density and access drawings, you can really see how that um, those areas around the green and the water canals become with greater density and um, greater heights. Um, so this is just a zoomed in um, plan of one of the neighborhoods show it, where you can see um, the different types of housings um, with different uh, separated by units. Um, and also it, this is it's more clear here um, how we, we wanted to make the edges more dense and the, cent the areas more central and um, less dense. In some sections uh, showing that Central Parkway and how it's embedded in the landscape and is surrounded by like rows of trees with trails on the side, and then another one showing um, sort of an idea of what that could be like in the commercial areas. Um, and then looking a little bit more in detail about some of the neighborhoods and the edges of like, housing and uh, greenhouses and what those little central park spaces could feel like for the community. This uh, just zooms in a little bit more to really show that emphasis on the landscape and relationship with nature, um, really looking at the, the way that the canals could connect to ecological buffers and areas where um, nature can have a really healthy ecosystem, and then the parks and trails and amenities and the ways that everything is accessible and um, yeah, just uh, creates a lot of great property. And looking at that sort of in detail of how those edges could interact together and provide um, different parks and gardens and um, riparian buffers. And in this perspective, we wanted to show, uh, highlight the like gardens and parks and um, spaces, the greenhouses for those neighborhoods and how people would have um, sort of daily interaction with that and how that would provide like local food and things like that and um, looking at also how that interacts with the um, larger surrounding landscape um, in this one a little bit. Read that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so these are just some perspectives to kind of get some more um, insight into what the atmospheric quality of this a neighborhood or a, a town would, a, a little hub would be like, um, whether you're in a canal or playing on a um, green belt, which is just to get some feeling. <laughs> um, it takes a closer look at the commercial area and just the way in which it's very close to the surrounding neighborhoods, um, just providing like grocery stores, retail stores, restaurants, um, but they're all very accessible to all neighborhoods and it's meant to be uh, no more than a mile away from housing and other kinds of buildings. So, um, yeah, it's meant to keep everything at a very human scale. And zooming in a little more, this is more of a section going through this commercial area with um, like just different sections of maybe having like a food truck park, retail spaces, um, having like a central axis and a lot of walking space and like wide sidewalks. And zooming in a little more, this is just like the relationship of how the commercial areas and the green areas interact and they're always like between buildings so it doesn't become this very dense um, city center or like a big, with very big high rise buildings or anything like that. This, at the end of every um, like city center hub, we wanted to keep green spaces um, very available and have more of like community gathering spaces rather than condensing like a big amount of commercial area into a strip. And so we kept everything very. And finally, we also decided to assign like designated um, lanes for buses, um, bike paths, and then just regular traffic. 
and it's meant to be uh, for low traffic to keep everything at a human scale and not have it be like a highway or anything like that going through the middle of neighborhoods. And um, so this provides a chance for a um, active like living landscape um, that deals with this ecological flood control and enhanced biodiversity and has multiple um, amenities like wetlands and um, rainwater harvesting gardens and things like that. And another section um, showing sort of that connection to downtown and what the waterfront would feel like. That's everything. Thank you. Yes, thank you all. For thank you. Yeah, I'm to the project is uh, very, also very rich detailed and I think also a very realistic in a way proposal. Uh, of course, like uh, after PhD on Hilversheim, I get some P uh, deja vus uh, with, with your project with the uh, fish bone, bone structure. Um, I don't want to comment on, on that. Um, I mean, like, uh, what's, what's in, or like, maybe more question is um, when you, you focus a lot in your presentation at first on the commercial stripe, no? in way uh, they say that there's like, that this kind of urban life uh, happens. And, but then at the end, like, you shift to this, or so the best renderings, the best visuals are these, uh, then these, these parks, what you have on the, on the water. Did you? Mm -hmm tried to overlap both that you have also in a way, I mean, not only a park as like recreation, but thinking having this, this urban more on the, on the open fringes that you completely in a way separate this uh, more from cars or so? I, I think so. If I understand properly what you're asking, it's um, along those commercial areas, we do have a lot of parks integrated in, and and bringing those canals and green strips through commercial areas does like occur in the project, if that's, if that's what you mean. No, but, um, you, you develop this, this uh, uh, schemes of this kind of green fingers. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, okay, you integrate then also kind of streets and, and so on. And, and then in the original, as I understand, like one green finger is also with a, with a water. So like then, and, uh, and now that you very richly separate in a way the, the commercial from in a way like what is a recreation or it gets very separated uh, in, a, in a functional modernist sense. And, and you do this also with other interactions like for example with the housing models, you uh, connect income directly with the urban morphology. They say like there's this low income, high income kind of kind of housing. But for example, in the urban block, I could also have a penthouse and I have high income there and, and so on. Or I could have a single, uh, like an urban block, uh, not a town, town block or something, where mm -hmm. I have like small, small studios or so just as a, in the size of single family. Right. And, and so on. No? And the which is that maybe I also like, but more interesting is like, yeah, like, I'm not, um, it's, it's a very intriguing scheme with the water, which I think is like, this is uh, very beneficial, or like, of course, like Austin, like this is the, 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 the lake, no? so all of a sudden you extend the living on it. And it's always the question, how you in a way, living means more than, than recreation or more than a few. No? And could you like, you made a decision then not having the, well, I know, like you focus on a lot that all the kind of amenities of or like kind of public life with a commercial or whatever is along the streets, which is exactly in the center, but not in uh, in another like on the on the waterway. Like, did, do you have it also opposite or like what was your thinking or in uh, uh, not connecting it? Like, what was just when you decided that to I think that we do I uh, the commercial strip isn't the only place where commercial activity occurs um, 
we the idea was that like the schools and other um and you know you could have a grocery on your block further along different areas there could be a restaurant overlooking a canal it's it's all supposed to be very integrated if that's answering your question it's just that the commercial hubs are the the primary um place that you might go if you have something you know a big office building or or you know, a certain kind of a point, doctor's appointment that doesn't exist somewhere else. It's, those are the main hubs of the neighborhood. Okay. okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Good. Oh. Well, thank you for for the presentation. I think it's I think it's a very interesting the way that you are crossing several scales. I think that it seems to me that the the proposal you're doing with this intuition about the fishbone strategy later is converted in something that is becoming very an organic grid, eh? like a, an organic maxi grid over the territory. I think that works quite well in your scheme with the central access in the middle. I think those elements are very powerful in your scheme. When you see your, your final presentation in this board, I don't know if you agree with me, but perhaps the buildings that they are denser, perhaps in my eyes, don't you feel that they are too concentrated in one spot? Do we need that? Let me put the other way around. If, if you believe that you have a very powerful frame, what I call the strategy that you are defining, which is very much mixing the access and the landscape, you are, I think that is the power of your proposal, that you have this type of organic system that relies landscape and the road, let's say the infrastructure. And I think that that is very common sense if you want, but could be very powerful then this frame could be the real spin-off of your project. If that is the case, if you follow my, uh, my story, means that perhaps a lot of other suggestions that you have, like the renders that you show here, like the sections, I appreciate very much that in the sections you are integrating the open space in between the buildings, telling a certain capacities how these spaces could be nice for the people and the water, I mean, the, and the big trees. I mean, this, uh, I think, is very powerful in your scheme. Then you are creating a sort of catalog of the spaces, sections, housing of different densities. You have all this repertoire, these elements. And these elements can, can fit into your overall scheme, allowing that the time makes the decisions about that. Because what happened in the American city? Where is the place of of the, the shops, or where is the place of the petrol station? In the place where you have this type of visibility and where you have access, special access. And those are the places that you have a system, you, have, you create a frame, and the spin-off of this frame will be done by this type of special locations, the special conditions. Because in front, in front of the water, in front of the river, most probably it's going to be a nice place to have certain, I don't know, if a terrace for a restaurant or certain sports activities related to the water. These type of things that you have already in your catalog. But for me, the only um, the suggestion or the question to you will be, don't you feel that now you are concentrating too much the big buildings in one spot, and perhaps these buildings, if you imagine that the, the urban, allow me to say, the urban fabric of your scheme, what is the urban fabric in a low density area? Probably is the, the private land, the trees, and the places for the buildings. This is what we should call the urban fabric. No? What is prepared for to be city? And this is like a carpet in your in your project. It's like a carpet that's going to be very green, very well organized with this organic system. And then what are the points that they're going to be higher density, that they get more visibility, that they get more 
intense intensity. Eh? Those are the places where you have perhaps the crossing of the road or the arrival to this area, the places where you have infrastructure and water and landscape. Eh? Those are the places that probably the city, the, the traditional way that the city is produced, those are the places where you have more density or intensity. Eh? I think perhaps in that, just to end up my, my comment that I think is you want to be very positive about the, the explorations and the type of catalog of different things that you are exploring, which I think is very interesting. Probably my critique will be in this uh, left drawing, bottom drawing, where I feel that perhaps the density is too much um, concentrated. And perhaps if you allow me to say the the way that the different morphologies are playing together, they are a little bit clashing in my eyes. Eh? The way and that I think is what uh, we don't see in, in the other part of your scheme. Eh? When, when we see this scheme, let me just point it out, if you allow me to, yeah. for instance, here, we can see that what, what happened here. You have a clear, a clear scheme. You have a very powerful scheme that goes in the middle. And then the other could happen easily later on in the way. Eh? That, that is what I feel the your scheme is in my eyes is based on certain structure and after this structure with the connections and the views to the water and the access to the water the things could happen according to your catalog huh? okay. no thank you and congratulations because i think it's a it's not easy i imagine to to work with a group of four and to be able to to create a to synthesize in something that it seems to me quite a strong coming with this idea of the dam and creating new conditions for the river. I think I know it. last time I was in, in Austin, I was really very impressed by the quality of the water and the way that by treating the water, you are creating new urban conditions, even that is very open and landscape oriented. It's the way it seems that the project is starting on the right spot to say, okay, let's control the water. And by doing that, many other things will happen. Eh? Then, Everyone, I'm very much in favor of thinking that the projects has to make very clear what is the frame of the project and what are the ways that this frame allows you to develop. Sorry, it's been too long. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. I very much agree with John um, <clears throat> about all the positive aspects of the project and also his critique. Um, the image on, on the bottom left, I think, um, makes his critique very clear. There's a very clear division between uh, what's dense and what's not dense. And the, the boundary between the two seems very, very harsh. Um, and I, I'm impressed by what he called the catalog of um, sort of different instances. To me, and it's more of a theoretical question maybe than a sort of immediate critique of your scheme. Uh, the question to me is, because you're speaking about controlling the water and, and then to me, the question is how much control or to what extent should we control? Because in some ways, and I, I obviously haven't been there, but it was a, a floodable or a, flooded landscapes, so at times of flooded landscape, which, and that quality, um, it's a very special quality and it, it, it um, makes for a very, in general, for very rich agriculture and um, probably very special types of birds and uh, trees which grow in that type of landscape. And um, by controlling it to the extent you have, I think you've eliminated some of what I would imagine is part of the essence of this uh, part of uh, the landscape, this, this floodable um, condition. And I, it, it's also a theoretical project here in school. So I, I um, from my point of view, I, I would have liked to see you test it. Again, I mean, it's not a critique, but more of a theoretical sort of discussion about when we speak about control, uh, to what extent do we want, because we used to control water really tightly. I mean, any, any 
any danger of flood meant that in the cities till about the 30s, they would put all the water in pipes and put them underneath and you know, the, the no more floods were, and no more water was to be seen. So these days we've sort of accepted the, there's many benefits to the water and we want to see it. Um, but here, the notion of flood is still seen as this very dangerous uh, or undesirable element. And I, and it, it is, I mean, if it, the whole city gets flooded, it's obviously a problem. But the degree of flooding is still possible of mm, controlled flooding. Um, and I, I, I personally, and this might be a discussion between us, um, I, I would have liked to see more, uh, more flooding than I'm seeing right now. Um, because I, th I think it's a really interesting phenomenon which speaks about seasons, brings certain I, I repeat, uh, sort of uh, natural elements into the city. Uh, and, and as I see, it was the most special quality of this place. Um, and so retaining a degree of that um, would have been, uh, I mean, from my point of view, preferable. I mean, would it have been possible, for example, to have some housing on stilts or uh, ra somewhat raised? I mean, there's numerous examples of areas which do flood where people, you know, have raised the houses either, either by having um, real stilts so the air and the water goes through or by uh, lifting it um, so that the entrance for example, in Buenos Aires, uh, next to what is called the Riachuelo, there's, um, it's a floodable area and all the houses are, they have three or four steps uh, before you can go in. So that when it floods, the house doesn't flood, but the, street, the streets flood. Uh, so there's different ways in which you can control and, and still allow for the phenomena to happen. The one thing I have in response to that is, I, I agree, I think we could have definitely explored it more. The one place that we we did talk about it and consider it, and I think that um, in that top left plan, the part of the intention with the canals and the ecological buffers was to allow for um, some degree of flooding and some amount of, you know, these areas that are parks could be flooded you know, when a flood comes and it gives space to, you know, but I do think that there's, it's an interesting balance between how much is too much manipulation of the yeah. landscape. Right, so so that's that's great um, feedback. Thank you. No, what you're saying is really interesting too, because it uh, could have determined the type of landscape. For example, you could have had sort of, um, even if you have what you have right now, have some sort of, uh, uh, depth so that when it, it where the flood came you would have these ponds or these pools or uh, that the whole landscape could have been dealt with so to allow for the flooding to have an expression in the park um, as, a, as opposed to necessarily flooding everything right, right. so um, we're speaking again about the type of control or the degree to which you might have wanted to control the flooding. Right. In this, um, the two sketches on the far right, up yeah. point of view, you can imagine how those might, when flooded, have the, the water raise, you know, up to the levels of the bridge and up to the housing and it, it could change levels and maybe be something we could have explored more in that area too. Mm -hmm. And it would also have made for really nice sequential drawings where you would have Right. The, the the project at one stage, um, maybe that could have happened even with the um, the proposition as you have it now, right? Yeah. Because you're speaking about uh, flooding along those veins, but right. in order to express the idea, I think uh, the idea of having sequential drawings would have helped a lot. Right. It's a good. It's a good. It's a good point. The flooding, you know, can create interesting landscape opportunities. So. Uh, I think that we're going to close this session, you know, 
uh, Rene, we I know that you have a meeting, but you, you I, know. I do, but I can I, I can cancel. I, I can I feel really bad because I was late, although <laughs> the system wasn't working anyway. It, so. It's not your I, fault. Don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, because the connection was not working anyway. So don't worry about know. that. Rene. But I can stay if you want me. If you have a problem, just let me know and I because okay, the, so if we have a problem with any other reviewer, I'll let you know. But otherwise, okay, but join us honestly, be absolutely free about that. And okay, I, I, it, what it is, it's a thesis student is making a presentation, and I've seen him only once during the term. So if I miss the final, I can speak to him privately. Um, so it's it's okay. Okay, we'll let you know, but you know, okay. if not, for right. sure we'll see you at three, John. If you can just, we're gonna have a quick break and then we'll have new reviewers coming at 12.30. So it's not a very long break. I hope that you're okay with that. We, we oh, Why don't we say it's almost 12, it's 12.23. Why don't we say 15 minutes? Well, we need to we need to tell the other reviewers. So, so, so. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've emailed both Gigo and David. Okay, and, okay. Uh, nice to meet you all. Bye -bye. We'll see you later. later. Okay. Fifteen minutes. Okay. Okay. This, we'll, this, see you, we'll see you later. Yeah. Okay. And Thank this you. link will okay. stay open all day, so it's the same link. You just can sign Thank back you. in. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. That was great. So we'll we'll see you later. Okay. Uh, for the students in fifteen in fifteen minutes or so twelve connecting twelve minutes, so we can get started. Luda, you're going to the next one. We'll keep we'll keep the order of Haley and and uh, Omar starting and then we can have uh, Luda and then we can keep going from there. Okay, okay. okay. See so we'll see you soon. Sorry, so are Omar and I going next or is Luda going next? No, you, you guys are going next and then Luda will go after. Okay, cool, thank you. You know, because those of you that prepared to start a session off, we wanna keep you in that location. Yeah, and, and, and the good thing is that John now knows a little more about Austin, but you had a more general kind of sense of the city in your introduction. So it's good for, you know, in this case, we have Gigo and David Heyman that know the city pretty well, but, you know, let's keep that, but then we'll add, you know, David is already connecting. <laughs> so. Uh, David, we're gonna, we just finished because we started right way late. So we're gonna start in like 10 minutes. Yeah, I don't know if he's connected already. Can you hear me by the way? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, great. I have an HDMI plugged in, so I wanted to make sure. All right, thanks. Okay, so we'll do that. We'll we'll connect in. You know, I I'm, I'm going to take also a bathroom break. All right, let me see if I can't. David, your microphone's not showing up, but hopefully you can hear me. We're going to start in ten minutes. Hey, Dean, I'll come on at 12.30. I'm just eating my lunch, lunch right now. I don't want to. David, we, I don't know if you heard me say that we just ended because we started an hour late because of technical right. stuff. But so are you going to start? We're going to start, start in like, we're going to start at five, 10 minutes. Okay, no worries. I'll just be on and, and whenever you guys come on, I'll, 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 I'll jump in by live video. All right, great. All right, sweet. Thanks, man. See you in a, see you in a bit.
And did you send an email to Gigo? Yeah, I have sent him a, yes. I sent him an earlier one and then I sent him the one with the new link, but I haven't heard from him. I mean, the fact that he's familiar with the site and the project, maybe we can, as soon as, I think David is on the call and uh, as soon as uh, John. Yes, Joel, I agree. We can get I think started. I think I think we get going and and you know, hi David, hi John, I'm back. <laughs> Hello. I know, I know it's getting late there in Barcelona, so right. Uh, we we probably uh, uh, been uh, just even from the point of view of the we we're now starting John as you know the second session, so we have uh, Diego Di Tommaso joining. Uh, he's with uh, Gail at the uh, San Francisco office. And uh, we have also David Heyman. David Heyman is very well known to all the students. He's a professor here at the School of Architecture. He's been teaching for a lot of years, many years, because many years, because he has taught longer than myself. So <laughs> it's a frightening prospect. Uh, professor Busquets, it's an honor to meet you. Hey, yeah. Nice meeting you, yeah. And I don't know um, if you know, if you've run into Gigo in the past, uh, Juan, but um, he also studied at the Escuela Tecnica Superior there in, in Barcelona, mm -hmm. um, which is where he did a lot of his urban design. Uh, Actually, PhD, he, PhD work. Yeah, he, he, his dissertation, Carlos Marti was uh, his uh, thesis advisor, John. Okay. He, he, and he, his topic is very interesting because he, 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 the, his dissertation was about the, the notion of wilderness in the Americas. Uh -huh. So, which is something that I'm also very interested in. So uh, he, he did his PhD there and then he's now in San Francisco working at, at Gale. I think he was one of the founding partners of the office in San Francisco, right, Dean? Yeah, yes, that's correct. But since he has he has been part of the studio in the sense that he has attended mid project reviews and he gave a presentation to the students, we had on Fridays we have been doing presentations. So we had the former mayor of Austin, Will Win, gave a presentation. So it was very interesting for the students to hear the perspective of a mayor that is happens to be architecturally trained. So I mean, he's an architect. Well, he's not a licensed architect, but he study architecture. So it's very unusual to have a politician. That's, that's very good for the city, usually. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And it's good for the city, but it was very interesting to hear his his uh, kind of frustrations and the, the, the battles that he fought and the things that went well. And he's, interestingly enough, he, he spoke to us from Portugal because he's now living in the south of Portugal. In, you know, <laughs> you know, in so south, so, sorry, next to Lisbon in Portugal. So it was very interesting to see he... He was very instrumental in the city, you know, vision of the growth that the city embarked in. And then all of a sudden he disappeared. He became a consultant worldwide for cities and he just works he, and lives in Portugal. And he, so he talked to the students. We had also Gigo and we had a, a very good presentation on watershed urbanism uh, from Steve Luoni from, from uh, what is the name of the center that he runs, Dean? It's the University of Arkansas no, Design Center. Exactly, that center. It was, it was, they do very good work. It's amazing, yeah. And, yeah. Then we, and then we had Juan Luis de las Rivas. Uh, uh, Juan Luis de las Rivas spoke to us from Valladolid, also another European urban designer that is unusually knowledgeable about the Americas in the sense that he has written and studied, very interested also in the concept of wilderness. So... Since Gigo is going to join any minute, Juan Luis may be joining, but he's going to join for sure at three. But he had a lecture in, in, in Portugal, talking about Portugal uh, also at this time. So we're going to get, get started. David, 
you got the email where you get the sense of the mixing of the students. So you are very familiar with uh, our process. And uh, John, we're going to continue with uh, another team of two students. So you will see, you know, individual work and teamwork. So we're going to start with Omar and Haley, uh, two of the undergraduate students that were also working in this project together. Okay, Omar, Haley. Well, hey, everybody. Um, everybody, thanks for being on. Professor Heyman, I always wanted to be reviewed by you. This is my final, final review, by the way, so. Yeah, that, that means I have to be nice to you. I'm so sorry. I mean, it, it's a good time to, to, to do that, I think. You can you can be rough on us. Uh, it'll be it'll be right. Uh, That's why he told you, David. So he can take it from the softer spot. Yeah. Classic undergraduate trick. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Having a uh, Juan Basquets as well as Giko as well. It's amazing. So um, we'll just go ahead and get started here. Okay. So generally, our project plant-based Decker Lake uh, speculations on landscape city. Uh, well, I'm Omar. And yeah, I'm Haley. I'm a fourth year Bachelor of Architecture student. Yes, and basically we approached this project from the lens of uh, equity as well as environmentalism and broke up environmentalism, a very vast subject, into basically three categories, which are agriculture, transit, and the built environment. And in this project, we addressed uh, the built environment and transit uh, definitely, but we are going to have more of a focus on the agriculture. And so moving in, let's see. We're gonna start with a general critique of the way that agriculture is you know, being uh, conducted throughout the US. As you can see here, this is an old map of Austin from 1838. And it shows the land use patterns that we used to have. And so Decker Lake where we're gonna focus is right around here. And this green hatch that you see is basically all of the area that in our project, we wanted to make enough urban fabric for 400,000 people, which is projected, it's the projected population of the amount of people in Austin who are going to move into the east side. Right now, most people are living downtown, but as Austin grows over the next 10 years, uh, about 400,000 will move here. So we use that as a datum to move from. Uh, basically, you can see that all of this land that 400,000 people uh, can live in used to be owned by just three people um, or three or four different uh, land users. And usually the land use was monotonous. It was all, you know, grazing animals like down here or uh, singular crop use, very monotonous in land use. And these are just some of the mammals, some of the large mammals that used to live in this landscape that are now extinct and many species are still uh, threatened. And also generally uh, 55 to 90 percent of the water consumption in the U.S. is for agriculture uh, and 40 percent of the land use in the U.S. are just animals grazing uh, for agriculture and we're going to be advocating for a plant-based uh, diet. The more plants in agriculture the better as compared to uh, animal agriculture. It requires 1 18th of the land use, uh, one half of the CO2, one thirteenth of the water and also an alarming thing was that on the east side of Austin, the floodplains have ranked as one half of the ecological uh, health uh, score as the waterways downtown, which is pretty alarming. It should be uh, inverse. So uh, Haley, did you wanna? What I, what I would say, Omar, Haley, if you can just, just keep the, the speed a little faster just to, so we can make up with the lost time, but just, just, just the same thing that you were going to say, just trying to say it a little, a little faster so we can get a little, a little faster. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You're, you're a little soft, but we can hear you. Okay. I'm not sure what's up with that. Um, but yeah, just to say basically that we want to try to start integrating kind of agriculture more into the urban fabric and more into the kind of social fabric of the city. And right now with um, animal agriculture as it is, um, that's not really possible due to kind of environmental health reasons. Um, so moving on to our next slide. Um, Basically, this is just taking a look at the amount of land that's necessary to feed the 400,000 people that we're aiming to have in our new proposal. Um, this is kind of looking at a zoomed out view of Austin and an exclusively plant-based diet um, only requires 200 square miles, whereas the baseline American diet requires um, almost over 1,600 square miles of agricultural land. So obviously, while we can't um, 
we don't quite have 200 square miles to work with in our proposal by starting to integrate agriculture more into the urban fabric by utilizing um, strategies such as an agricultural park and integrated greenhouses into the city fabric. We're hoping to address some of these food needs on a more local level. Um, this was just a basic analysis that we did of the kind of site that we're looking at in East Austin. Um, we've been calling it the Eastern Archipelago. So you can see Decker Lake there in the center. And these were just some vignettes we did of the kind of program uses that are already existing in the area. You can see that there's a drastic lack of grocery stores, medical facilities. Um, and then you can see also that generally speaking, things are pretty much exclusively single family housing out here. And as more and more people are heading in to East Austin, um, we're going to need to drastically kind of find a way to up the density of both amenities and housing in this area. So moving forward, um, the strategy that we chose to kind of do was to situate basically a couple different 15 minute cities, um, each of which would have all of those kind of adequate resources that are currently lacking um, to situate those around um, Decker Lake Park with a system of urban rail that goes out radiating in spokes from a central loop around the park and then is infilled with a system of bus lines and um, uh, commuter green belts as well. Um, and you can see also in the kind of train line marked in red, that's the existing um, rail network that um, Capital Metro is planning on running out to this area. Um, so yeah, this is kind of our overall zoomed out site plan of our, of our area. Um, this, I was going to mention the, uh, there's, this is a 0.2 mile buffer uh, from the highways just to protect people from uh, the pollution that are living closer to the highway. And we essentially stretched a linear city around the edge of this uh, park as well, but we're going to be focusing more on these 15 minute cities right here. Yeah, so um, moving and taking a look at the way that we have chosen to kind of intervene in the park. Right now, this is um, mainly a grassland preserve, um, largely because the city doesn't have the facilities to actually take care of enough of this recreational space. But we see this as becoming kind of a really robust new urban park typology, which combines Whoa. agriculture, recreation, and ecology. So the basic kind of party is to have a border of recreational program around the outside of the loop, around the kind of urban rail loop that we have, then moving in, moving into more agricultural land use, and and then in the center having kind of more ecological use as well as having some important cultural buildings interspersed throughout the park. Um, again, the intention of the agriculture in the park is not necessarily to provide for all of the food needs of the whole city, but rather to serve as a kind of didactic and educational tool to increase um, kind of food system literacy within our city. So taking a look at the kind of um, loop that's running around the outside, um, again, that's an urban rail loop, but it's also kind of a really robust main street condition that has um, on one side over on the left, you can see it will have um, kind of retail and restaurants, that sort of thing, mixed use, and then moving across to the other side, getting into the park. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see kind of working our way across that, um, having you know space for bike lanes, planting buffers, urban rail, kind of a linear park in the center with space for food truck courts. Um, continuing to move across, um, allocating some space for um, limited uh, automobile usage since Decker Lane. This um, road is still kind of an important uh, automobile thoroughfare through the area. And then moving into the recreational space of the park, um, the agricultural space of the park, and finally the kind of ecological space. Um, and this is kind of a look at what that central linear kind of park condition might look like along our kind of main street rail loop. Um, so moving on, um, now I'm gonna take a look at kind of a section of the park that I have detailed out a little bit more to show you kind of a prototype for how um, this land use might actually manifest. So looking at this area over here off to the west, um, you can see that there's not necessarily a super, uh, you know, strict linear delineation between the different programs, but generally speaking, there's kind of recreational programs more along the main street, 
then moving into some agricultural typologies, and finally getting into the ecological side of things, all connected with 20-foot um, hike and bike trails. And then you can see going over back to the kind of Main Street Rail Loop on the left side, having um, kind of these pocket parks um, taking up blocks at each of the rail stops as working as a kind of zipper condition to knit together the park and the, um, and the city fabric on the other side. So this is just kind of a look at what some of the agricultural program might look like in the park. So if we have flower fields, then there would also be accompanying cottages, which would have space for the creation of products like potpourri, perfumes, and kind of space for people to go and purchase those things and be a little bit more connected to the creation of them. Um, there's also greenhouses and yeah, various um, cottage shops interspersed throughout the park corresponding to different crops that are planted in different areas. Um, so kind of zooming back out, now we can go across to the other side of the Main Street Loop and take a look at the urban fabric that um, is part of our 15 minute cities that are kind of radiating out around the park. Yes, and so I focused a bit more on the urban fabric and I chose this site because something that was quite fascinating to us was the intersection of the urban fabric with the floodplains and that kind of captured all the conditions that we wanted. And so moving in, uh, essentially the urban fabric, each one of these blocks is 450 feet by 450. And each one of the blocks are generally either a two by two condition or a three by three. So this is one of the two by twos and then the three by threes are in the kind of like smaller, um, more remote areas uh, to be more quiet. And this is the floodplain right here. The central hatch that you, you see is the actual floodplain. And we decided as a way to uh, remediate the land and, and uh, preserve it well to stratify agriculture um, on, the, on the edges of the floodplains. And so people can hike through here and we stratified it and we were heavily influenced by the Steve Luoni uh, lecture that Juan mentioned. We essentially have uh, no-till agriculture on the outside, which is next to a bioswale corridor. And on the inside, uh, basically perennial, um, perennial agriculture, like hard and soft fruits um, and things like that. And just getting into the hierarchy of it, uh, this is the main street that we looked at uh, with Haley. And the most hierarchical street in the actual urban fabric is just a hike and bike trail that's bordered by different kind of green programs. Uh, so you'd have one program on the left, a different program on the right. And this is, uh, we call it the commuter green belt because it's really uh, a way for people to get, you know, to get to work, to get to the store. And it's lined with a lot of the landmarks like, you know, hospitals, schools, um, things like that. It connects to this park. And, you know, this park was kind of defined by the uh, topography that was there. So essentially the highest uh, part of the land we uh, decided to put in, you know, this park as well as there's the uh, green belt and trails in the lowest part of the land. So we wanted to work with the uh, topography in that way. And next I'm going to get into a few sections going from large to small. And well, before I move on, uh, generally transit is available uh, within a quarter mile of everybody. So that's what these are. These are like uh, small shuttle bus stops and these larger dots are the rail stops. And so I'm gonna get into this section uh, going through the agriculture and then just move down the hierarchy from there. So I'll go then into the uh, commuter green belt and then into the arterial and then by a swell corridor and then a vein after that. So here's the agricultural uh, you know, section. You start to see how the green, how the uh, uh, the greenhouses are on top of the roofs and just the different stratified layers uh, really. And then this is getting into the commuter green belt, uh, just one program on the left, which is a hundred foot buffer uh, on either side and one on the right. And we ended up not really getting around to it, but we would like for this to basically stay at the level that it is. And then actually have these, uh, we see these as having potential as detention or retention ponds uh, just to fill up, you know, after a rich rain. 
And then getting into an arterial section, uh, basically have the balconies, you know, open for neighbors to interact with one another if they would like to. This is how the green roofs are really uh, interacting, interacting with the section. And here in the artery, you know, public transit, and the artery is the only street in which we actually have two way for cars. And so, you know, cars aren't like outlawed in our plan, but it's also kind of a pain in the butt to drive around in our city. And that's a very intentional thing. Uh, we want to basically encourage, uh, you know, walkability and bikeability and for it to be very pleasant for people to be in the shade when they're doing it in the hot summer months. Okay, let's keep it, keep it going, Omar. Okay, and uh, you can just start to see how the tuck under parking is, you know, providing privacy for people. This is the Bioswell Corridor Street. And this is the vein, the smallest of the, uh, the urban streets. And getting into the building typologies, we basically wanted to employ uh, all missing middle as well as uh, four over one typology. And for every citizen, even if you're living in an SRO, no matter what your situation is, through the design process, we wanted to guarantee everybody to have semi-private outdoor space, uh, defensible space, as well as private outdoor space. And generally 400 square feet per person, plus or minus 200 square feet. And so this is getting into the, you know, the, this, the stitch uh, of the urban fabric in the large Deccan Lake Park that Haley was talking to. At the main street here is the only condition where the buildings actually get up to six stories. Uh, we wanted the buildings to basically be capped like 99% of the buildings are capped at four stories. And this is the only place where there is an exception. And these are the green roofs on top uh, and the access to the tuck under parking. And you can start to see the social spaces. And this axon is just a general typical arterial condition. So here you can see we're back down to uh, four stories high. There's some tuck under parking, you know, access in the back. Generally have the four over one at the arteries, and then at the bioswell corridors, as well as veins, uh, it tapers down, it gets down into, um, <clears throat> basically gets down into row houses, as well as uh, duplexes, up to fourplexes, and people have their yards. And here's the ground plane. As you can see, even with the four over one, there are many backyards. Uh, we don't think that people need a front yard and a backyard, but you know, we tried to give everybody a backyard and if they didn't get it, uh, get a generous balcony, uh, just going to the last one. These are quite large balconies that we looked at in the section. And the social spaces in the center as well as the green spaces. And so those were the two by two blocks. This is the three by three block, which is, uh, we found out is more appropriate for the more quiet and remote parts of the city, not next to the arterials or the street. And here, you know, you can see everybody has their yard and we, we have all the greenhouses basically in the perimeter of these blocks. The way we see it working would be that the people, like if it's a condominium building, the people own the greenhouses and they can, basically work out a deal with farmers to where farmers can come up, use the greenhouse, and then give them a cut of the produce or the, uh, or the profit from selling the produce. Uh, so it's really to empower the inhabitants. And then we moved it also into the center around the social spaces to use that as uh, a political as well as a, a communal uh, binder. You know, we also thought of the political aspect of this and the polarization of the United States with a lot of agriculture, agriculture workers uh, being on one end of the spectrum politically and people living in the city being in another. And here's the ground plane for the three by three. And uh, just, to, just to finish, this is the three by three central condition with the greenhouse here and just the rest of the buildings around. And unless Haley has anything to add, that concludes our presentation. Yeah, thank you guys.
Why don't you, Omar, put it back on the sort of larger plan diagram? It'll take me a while to get there. Is that the fully zoomed out one? Well, it's up to you. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's a good one. No, the, the one that you just passed is a good one. Oh, this one, yeah. Okay. So maybe before we start, so I have just a couple of questions. So uh, like the, the approach here, like the urbanism is actually, despite where you guys started, which was kind of a, kind of a radical call for a kind of agricultural urbanism, the urbanism that we get here is actually relatively conventional. I mean, the, and even the kind of, in many ways, the kind of way you're thinking about dealing with a program and so forth and the distribution of property and so forth, it, it's very much like what's already happening in uh, parts of Austin that are not radically agricultural. So it's clearly a decision you guys made to not, even integration isn't so, I mean, I think the very last the three by three was the most interesting of the integrations, but in the other, the integration is less clear. And so I'm wondering, uh, you know, at, at some point you guys made a decision about going, it's going to be either a kind of radical revision of the city based on agriculture, redefining the way buildings are conceived, the way public spaces are conceived, the way institutions are conceived, or it's going to be something softer, which is more uh, uh, subtle and more uh, uh, based on taking a normative uh, model of uh, uh, urban development in the United States right now. And and, and tweaking it in some small ways, and which I think that's my sense is, and I, I wonder if you could bring us up to speed a little bit about that discussion, why you guys decided to go that way, as opposed to, for example, saying, we're two architects, let's like, let's, let's open the floodgates and see what we can do with buildings to make the roofs, for example, usable as, as agricultural fields or, you know, to pursue some of the other strategies that are being pursued around the country in places of greater density to, to deal with uh, urban agriculture. Yeah, I mean, I think that we wanted, we, we kind of decided to take, um, in our mid-review, Martin Hiddish called it like a pragmatic utopianism um, cool. to kind of have it based a little bit more in reality and kind of working off some of the knowledge that was shared with us in some of the presentations throughout the semester. Um, I don't know, I, I, I guess we just wanted it to be rooted a little bit more in some of the existing uh, knowledge that was shared with us and then kind of work work from there. This was the first time either of us have ever attempted a project kind of at this scale. So maybe we fell back a little bit onto some conventions, but hopefully our, our thesis can still be kind of seen coming through. So then if, if you were to point to a, if you were to point to the kind of critical decision that you've made within this kind of, I, I really appreciate you saying that Haley, this, that, that you guys, this is the approach that we've chosen to take. Uh, but if you were to point then to, let's say the critical kind of architectural juncture of that pragmatic uh, utopianism, how would you, where would you situate that? Um, in terms of like the execution of the project, like an example. Yeah. Uh, I think that, I think I would say, you know, after our mid review, we kind of had the decision to make of, do we actually want to try to incorporate enough agricultural land for 400,000 people in this small site? And I think that we decided, we, we kind of made the choice to pivot more towards using, using this as almost like a, an educational tool for kind of food food literacy more than having you know these giant towering industrial greenhouses out in the landscape here which we felt might be a bit removed from kind of the language that's out here in the landscape city because while we are trying to urbanize out here you know I think we also have to recognize that this is not necessarily like a dense urban core um so we were I think we were trying to mediate those two impulses kind of yeah I think uh just another way of saying that also would be that the goal was integration of agriculture. You know, the way that we live now, we don't really know how things are grown. We don't see how it's grown and it's shipped in from, you know, the average plate of food is shipped in from 1500 miles away. So, but, but, but Omar, just to interrupt. So, but, but with the exception of the last organization you showed where there was a courtyard in the center of a block where there was a farm field and there were greenhouses integrated in ways which we can talk about, how do and how do people know in this landscape? I mean, they cross over into what appears to be quasi-rural land, right? How do they? How does that become more clear to them? Based on the, I'm, I'm trying to handle the the question, the didactic question. I have my own issues with because it's we'll, we'll talk about that. It's precisely that kind of didactic impulse which becomes the basis for the criticism of liberal privilege in 
in uh, in, in 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 the American landscape. But we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, I mean, so so when we look at a situation like that, go back one plan. So when we look at the situation there, you're, you're, I'm looking at the, the integration of the agriculture, and you're saying the agriculture is basically along these kinds of traumatic strips where the kind of developable land meets the land which is essentially undevelopable. Uh, which it's an interesting concept for other reasons. That's traditionally in the American landscape, the distinction between arable land and nature, right? Nature is what you can't plow or what floods, right? So, so and now you're saying that that land is being transformed perceptually into agricultural. And so I'm, I'm trying to get, it's the integration I'm trying to get a handle on. It, it does, maybe I'll stop there, but we'll come back to this question, but. Yeah, the, I think the, the idea the hatch, behind, sorry, go ahead, Omar. Yeah, if I may, the, the hatch in the center is really the, the floodplain itself. And so that is to be preserved. It's just the things that are around the floodplain that we decided to use as agriculture and eco literacy and agricultural literacy, essentially. Yeah. I realize also that, and I'll, I'll flip to the, um, I'll flip to the axons for the two by two next to the arterial after this, but um, Maybe I didn't point out that the green roofs are lined on top of all of these blocks. There are green roofs uh, that are, or not, not green roofs, but greenhouses on top of the roof. Um, so a lot of production really can take place uh, aquaponically. Uh, and so, I mean, what I see- in I'll, I'll add into that. Did you guys ever, and this is my last question, I promise. Did you guys actually make a kind of calculation about, about how much food you can generate given the kind of uh, a, a, a proposal? We would have, we didn't get around to it though. Yeah, we, yeah. That, that would have been the last diagram that we would have added in on how much offsetting of the total area the city would need um, would be taken away if you know everybody's farming in, in this sense. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the idea is that since the kind of greenhouses and agricultural productive landscape is integrated into the urban landscape by utilizing these kind of rooftop spaces. We basically don't need to have giant expanses of open land. It can be kind of more, um, have more of a relationship to daily kind of culture in the city. We're not trying to feed everybody, you know, totally with these. We're just trying to offset it so that, you Got know, who doesn't have to travel from Chile or you know, somewhere like that. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. No. Thank you for the presentation. I think um, I'd like to stress that the ambition you have on the on the initial hypothesis, I think, is quite interesting and remarkable. Huh? The idea that you are suggesting that what the city Austin is demanding is a certain observation in a long-term period. And I think this is quite remarkable, the idea that you are putting the agriculture as a central of your project. I think that's, that's very good and it's something that today, I think is a very important issue. Yeah? And how agriculture can be also integrated into the city, but also in creating also different patterns of living. I think there are, probably you know, and you're aware of this movement mainly in Italy, that is very important nowadays, that is what they call the slow food. This way that we need to, to know not only about what we are eating, but also the way that the food is created and can be recreated. And all this stuff opens uh, fantastic issues, but also it makes, and I think this is what is interesting in your project, it makes a different ways of considering the project. Okay? That I think, bravo, I think this is a very interesting approach and it's quite remarkable the way that you are presenting. Then I feel that your project is very much with a sequence of steps. If we can go to the general map that you have the general plan, which I think is this one, probably that is the most interesting in your proposal. I think it, it makes sense that you take from the geography of the city, you try then to, to define what is the space that probably the city can take and how the agriculture could be part of this. I think that's very important. For me, perhaps, if you allow me to say, there is a certain confusion when, we, when you are trying to mix the parks and the agriculture. It seems to me that that is not very clear in your scheme. 
And we have to, to have that very clear. One thing is a park, one thing is a garden, and the other is when we are making an exploitation of the agriculture, any form you want. That could be more by cooperative or by group of people or allocating the land into the different blocks. I mean, there are many different patterns. And I think here, perhaps you should be a little bit more precise about what do you mean about that. Because agriculture, any exploitation of agriculture needs certain form, needs certain organization. If you take, for, in, for instance, the example that I'm sure you're familiar with, the Brotacre city, which I think is a fantastic example, and still is a fantastic project to be tested and to be put in place. What the Brotacre city is saying, that there is a certain organization of the, of the city, and then the people can get certain rights to develop different forms of agriculture, we can say, or with gardens or different forms that you can imagine, but that covers and makes the integration of the built with the unbuilt, with the production and the parks, the infrastructure and the parts that they are commercial or other activities. Eh? I think in a certain way, you, your scheme, the scheme that you, you are showing in this slide, for me, it it shows this potential, like in the Brotagra city. But then when we you develop and you deploy the project, then in terms of the, the park and the agriculture, in terms of how the, the streets and the transportation, because I, I appreciate very much the effort that you do in what you mentioned, the 15-minute city. That, that's very good. It's, it's, it's very fine. But could you imagine when you zoom in your project I think probably this is, is quite important for you. Um, if this line should be the edge, or that should be into the, the system, and allowing that certain parts could be meeting the park. So the fact that you are putting the boulevard at the edge of your city, let's see, you take the example of the Central Park in New York, is that cannot be better if the, the boulevard will be one or two blocks behind, and then you are going to have one few blocks connected to the green. That, I think, is something that your project has to think about that, in the way, yeah? because otherwise um, we, we are creating more the traditional city where the edge is the, the limit between what is built and what is unbuilt. I don't know if that is the best solution for you. Yeah? But anyway, I feel the transportation scheme, the way you are deploying, is quite. Then there is, allow me to say, another level of ambiguity, we can say, when you are deploying the buildings into that. This scheme, for me, tends to imagine, and I think that is something that Omar is developing, tends to imagine that your scheme is very powerful, and then you test two blocks or three per three blocks. I mean, there are this type, of, which I think is very nice and very beautiful. And the way that the buildings, the houses, are embedded into the block, I think this is remarkable, the way that you, the green is part of the architecture, and the architecture, the roofs, the green roofs are giving the possibility of another type of agriculture, or more, you can say, private type of use of, of this, uh, uh, right, eh? uh, the private house, that, uh, private use of the roof, of the buildings. I think that that could be quite remarkable in your scheme, and it is also the large terraces. And the, I think you, there are a lot of elements that they are very interesting when you move into this type of, right, the, the way that you deploy the project in this scale. I think that's very nice with all the details, the potential that you have with the alleys. I mean, these are, are remarkable in your proposal. Eh? But it seems to me that perhaps you have to reinforce this idea how the agriculture is meeting is really a central part of your project. That is something that you, Halle, is, is, are developing quite well. But I don't see the way that this is translated into the organization of the land, which is not built, but is going to be cultivated. It's going to be, somebody will take care of that in many different forms. Eh? I think it's something that you, you have to do. Eh? But I feel that your proposal is very clear from the initial hypothesis coming down in this organization with this the scheme, which I think is very nice, the scheme with the overall, um, with the big center that is green and the rest organized around it, that I think is very, very beautiful and very well done. And then I feel that some extra development could, can be done 
with this better ident identification between what is park and what is agriculture, what is the, the form of that, what is the organization, I don't know if that is clear to you, but the agriculture has always a form, a built-up form, which is the, 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 the way that the land is organized. Eh? I think that will make also that some of these your schemes, Howie, about the park, that they are relatively loose in the way that you can see objects in the park. No, uh, if the park is agricultural park, then it's going to be some lines about how the agriculture is going to be deployed in that place. There is no point about that. Eh? And then probably the transportation is very good as a scheme, but perhaps should be better embedded into this relationship between the big scheme and the way that the blocks are organized. Eh? In any case, it seems to me a very remarkable piece of work. Eh? I think that because the ambition of that to make agriculture as part of the city and then to develop in the different scales, I think this is, is a gigantic effort. Eh? Congratulations for that. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think that uh, this is perfect way to move into the next. We need to kind of keep, keep it going. Uh, I think that uh, we're going to, since we have one project from the last session that we were not able to see, Luda, if you can go go now, then we'll go with uh, we maintain the, the the order. Hey, Omar and Omar and Haley, I'm going to separately email you some criticism, okay? Just because I can't let you get out of the school without being criticized, because there are some there were some things in the project. As much as I agreed with, with Professor Busquets, there were some things in the project that I found problematic. I mean, he brought up Rodiger City and and in Wright's conception. And for me, the, the biggest problem with the OS project is that is the it's missing intermediate scale. The kind of the two questions: one is uh, uh, who does the work, who does the actual agricultural work, right? I, you know, who actually does it, and and then how is it how is it organized? And right now, it's either at this very large scale, or at this kind of individual scale. But there's no conception about how that kind of individual scale work transforms the way the city might be organized. I think there's a kind of for me, there's a kind of missing intermediate scale. So I just I'll, I'll, I'll send that to you. The other thing to me was I actually thought that the greenhouses on the roofs, that actually they should come to the ground all the way that, that, that like in these kind of dense blocks and the organization of the kind of city in this kind of way where you're essentially making essentially kind of block scale privacies or, or, or what, which is this kind of American form of urbanism where you're, you're not essentially making public space at the scale of the public, you're making it the scale of the block. The idea that the transparency of the greenhouse might become the means by which you share this inner space with the outer world means that that could become this kind of mechanism or kind of language that you could use to begin to organize a kind of larger lateral expansion from the blocks, making additional pathways through the city to the park space, which I think would be great. Now I won't email that stuff to you. That's that one. That one last thing, I actually want to just like beg you from, from now forward to not imagine architecture being didactic, but to imagine it actually solving problems. Architecture being didactic, pointing to the problem. This is why, this is, this is literally why design is treated by within kind of, I have within, yeah, the conservative portions of the building economy as a kind of as a kind of problem, not a, as a kind of as you know, you're just pointing to the problem. You know, like solve the problem, you're like like get, give us the numbers, get the numbers figured out early on, as opposed to waiting. I, that was for me the, the biggest disappointment. Uh, I'm going to miss you two guys. Great students have loved having you guys in the school. Have loved, especially Haley. Have loved Haley, criticizing Haley's Haley all these years. Haley. Oh, Haley's going to stay. Okay, Haley's staying with us. Yeah, I have another. We, we can keep Omar here too if you want us to. That's it, yeah. <laughs> or you can let Haley graduate early. You know, she's so good. <laughs> okay, know that. Know that. Go ahead. Okay, thank you so much for the feedback, yeah, guys. So I want to just say one thing um, for those of you who are our critics. Lyuda is um, in Irkutsk in Eastern Russia and has never been to Austin in her life. Oh, um, awesome. She, great. she was meant to start the, the urban design program, but because of COVID was never able to get here. So everything that she's done has been remotely. Go ahead, Lyuda. And it's what, three in the morning there right now? Probably um, 2.16. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, we can see it. Where 
I think we lost. Did she freeze? No. Yeah. Yeah, I think she she froze. I do that. Yeah. I mean, we have never had. So, any... no. Okay. Are you good? Okay. No, it's not working, Luda. We're not hearing you. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes it's working. Okay, sorry. Uh, Zoom is crashing all, all day to day. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to start with the city scale, uh, with the research that we've done in the beginning of the semester. I moved to the East Austin, the Walter E. Long Lake that um, we looked in, then zoom into district and zoom into the neighborhoods. Okay, so we started with um, talking about the current issues of Austin and why we've, we're working on the studio in the East. So basically, the as we can see, the city is growing outwards and a lot of this development is going to happen. as well as the um, as well as the allocation of new like the, yeah, the all can um, just the um, the project <laughs> um, the, the, um, is will come to to help us in to um, transportation accessibility to the east, and then I further I will um, yeah talk a little bit more about it again. And um, then the environmental systems. This was important to define the um, conservation zones. Yeah. So. Plains and landscape. They freeze again. Luda, you're you're freezing up. We're not hearing really anything or something. I'm freezing again. So, oh do, you, do you think, Dean? I mean, maybe we can let someone else go and see if the, it gets a little better with time. I think we should do that. I think we should do that. Yeah, it's, it's basically we cannot hear you, Luda. So I was thinking that. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now let's see. Let's see. Maybe maybe we can start hearing you better. Okay. Keep going. Let's see if we, we let's give it another try. Oh, I, I think I can troubleshoot it, but I don't know. Maybe I need to update Zoom or something. An another possibility okay. is um, I have your PDF and I can share it and you can talk. Uh, I'm sure. I mean, right now it seems to be start working again, but uh, and we have never had any problem during the whole semester with uh, your connection. So, no, it's just today. <laughs> yeah, just keep going, keep going. Yeah, okay. So we looked at, at East Austin um, and uh, the Zoom University and everything. I looked at the Google Street View and again, I don't know. I'm going to I'm going to try one more thing, Lyuda, which is I'm going to share your presentation from my computer. And then you can talk and tell me when to shift. OK. Uh, maybe I can try. some. Uh, also, you uh, might want to turn off your camera that might help you. So is that is that now you, Dean, controlling this? That's me. Okay, Luda, if you if you know that seems to be a good plan. Let's see, but let's see if we can hear Luda. Can you? Well, we cannot see the screen now. Yeah, I cannot see. It. Oh, you can't see see the screen. Mm. No, the exit exit the the full screen mode. Just go. You have to scroll through it. We had this problem yesterday as well. Yeah, yeah, maybe wait. I, I I connected to my data. Maybe I can. Can I can I try again? Yeah, yeah. 
keep going. Um, like Vicky said, maybe if you don't have the camera, maybe it helps a little bit. Oh, yeah, maybe. All right. Go. Okay. I'm going to try again. <laughs> Can you? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the, the separate Austin and the Google Street View, my explorations of Austin. So uh, what I've noticed is that there's a lot of just, just space, just this broad landscape um, all over it with some um, small development here and there. Um, yeah, then I looked at the existing green infrastructure, which shows that the area is well connected to the existing trail system of Boston, as well as it's a good connection to parks and yeah. Um, then the environmental system. So the area is located in Black, Blackland Prairie, yeah, which makes sense since there's a lot of agricultural past. All this area, um, yeah, I've also mapped wetlands that we want to protect, um, grassland. Uh, so the, the, the area is experiencing a lot of um, robust development. Um, and if we juxtapose it on the floodplain, there's a lot of those developments that are going to be in the floodplain, as well as the existing developments in housing um, that also are in, in the floodplain right now. Yeah. So. Um, I've selected this area between the creeks um, and Colorado River and um, the, the lake. Um, so first I've defined main, the main axis, which is the, the first one is the MLK Weberville, um, then the toll road, the SH-130, and the Decker Lake Road, since it's, it's, um, it's the, the park edge. Um, then I looked at the 15-minute radius um, to evaluate the walkability potential of the area and the accessibility. Um, then the establishment of new connections uh, off between those radii and maybe create the new connection like here. Yeah, um, and yeah, those are the, the greenways that could, that already with the existing ones, um, they could penetrate the future development. Yeah, so I'm proposing on a large scale, this sort of like uh, the, the buffering of SH-130 to, to have this more industry over here, since there's also Tesla factory. That really could be, um, I believe, maybe some also in connection with the agriculture, um, industrial size greenhouse gardens. Um, and the park is, yeah, is the long could have uh, densification opportunities as well as the, uh, as well as the connection to the landscape. And the city connection, yeah, and this, since it goes directly to the um, center, um, yeah, it also has a great potential development. So the Project Connect, I, um, and I think a lot of people in the studio, we, since, since the area is likely to experience um, population growth and would house more people, it would need another, like the, the lane, the proposed line of right uh, light rail would um, fit here. Yeah, and since the toll road is not very, um, it's not the, really accessible. Yeah. So then I part of the scheme. I looked at the landscape, existing land, the water flows and floodplain. It, it has a very interesting topography. Um, yeah, and the great connection to water bodies. So this is the existing landscape with the previous priority because 
um, yeah, I I thought that this this area along this um, playing could, as well as the existing parks could. Yeah, and then um, to design the future development, first looked at the land parcels and read the core here, and then the density also within the, as I previously mentioned, the, the, the 15 minute radius. Um, yeah, and then after uh, juxtaposing it to the existing landscape and the waterfall floodplains, I there's a I, lag. Like curved out <laughs> this. Um, Liuda, the, there's a lag with your. They're not seeing your full presentation. They're, there's the drawings are lagging. What you're saying, Luda? Can you turn off your camera? Mm -hmm. Maybe it helps a little bit. Okay. I hate to do that uh, because okay. I'm normally a big fan of having everybody's cameras on, but I think it may help. Okay. Okay. Um. Yeah, and so these are the the proposed little centers and the densities of the centers. Um. They also, but the, the color, there would be increase of functional diversity and uh, housing density. So here it's mostly mid, mid dune density and then the mixed and um, low density. So those are the block types that I've came up with. Um, is there a delay? Okay. Um, so the, the low density housing, um, mostly the single family housing that could also incorporate work with um, units, um, maybe some little stores and yeah, just some small businesses. Mixed densities, um, yeah, it's the mixing of single family housing, yeah, uh, and apartments. The medium density, mostly apartments around the central courtyard. And the park um, park front. Um, I I I wanted it to be open to the park edge and sort of like have um, nature <laughs> going inside the, the 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 center of the park. Yeah, here's the transit scheme with the new light rail as well as the shuttles from, from the communities from around the Weberville going to MLK and the, um, the shuttle around Decker Lake. Um, yeah, um, also the this is the 15 minute radius and this is a five minute radius. And you can see the street sections um, over here. The pedestrian system. So, um, so uh, even though it's not completely carless, but I still wanted to make it as hard for car owners as possible um, to encourage people um, to walk and to use bikes and maybe other um, like the smaller micro transit. Um, yeah, so the pedestrian system, the, so the, the, the motorways would walk around this, the clusters of four or five, well, or like six blocks. Um, this is the framework plan for the whole district. Um, I want the edge still to be this, this um, vertical gardens and greenhouses, uh, as well as the, maybe some smaller manufacture and agriculture to sort of to buffer the, the area from the toll road. Um, yeah, and, and um, you know, maybe in some, some way help fit the, the area and also. Um, then, yeah, and then uh, the park front dwellings here and multifamily housing and yeah, well, with the decrease of the 15 year radius, uh, there will be a decrease of density as well. Okay, 
that you see yeah, and this is this is, i forgot yeah i forgot to say i forgot to mention the the central boulevard that going from um decker lake to the colorado river yeah so this are the i've um i wanted to look into more closely into the sections around this um boulevard uh the first one is the front uh the park park edge Lita, I'm, I'm I'm using mine because yours keeps sort of lagging. Okay, so just tell me when you want to switch the slide. Yeah, we should be, you know, Luda, we should be wrapping up the presentation so we can get going. Okay. Um, then, then the second, the second one is uh, the the edge between the existing development and the new development, and the third one. Uh, the, it, it goes to the existing, connects to the existing trail system and faces uh, Corral. Let's keep going, Dean. Let's keep moving. Mm -hmm, next. So the, the first one is the park edge. Um, which, uh, the, yeah, you can, as you can see, it connects to the park. It has more density in the front. It has this, uh, the, um, uh, the, yeah, in the, the basically the programming of uh, um, more uses facing. Uh, the, the the boulevard and less uses facing just the pedestrian streets, which and it this this also has okay. Can you go back? <laughs> you got to speed up a little bit, Leota. Okay. Um, yeah, this also has the I, I uh, the the system of bus rails to going from far from the the transit. Um, from the road to the the, the floodplain, um, which is on the 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 left corner, and then okay, next. Yeah, we need to we need to wrap it up. So this is just a perspective. Yeah. And the neighborhood edge. So I'm buffering the, the existing neighborhood from the new development with allotment gardens and orchards in order to maybe facilitate more social cohesion between the new residents and uh, older residents. Um, I mean, um, and then the wetlands, because the, if, if, um, if we look at like the, the, the floodplain, goes directly uh, through heat for, through this wetland and also um, touches some dwellings of existing um, housing so just in order to mitigate the effects um, yeah. yeah so the next yeah, this is just the programming okay also yeah you can see <laughs> uh, the river edge with the allotment gardens with platforms going to the river and connecting to the system um, yeah, and then the, the housing blocks. Yeah. Okay. It's just a perspective. All right, that's the last slide, right? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you can go back, Dean, so we can have one more general. Sorry, Lula, that we had I'm, to rush, rush you a bit. It's, you know, otherwise we don't have time to to see everything. Okay. Now, now reviewers can 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 start commenting. I think I'm going to go to that that one. Hmm. Oh, this is fine. No, I think it's quite clear. No, no, you know, I think it's a very uh, powerful scheme. No, well, thank you, thank you very much for the presentation. And um, I think it's quite compelling scheme. That uh, 
I would say that the way that you are treating and selecting um, one axis, let's say it seems to be the north-south as a more uh, a distinct uh, directionality in your project, this seems to be very, very effective, which is the line of the geography, the line of the motorway. I mean, it's the way that, that I think it makes um, a lot of solutions for your project. You know, later on, you can change the scale and then you can see the way that you are deploying your strategies. Huh? But I think this is very effective. And then you have the other, the perpendicular is more organic type of, of way. Is the way it reminds me a little bit like what is usually mentioned, the Hilbert-Simer approach, no? the ladders of Hilbert-Simer, in a way that then you have one line that is more the organizer in terms of the urban, and the other is more the one that is navigating through the topography and through the system. I think it, it looks um, it looks very nice, the scheme. I, I appreciate very much the way that later you deploy the different morphologies, eh, what you, you mentioned, the programs. But I think the way that the buildings can have different densities, I think it's very nice that then you also deploy an idea of a smaller spaces that they could be urban spaces in between the blocks, eh, like the plazas or, or gardens that we can imagine. I think that is is also very, very powerful. I think the density is also very well reflected in these drawings, the way we can see that some portions of your project is looks very urban. I think that that's, that's very nice. So the way that we can see that all that tends to be very urban. But I think the power of these lines are really very, very effective in your scheme. And then you have another part that is really very, very much, we can imagine, in lower density, in a way that then you have I, but these mechanisms, you can you can do a city and you can keep the city growing and developing. I think this is remarkable. Huh? Finally, I like to stress the value that you put in your project about the the public spaces and the green spaces. I think we saw on previous projects this difficulty: how you can select between architecture and garden. And I think the way that you are creating the idea of the allotments or the rain garden or the orchards. I mean, there are many, the categories you establish allows you to move on in your project. And I think it's very good that you you define these categories at the same value that the one of the buildings is the way. Then you have clear infrastructure scheme. You have a very well-developed morphological in terms of different blocks. And also finally, I think, the idea how the public space could become more agriculture, or could become gardens, or can become elements of the, of the urban tissues, as the way. I think it's a remarkable scheme, eh, Luida. I think. Thank you very much for it. Well, Luida, I want to say also congratulations for having accomplished this from Irkutsk this entire semester. I mean, I think that that's completely remarkable. I look forward to you being in Austin. Uh, I think it's just, uh, but I also think there's a huge, I mean, as, as difficult as it is, I think there's this kind of huge uh, also potential in being far away and kind of only imagining things. So uh, if I were to offer criticism to you, I would say that for me, what I find strange about your project, and this will be a thing that'll become, I think, clearer when you come to America. So you begin the project by saying, I'm going to I'm going to master plan with respect to existing topography, existing waterways, existing uh, uh, systems of, of, uh, of, of natural and man-made infrastructure. But then the minute you turn to then building within the, the, that landscape, so defined, you more or less stop. You know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you begin to make essentially these kinds of block areas that you even draw flat, even though they're also over remarkable topographies in, you know, in, in many ways, I need to get a little bit of larger, I mean, these these whole areas. I mean, I think there are instances, and I think Professor Busquets, where that idea of the kind of abrupt marker that's, that acts against the, this, this other idea of planning that, that respects these drainages is quite powerful. But then I think something is lost in the conception of these, in the, in the quick jump to the idea of just making a block, right? I mean, I, I have my questions and my doubts. I mean, I know that both Juan and uh, 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 Dean and I would probably argue about this. I have my doubts about the effectiveness of the block 
as a as a way to organize the block with a big open space in the center as a, as as necessarily a way to organize American landscape. I mean, I can see it in, in Berlin. I understand it, but I think that the, the the problem has to do with the idea that in the American landscape, there's no tradition of public space really beyond infrastructure, right? And so the question of just making space, I think, uh, uh, has some just setting out spaces and assuming that each block will somehow adopt or take on or as opposed to ignore that space is, is a thing that I think when you come to the States, you'll see it's a real dilemma. It's a real kind of question. You know? I mean, I think I, I like very much how these kinds of the, at, along the park edge, you know, you say, well, the block is broken. Something comes into the block. You know, and here it has to do with this strategy of preserving green space. But I don't understand why that strategy wouldn't also begin to be used to begin to connect these other blocks together. You know, either you go, well, I'm gonna plan it all this way, right? And say, it's gonna all be somehow associated with reacting, responding to topography, or I'm, I'm gonna ignore that in a, in a sense, and I'm gonna use the things like the allotment, a system of allotment gardens, for example, to begin to drive connections between these blocks to begin to stitch this whole world together. I mean, for me, what's missing in this project is a clear conception of public space that will work in the United States, which is which is a, a, has been a dilemma for 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 more than two hundred years, uh, to be clear. Uh, uh, but but it is it's it is not a, it is not a traditionally European one. Uh, I mean, there are kind of instances, a few of them in America of this kind of very powerful space making. It is a really great one in Austin, in the center of the city, the Congress Avenue. I love the idea of transposing that notion uh, uh, somewhere else. I, 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 from the rendering, I would argue that it could be far more monumental. It could be like far more engaged. You know, like it, it, right now the scale for me in, in terms of, of, of city building is, is, is more kind of continuing this kind of very low scale, uh, 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 uncertain, uh, uh, or urban density, uh, but I, I think for me that that that's the, the the real question, which is how do you how do you begin to in the American landscape uh, uh, trigger or charge public space uh, either with infrastructure or with some form of programmatic mechanism that you can use. Now, for example, these allotment gardens in Austin, they're really terrific, right? There 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 aren't many of them. They're in super high demand, right? I live not far from one, you, you put yourself on a waiting list and 20 years later, you still don't have a space in the allotment garden, right? Um, but the idea that those spaces are highly desired and by being highly desired, they could begin to bind together blocks. I mean, this is very much the way it's done in, in European cities, right? The allotment gardens are set adjacent to the rail line. They're, they're the thing that, they're the scar tissue between a system of infrastructure and a system of civil inhabitation. I think in the United States, they could become the mechanism for a new definition of public space, like one of several. I mean, I think there are others uh, as well, like the walking paths, the idea that the walking paths or the biking paths or even businesses or campuses might be stretched or strung across blocks to begin to bind them together conceptually. That's where I would recommend the project kind of develop uh, from here forward. But thank you uh, for for uh, your 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 work <laughs> in these kind of long dark nights in uh, in Irkutsk. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you, David. Uh, I think that uh, we probably going to move to um, Jimmy and and uh, Lindsay. We're going to go to the next one. Thank you, Luda. You know, we overcame the, all the thank difficulties you. with the with the transmission. Oh, Gigo is already has already joined. Hi, Giggle. How are you? So, hi, hi everyone. Nice, nice to be here with you. Yeah, and Giggle, uh, you know, we have uh, David Heyman, a professor here at the school, uh, and John Busquets, that is joining us from Barcelona. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, we, we're going to go with the next project, Jimmy and uh, Lindsay. Thank you, Luda. Jimmy, Lindsay, if you. y'all see my screen? Yes. Um, okay, hi everybody. Um, I'm Jamie. Um, this is my final semester as well. I'm Lindsay. Uh, all right.
right. Your final semester of Bachelor of Architecture. Yes. Correct? Yes, correct. So we recognize that major roads have the potential to act as boundary conditions in cities and affect people's sense of place within the city. And historically, different policies and stigmas have used I-35 as the dividing point between East and West Austin. And um, the city of Austin predicts that as many as 500,000 new residents will locate themselves right outside the city lines around the toll road SH-130 um, within the next 20 years. And our project is gonna focus on the area around SH-130 and its potential to act as a transition point between what we're calling East Austin and the Eastern periphery. Sorry. So as you can um, see in, this image, in these images, um, a lot of the development right now is taking place on the west side of H SH-130 in Austin city limits. And the area towards the east has a lot of agricultural land and it's really dominated by these floodplains, which makes densification a little bit more difficult, but then also provides a great opportunity to provide a lot of open space, which um, you know, can be used for parks or agriculture and in our concept manifesto, we're trying to convey this idea that, you know, the area towards the West can be a little bit more dense and try to accommodate this anticipated population growth, while the area um, towards the East is preserved for these more agricultural functions and how they can be very different, but then be very close in proximity, which will allow them to benefit from each other. Um, next slide. Um, so we're imagining that this framework that we're about to explain could begin on the northern side of Walter Elon Park, but then grow over time as needed along, um, along that toll road SH-130. And right now um, in our drawings, we're focusing on phase one, which is about 500 acres and can accommodate about 5,000 units for about 20,000 residents. Um, excellent. And, and Juan, for reference, that park is about six times the size of Central Park in New York. Uh -huh. So this just shows um, the area that phase one will focus on and the existing conditions of what it looks like right now. You know, it's kind of a transition point between Walter Elon Park, which is technically Austin limits, and then Manor. A lot of really beautiful open space. I would add that only a small portion of the park is open to the public. It's so big that there's not very, virtually no one there. So it's, 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 it's very small, the area that is open to the public. But you can go to the lake and swim and boats and everything. Keep going, keep going. We need to keep it going. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's just a site plan and that little section on the left kind of shows what I was talking about, how, um, you know, it just acts like a transition point between these areas. Um, and then it shows like this continuous grid system and how it's a similar framework of having this grid system that then gets interrupted by these um, natural features in the landscape. Um, but, you know, same thing, but different, different purposes to them. Um, um, so uh, we, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the green buffer, um, and we are proposing a 500 feet green buffer along the highway to reduce stormwater runoff, um, to provide a visual barrier and mitigate noise and pollution. Um, and um, we're also um, 
going to look into a little bit of like the highway stitches. Um, you know, the highway both divides and connects, although it has a boundary between the two zones, um, the west being the more urban and then the, or yeah, east um, agrarian. Um, uh, we intend to integrate stitches along um, SH-130, like these ones that already exist. Um, I mean, this one's um, the green line, there's a rail going through and they already have this stitch. Um, and there is also a existing um, bridge in this image, as you can see. Um, um, so, you know, one of the most exciting elements of our city is that we have these finger-like linear parks across the city um, and they serve two functions. First, they serve as bias whales that collect water and, you know, channel them back into, you know, the, this vast floodplain that already exists on the east. Um, and the other is um, more of a recreational um, purpose where, you know, people are connected to um, public activities and also back to the Walter E. Um, Long Park. Um, and along these finger-like um, linear parks, um, we have placed public programs, um, major um, recreational programs, and also schools, so that children may be able to have the opportunity to walk um, and navigate their way through these parks. Um, um, so the proposed grid system is continued across the two zones, the um, urban and agrarian um, to enhance connectivity. You know, this is um, a gr the green line that's happening in Austin. And then we're proposing more bus routes that go through these um, villages. And so this is um, what the vehicle traffic, where the vehicle traffic can go. And this is more of the um, flexibility for pedestrian traffic. Um, so a little bit about our um, structure. <clears throat> the roads that cross over the east and west are the um, arterial roads, which are these ones. Um, they're the major transit that I've talked about. Um, and they start to frame these villages. So this would be one village and this would be another. Um, and then after you enter these villages, there are these um, major streets. It's um, this one, it's these ones um, that navigate through um, these villages. And they also form a neighborhood, which we'll look into more. Um, and then we have these linear parks connecting housing people and schools, um, but they are interrupted by the major roads that have been laid out. Um, but the minor streets, which are more of um, residential streets inside these neighborhoods are um, kind of disrupted by the linear parks to discourage traffic to neighborhoods. Um, and these streets are really strictly for residents who live in the neighborhood. So, you know, um, outsiders will most likely not drive through these streets. Um, program again, so one unique thing about um, our city is that we have decided to place commercial on um, the corners of our neighborhoods with an exception um, when you are exception to the blocks that are adjacent to the park. And as you can see, they have the corners on each of the blocks. Um, and then again, schools um, are placed um, in these linear parks. And then, you know, this is kind of an arrow perspective of what it might look like for, um, in respect to the rest of this Austin city. Yeah, so we're just gonna highlight um, two neighborhoods within our scheme, one facing the park and one that's more inwards. And the idea is that, um, you know, they both follow this concept of having this guarded perimeter with these inside courtyard spaces, but they vary in like massing and density just based on the boundary conditions around them.
Yeah, so then we're going to call out some different typologies that can be used throughout, um, throughout the uh, site, depending on the location. And we imagine that, you know, once we kind of set out a framework of these, um, there'll be future um, architects or developments that come in and um, design each block or each building. This is an example of one that's um, be facing the park and it's our highest density typology. It's one big apartment building that uses up the entire block and creates a large courtyard in the center of it with lots of balconies that are overlooking both the center of it and then also um, overlooking the outside as well. So then this next one is also courtyard apartments, but it's just at a different scale. And this one's further in, not facing the park. Or property values might be a little bit lower. Um, so instead of having like this one big building, it's these smaller buildings that are just close proximity to each other to create these courtyard spaces that then have these nooks to create um, these outdoor spaces that are a little bit more uh, cozy and protect protected rather than one grand one. Um, so this one is um, a typology that's of the inner neighborhood um, that are not adjacent to the, uh, the Decker Lake Park. Um, you know, uh, yeah, they have separate row. We're proposing that they be separate row housing buildings um, would have varying facades. Um, and um, most importantly, um, the housing that is adjacent to the linear park right here would have taller building height. Um, and then um, we will provide of a private garden at the back, but it would be relatively small to, um, I mean, in comparison to, you know, the suburban um, housings that we see in Texas. Um, but then they also get this kind of semi-private shared garden space um, in between the two. Um, this is a typology that is not um, adjacent to the linear park. They are more enclosed. Um, again, um, the corners are cut, the neighborhood corners are cut um, and they're more enclosed in the perimeter um, and they vary in heights from one stories to four, um, but they again have a um, enclosed shared um, courtyard in the center. And yes, so that is basically um, what we have. Diego, you want to go first? Happy to. Thank you, Juan. Yes, so <clears throat> thank you for the presentation um, and um, congratulations on, uh, on getting to this uh, big milestone at the end of the semester. Uh, maybe we can stay on this image because here we see several things at the same time, so it's going to help us. I, I I hear a lot of feedback. I don't know if some of you yeah, Lindsay, do you mind muting your microphone? I think. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I like your concept manifesto. It's a very evocative diagram, um, also graphically beautiful. But then I I kind of lose uh, track of some of what the diagram is alluding to in the in the actual in the actual project so i want to try to talk a little bit about that um you seem to care for the um hydrologic patterns of this part of the metropolitan regions which are cer certainly very relevant and significant and and be great to to work with that but then the grid that you lay out on the site is somewhat rigid and is not really showing me that you want to work with those hydrologic uh, patterns. So there is something there that maybe we should we should talk about. 
the way in which the, the development uh, meets the south uh, edge, um, and let me just try to very quickly annotate right here. I don't know if there is an issue here of parcelization. You cannot change the way you were treating that edge, but it just feels so at odd with the ecological patterns, right? The, the, the kind of very straight line. I wonder if there was a, another way to uh, make your development meet um, the, the natural environment. This is an example of, 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 of what I'm pointing at. Um, the freeway, which is a, a major constraint uh, of your project, um, maybe could have been an opportunity. Uh, you, you worked with the creation of a buffer, which, yeah, is, is, a, is a good thing, but um, could we have done something else, right? Um, and then let's really start to think about how people are going to use this buffer, if at all. It's a very vast piece of land and uh, um, probably is going to be hard to, 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 to program it as a park because of the proximity of the freeway. So I wonder if actually the theme of the freeway could have been tackled in a slightly different way. Um, two more things. I don't want to take too much, too much space. I, I really want to hear what the other reviewers um, have, have to say on the project. But... I think that given the, the, the scale of the project, it was very important uh, that your public space system within the villages and across the villages um, uh, was to become the armature of the project. I see when you show that system of linear parks, um, linear parks that are not really connecting um, a system of destinations, um, and therefore, they're not really giving shape and form to, to the villages themselves, right? The, 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 even if you're working on these perimeter block patterns, eventually the grid feels a little bit suburban in the sense that there is no center of, of, of the village. There is no, um, there's no spines. There's no, uh, I see a little bit of a kind of a, I've agreed with no hierarchy. And I think that's another missed opportunity. Finally, when we go down to the scale of the block, um, you know, I caught the end of the previous presentation and I, there was such an interesting de debate on can the perimeter block make it to the United States or can, can it make it to Austin? I think that's a very fascinating conversation. Um, I think it's interesting that you try here, but I'm not sure about the scale of that block, the size of the courtyard. You know, I heard a second ago we were um, uh, someone was was mentioning Berlin. I think of Copenhagen. Of course, I think of Barcelona, and the role of in inner courtyards in perimeter blocks um, in those cities. There's something quite uh, important about the scale of that block the size of the courtyard, the way it relates with, with, the, with, the, with the unit of the buildings. And I'm not sure you're kind of fully aware of those recipes and, and what is uh, the work uh, when it comes to scale and the relationship between the height of the building and the inner courtyard and the street um, in, those, in those examples. I'm gonna stop here. I want to give a kind of an overview on on topics that I think are a little problematic, um, especially because you start strong with that beautiful concept manifesto that makes me think that you know that you had some great um, uh, intentions and intuitions in the beginning. Maybe maybe I'll jump in. Uh... Uh, just following up, uh, there was a particular point that uh, uh, Gigo, we've never met, I'm David, it's nice to meet you, you made that I, I think it is a, a missed opportunity, which is the highway. I mean, if, if you look at the kind of topographic plan and the drainage plan, it is true that, that if you look at all of Austin, right, Austin operates on the fact that the drainages are so intense, they become the places where you can't build, they become the means, even I live in West Austin, west of the university, I walk down the street, I walk up a drainage to a park. 
you know, there's a pool. I walk up that drainage to visit my neighbors. That idea that this, there's an intimate connection between those two things is a beautiful, a beautiful way to start. Of course, the thing in your plan that disrupts it the most is the highway. The highway is the thing which absolutely disrespects that whole idea of drainage. And even it seems to me the kind of a possibility of using these bridges to, to actually solve the drainage to, to rebuild them, not as only as pedestrian or, or transport, but also as water bridges to reconnect this landscape on this side to the other side. So then I have a couple of other comments. Uh, I want to come back to this master plan drawing, which I think is really interesting. I want to look at it, but I just want to talk for a moment about the aerial perspective. Can we just go back to the aerial perspective really quickly? So there, stop. So one of the things that's really intriguing, that's unclear to me because you guys didn't stay and it's been unclear so far in the three projects is, is it, uh, do we, are we continuing this kind of idea of a collagistic landscape as it moves endlessly out, you know, uh, buffeted by various kinds of forces and factors, all of which are collage over each other, infrastructure, ownership, uh, 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 public patterns of transportation, public patterns of drainage, public patterns of, you know, or, or do we have a kind of idea about actually a, a kind of appropriate dimension? If you say I have, the block is an appropriate dimension and you use this word villages, then I think there's this other kind of question about like, like actually it's worth bearing out, which is how, how much is this? Like how big are these things? What, what is this perimeter about? Like, are these actually villages, which I actually like very much. I love the idea that, that says, no, we're going to conceive this endlessly metastasizing cancerous landscape as actually uh, much more in a kind of a, a modernist sense of the kind of, you know, 1940s, 1950s, that actually, we actually have to conceive of these things as, as villages at a certain scale that actually operate in a certain way. And in that regard, I want to make a kind of couple of comments about the grid, which I actually find fascinating. When Could you show the master plan now, the sixth slide? Uh, is that the, uh, the slide number six? So when you look at this drawing, this is, let's go to six. Yeah, when you look at this drawing, it's really a funny, this is the green buffer, there it is. I, I, when I first thought, wait, go back. When I first thought, I thought it was wrong. I thought that somehow it was a folded drawing, that it was folded along this line because these drawing, these, you know, these are blocks are square. And then these blocks, which I thought were square, I thought we were looking at them in one of those kind of low isometrics that OMA draws, right? But they're not, right? It's all a plan, right? So like there's, there's, there's this normal vill over here. And then there's this freaky Angleville over here that actually is defined by, by the idea that somehow there's water moving through here, right? So like, I actually really like that a lot. I mean, for me as an architect, not as a planner, but as someone going, okay, how do you begin to, uh, begin to wrench and define identity from the geometries of mass that you put into place, regardless of other questions about whether or not, I think to me, the, the, the whole question of, of, of this distinction I mean, right now, you know how it is. Right now, the people in this time, the kids that grew up here, they're mocked by the kids that grew up over here. And the kids that grew up over here mock the kids that grow over here. And you get one softball team over here and another softball. And this softball team is called the trapezoids. And this, this trapezoid, and, and, and these parents hate each other. And, and over time, this division develops here locally. You know what I'm saying? Which is the thing that you, as architects at the very least, have, have embedded into... So I, I think that, there, that more is, is warranted there. I, I actually think that this is a lovely kind of a breaking, interesting question of typography and typology and how it might develop, not in terms of economy, not in terms of, of unit types, but literally in terms of the patterns of the city that you make. There's this other thing that you see then that I think is really intriguing. If you begin to conceive of this as a village and you begin to conceive of this as a village, and then you see this as a problem, then I would recommend one last kind of urban strategy. I would recommend thinking of these things as almost medieval things and that the movement out into this agricultural landscape is like one of those drawings from the, 19th, the 14th and 12th century where you see these town walls or you build up against the freeway. You build, you, 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 instead, of, instead of petering out of the freeway, you, you just deal with the freeway as scar tissue in the hardest way. And then the idea of this movement out into this agricultural landscape, which like the 12th century and the 13th century had absolutely figured out, right? The, the correct, how far could you go but that you could also retreat quickly in case a marauding horde came over the horizon. It's the same thing as the walkable city, right? It's no different whatsoever. And, and that conception where you say, now actually, instead of imagining that this is somehow in the future, that we're, what, what we're doing here, agriculture is preparing for more of this, that you actually conceive of this whole unit 
much more ruthlessly in section as a kind of physical manifestation of a conception of village, rather than this kind of, I think, uncertain, is it, is it a patch of skin that I'm putting there? Is it a mole? You know, what, what mm. is it that I'm actually making out there in that landscape? So I think there's, there's embedded here there are, are really beautiful ideas. For me, they're, they're a little cautiously treated and they're, 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 there's a kind of politeness that's not critical that I, that for me yet. Good. Okay. Now, let me uh, jump in. I think just a few additional remarks. I think many things has been said to Ray, Lindsay, and Jimmy. Um, I think probably um, I appreciate what, what you do as a general strategy and the facing. When you are saying that you are just trying to create a certain rational into the Eastern planning, the Eastern periphery. I think that that's a good, in a way that then you, you pose like a sequence. Probably, I think the interpretation that you do from the edges, like this piece, and then you learn from that, and then you try to say, well, perhaps this is a good scale. And then with that, you can imagine that then things could happen at this dimension, eh? as a way that that, you know, that, that, I think it makes sense as a hypothesis. What I like in your scheme is that you are, it's something that it is, you can see that in the original piece that you are, trying to interpret is based on very simple rules, but the rules are from the center to the, to the edges and the edges they miscontrol. And then because of that, perhaps you are thinking more that your pieces has to get a certain idea of the way that they are organized inside. And that I think is what is interesting in your scheme, that you are putting a lot of attention into what happened in between the, the buildings, in between the blocks. I think these linear spaces, a sort of wedge uh, form, I think that gets quite a lot of interesting observations. I think it seems to me quite very interesting in your, in your proposal. I appreciate it. I follow what the previous uh, juror said about the, the way that the edges, I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to make this type of geometry when you have this uh, landscape in the middle, probably that can be also improved. That's not a bad job. But I like, uh, finally, just to make a point about what has been already mentioned, that is the question of the, the highway. It seems to me that when you are uh, selecting that you want to, to treat the motorway, and then you make a section and you try to do um, a certain reinterpretation, I think then we have to be perhaps more radical. We have to start thinking if in America, we always appreciate the tradition of the parkways, which in fact, it was something fantastic. Before the, the war, the parkways were making that the transportation, the landscape can meet together. Today, we cannot just copy the parkways, but perhaps we have to start think, rethinking how the, this big infrastructure can become something else. And, the way, and then probably something that you can you can put a little bit more effort on that. I saw and I appreciate that you put the, the tramway in the middle, but then you have to consider if the tramway, this mass transportation should be in the middle or should be in the edges, because they, they can enter into the neighborhoods and they can leave. I think in your scheme, there is this potential that you offer with the, the red spots, which I think is very nice, a scheme, where you were saying the public transport is going to want it, going to create a certain centrality into the villages and will make the connection between the different pieces. I think that gets a lot of potential. But going back to the to the highways, sometimes we said the highways are, should become boulevards because then we have the idea that boulevard is good and in fact is better than a highway. But perhaps the boulevard of the 21st century has to be something else. And probably the lanes could be combined with trees, with the a certain different type of interpretation of the landscape. Perhaps we have to imagine lanes where, as we mentioned before, the drive left cars are going to have a special lanes from the others, and the mass transportation are going to have another space. Is a way, the advantage of the highways everywhere, but mainly in the States, is that they reserve a lot of land. And this land can be easily manipulated. And at least as, a, as an academic exercise, I feel that deserves 
a lot of credit and and you have to put a lot of effort on that because we have to start rethinking how these elements that today are seen for everybody like a very functional elements and mostly negative because they are not producing any type of urbanity or any type of quality for the for the people living nearby or using these elements can become perhaps places of of the new centralities in the future is a way and then it's very much up to up to us and up to the research that you do in these studios something that we have to put more as as much attention as possible huh? but thank you very much i think is a well the work you did is quite uh, is, is extraordinary because you are touching several scales and i think that that's very good i appreciate it very much thank you thank you i think we're, we're going to be ready we have one uh, Brittany call if you can share we have an individual project that's very different than the ones that we have seen so far Brittany Nicole, if you can just go ahead and and, and share uh we'll try to get to it and and have a conversation about it go ahead Brittany yes Nicole. okay so hello i'm Brittany nicole and i did something a little different as juan mentioned um okay so i'll just get oh I want to mention also I'm an MARC student and this is my second to last ever studio. <laughs> um, okay, so allow me for a moment to rave about the shopping mall. <laughs> uh, the shopping mall is the epitome of the American dream. It is a dreamscape of possibility and promise, uh, but beyond shiny mall marble lies much more. Um, pictured here is what many consider to be the first ever shopping mall, which is Southdale Center by Victor Gruen, circa the 1970s. Um, not only did Southdale mark a pivotal moment in cultural history, but it established a brand new typology, uh, one that merges city and town, landscape and built environment, but most importantly, became the ultimate place to be. And as decades pass and taste changed, the mall evolved, but one thing stayed the same. Uh, as, may, as you may have noticed, the interior of these dreamscapes mirror the outside world and are seemingly modeled after landscapes and town centers. Um, some, of the, some of them even use real life trees. <laughs> and in fact, Victor Gruen modeled his shopping centers after just that, creating vibrant emerging centers of activity with his application of humor, inventiveness, and ingenuity to enlighten. Um, to quote Grady Clay, speaking of Northland specifically. And along with his designs, Gruen established a number of organizational strategies for the shopping mall, among them a radial strategy that funnels pedestrians towards one main center of activity, often characterized by landscaping air and areas of gathering as pictured in the previous slide. And all of this creating an interested created an interesting phenomena. Um, the shopping mall became a magnetic force. It held incredible allure and possessed the ability to attract hundreds of people at, its, at the peak of its popularity. And yes, shopping malls are tragically became to just become basic, basically junk space, um, but this dying typology offers a new perspective on approaching the creation of city subcenters and the rejuvenation of existing neighborhoods. So that being said, uh, I introduce to you Dead Mall City. And like the mall before the internet, it's the one place to be. So upon first visit to the site, I immediately felt as though something was lacking. Uh, I initially looked at types of inhabitable space on the site in an attempt to find something I could get excited about. And this assessment, in this assessment, I found that inhabitable outdoor space and indoor space rarely converged. Um, it's really one or the other on this site, uh, but besides that, I was largely underwhelmed. So that being said, and my personal feelings aside, I realized the area needed a little push to reach its full potential. Uh, it needed a breath of life. It needed new amenities, new people, new typologies, but mostly it needed something to draw outsiders in to make this happen. So looking at the larger site via Google Maps, uh, because I don't have a car and we're still in a pandemic, uh, I encountered a specific area with incredible potential for intervention. Uh, the perfect starter lot for this area's new chapter. So the lot as it stands is mostly asphalt and it serves one lone building that itself serves one program. 
And like all good things to like all good things, um, this building's purpose will surely come to an end. Its days are numbered and where one person may see an empty parking lot, others see potential. And much like the now dead mall, this lot can too be repurposed. So this, out, this site stood out to me also because it offers a unique possibility for connectivity to the larger East Austin area. It is situated east of Highway 183 and just south of I-290, I believe, <laughs> uh, right between a commercial center, several housing communities, and even nearby school. In order to take full advantage of this, Deadmall City provides multiple points of access to accommodate each. There are four primary entrances and each extends beyond the site to engage surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, and an interesting discovery I found and something I, that's crucial to point out is that there's an existing pedestrian bridge that spans across Highway 183 and is located just south of my site. So additionally, Denmark can be Denmark City can be accessed across a variety of transportation modes, with a primary focus on pedestrians. Um, these access points again extend out to reach the surrounding area and provide a safe access to the site, which again includes connecting directly to the pedestrian bridge. So taking a closer look at the project itself, um, Denmark City employs the use of a radio organizational system paired with pedestrian streets that enclose what become residential blocks. Pedestrian streets are aligned with commercial and social amenities as needed, and pedestrians are also separated from vehicles via architecture, which in turn creates these residential blocks, in addition to, po to pockets of public outdoor program. Um, and some amenities can be found farther south of the site um, that are primarily commercial. This encourages patrons to engage with the larger site as they move through the larger space to reach the shops. Pedestrian streets are adorned with arches, we'll take a, look, a closer look at later, um, that function as wayfinding aids and mark key entrances. Uh, these streets meet at the center, town center, if you will, the main location for activity and gathering. And secondary areas of gathering can be found throughout, including conversation pits, so to speak, um, between pedestrian streets and a larger area for gathering south of the site that's along the existing kind of existing park edge. Um, and taking a closer look at the residential box, I've called, called out the Loveless community to serve as an example, as you can see on the top right. So here, the Loveless community, we begin to see what these pockets of program um, within each block look like. Uh, they feature enclosed green spaces and direct access to the amenities Dead Mall City has to offer. These pockets of landscape function as addi additional gathering spaces and work to establish a sense of place where users are protected from vehicular traffic without sacrificing open space. And a, a tower marks the entrance to the block from the outside larger community and also serves as a welcoming marker that can also serve as a greenhouse, a gathering spot, or simply a sculptural piece as needed. Uh, and taking a look at the project sectionally, we really get a feel for this transition of spaces that range in scale. Uh, the periphery provides a scale closer to that of your typical hallway. And as one moves towards the center, the space opens up, making the presence of the town center known as the main area for activity. And it establish a establishes a clear readable hierarchy of space. As previously mentioned, the entrances and subsequent pedestrian streets feature arches that serve as wayfinding and circulation tools, which become less dense as one reaches town center. So these towers are also found throughout, and one type can be found at the entrance of each block, as mentioned previously, while the other tower takes the role of landmark, but can also be used to, again, navigate your way towards town center. And the following perspectives were taken at various locations throughout the site, which I've identified as key points of access. So this one was taken kind of at this crossroads between um, this like residential area and it's right leads directly to this existing school that is right here. It's kind of towards the right of the site. This next one is connected a little bit closer and it actually extends to this new 
residential community that's currently being built. And this connection really opens itself up to the opportunity of maybe establishing like a pedestrian bridge so kids and just residents in general can get to the site safely. And then the last one connects directly to where the pedest existing pedestrian bridge is at and is meant to provide a look, um, kind of a view of what you would see if one were on the highway or even walking pedestrian bridge. So you can really see Deadmall City off in the distance and find your way towards it. And so finally, circling back to town center, uh, we really get we really begin to see the reason Deadmall City is the one place to be. Um, town center allows for a number of uses and adaptations, all the while bringing us back to nature. Here, the built environment and nature become one, and much, much like Victor Gruen had intended with his original vision. So on top of it all, Deadmall City provides a crucial link between landscape and built environment, in addition to bringing people together. And over time, town center and its surrounding structures become covered with landscape. Um, land and city become one, nature continues to grow ever more. And in conclusion, um, much more can be found beyond the comfort of nostalgia that shopping malls provide. The success of the shopping mall can be attributed to many things, among them their layout, amenities, and undeniable ability to bring people together. In an attempt to preserve this beloved yet dying ty typology, Deadmall City takes the mall's successes and applies them on an urban scale. But beyond that, the shopping mall successes are used to bring new life and improve communities such as this. Denmal City brings together a diverse set of programs, amenities, and with it, a diverse set of people. It draws both existing residents, new residents, and passerbys, thus breathing life into this corner of East Austin. And like the mall be before the internet, it becomes the one place to be. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Brittany Nicole. Brittany, uh, 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 first of all, I, I, I just I just laugh my ass off during this presentation, which I, I just I find very charming. Uh, I, I really, really appreciate it. I appreciate you kind of owning it, taking control, moving away from this kind of generic kind of architect. Let, let us like just lay out. I mean, you laid your ideas out. I really appreciate it. And you, you took a stand. And actually, I think there's some really intriguing ideas, and I want to like. A, like note those first and then maybe we can open up and kind of talk about them. I mean, like the, one of the differences in your project and the ones we've seen so far before is essentially this kind of distinct difference between saying the, the growth of the city is gonna be this essentially leprous kind of expansion, right? That's gonna continue like a skin disease out into the, and, and, and really it's just a question of, uh, of the, the pattern or fabric of that fabric for better or for worse as opposed to saying mm, there's this other alternative which is uh, recognizing that the american city doesn't make public space which is to target this kind of highly localized opportunities to to reconceive the city i wish your project were 15 stories tall honestly that, that, that that's my immediate initial reaction to it. I, I wish it were that 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 saying i'm, I'm going to reimagine the I'm even going to use the memory of the fact that this was a mall. I'm going to use the the, the memory of, of a kind of place making understanding. It kind of it's an interesting argument. The argument that that Americans don't understand one type, but they certainly understand the mall type, right? Like that, as as a public space type. And 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 I'm going to I'm going to build that into the experiment of this thing. It's been done before. Again, Charles Moore at Piazza d'Italia, or you know, other situations, Kresge College. I mean, that, that's an essential kind of argument about how a certain kind of a, a picturesque space is made to entertain Americans, and it could be made really without an ethical notion of material construct. Right? It's essentially made as a series of stage sets. I like that. I, li I like very much the idea of saying that, that rather than thinking of this as a kind of as, as a kind of skin. I'm going to think of it as almost like a form of acupuncture, as a kind of very precise place that doesn't necessarily have a, a, a boundary condition, but that organizes the landscape uh, by, by a, a certain level of intensity of location. And that's actually the primary reason why I, I wish it were taller. Um, and then also by making it taller, it would necessarily force you to take these kinds of 
structures that you're posing in this drawing, for example, as, as really a stage set and necessarily have to begin to think of them as physical constructs that have structural material uh, uh, and other kinds of uh, 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 demands that would, I think, uh, move them, I think, from the ironic kind of condition in which you presented it into one that is that is that that belies the seriousness of your work. I think. Uh, 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 I, I'll stop there. I, I thought this was just a terrific presentation. I love the name Dead Mall City. I mean, there's an American tradition like fish kill. Right, like the, the idea of that something horrible happened, and then that becomes the name of the place and the memory of the place. I, I, I actually love. I don't. I wish it weren't Dead Mall City. I just just Dead Mall is, is enough to me. You know, like as a as a as a as a, as a name. Uh, uh, I, I wish one other thing. I, I do wish that it had a system of horizontal shade. Uh, right. So, so far, all the projects that we've seen have just relied somehow on the idea that that public space is in the sun, and outside, and you're like. Uh, you're the first to begin to suggest that it might be shaded, you know, and that it might be a network of shade and that in the network of shade, the network of shade acts against a series of vertical signifiers, which I like in your project. Like it's nascent there. I think it's a very, very good idea. I think it could be developed further, but, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you. Good. I'd like to perhaps continue with that. I think, uh, Nicole, it seems I mean, the, the fact that your project is based on a very um, a clear and clever research, I think that helped a lot. I think it's for, uh, as an intention of design to have a research and to go deeply into the research, it, it helps a lot. And I think the idea that you are this rethinking of the, of the mall as a, as a prototype that needs to be reconsidered, I think that is quite important. I think we have to say that there are already some very good examples. And we can say that even in Europe, there are only a few malls because we are very much saying that the mall is the American prototype. But as you know, the mall was invented in Europe, even that later is developed in America. And the Europeans, when we see a mall, we said, well, this is an American model. It's not true because as the way there is always this concept. And the mall today is spread all over the world. But we can see that the reinterpretation of the mall today is asking to become places of hybrids. Is the way. I think your, your scheme is, has a lot of potential, but even I can imagine that this, the same development that you do in this project, that to say, well, this place that was congregating the shops and the cars is becoming something else, because in place of cars, they are coming the people with bicycle and walking and and the, this place is irradiating and is becoming the center of, because it's the place of interest of all communities around. That is a, a fantastic strategy. But even could be a place with a relatively, as David was saying, with higher density. Like many malls are transformed. I mean, all peripheral malls in Europe are in transformation with adding other uses and making very dense uh, housing and mixed use into that because uh, because even the mall, as, a, as, as you mentioned, as a, as a place of goods, it's changing because the use of the goods, because of the logistics and other, it's changing. So the way I think it's to take that as a, as, a, as a subject of research and making project out of it, that I think is a very good initiative. And I think I applaud that, that the effort that you did on that. And I think even that could be a very good strategy, a real strategy in Austin, making in those places a sort of centers that they are attracting different modes of transportation, different people from different uses and creating then the mall still has a future. If we imagine that other users can be in that place. I think this is what you're suggesting at least is offering um, to me as well as a reading of your project. And yeah? thank you very much, Nicole. Thank you. So Brittany, Nicole, uh, your project really caught me off guard, <laughs> but in a great way, I want to say. So uh, I'm, I still have to think about it a little bit, but what I know already is that I'm sure that I really like it. Um, really interesting the way in which you use irony through the project. You're almost, if I may say, um, messing a little bit with us. And that's refreshing. I think you're messing a little bit with the urbanist 
with the urbanist mentality, with a certain kind of urbanist that maybe um, American urbanist that is looking at European tradition and therefore sees the mall as you know the cause of all problems. Uh, you are um, you are actually um, trying to do something um, that goes against that kind of stereotype, and that is very very refreshing and exciting. So that's for me is the point of start. Um, you do it with research. You do it with research that demonstrates actually um, some of the design. Um, science and art behind uh, the creation of the first malls. You do it with an aesthetics that is absolutely um, well-crafted, original, yet, of course, influenced by um, the, the genre, if I may say. Um, and so you make for a very powerful project that is a very powerful statement. Um, what I still trying to wrap my head around is how much irony you're putting in it. And, and I think that's part of it. Like you, it's, it's unclear to what degree some of what you show, you show because you really think that would make for a great city or you show because it's just a fascinating provocation. And that is probably what I, I would like to find out a little bit more about. Um, there is certainly the need for, uh, re-embracing certain things that the urbanist tradition has discarded as less interesting or you know kind of uh, um, less valuable as source of inspiration for future city design and so your project certainly is challenging that notion but then i'm curious to see if you really think that some of the solution that you propose would work in this kind of future city design influenced by these models. Because there are certain things that I think are actually a little flawed in, 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 the, in the history of, of, of mall design. And, and those things I would not want to resurface. I would not want to look at as references, right? And I can tell you exactly what I'm thinking about. Um, malls work very well uh, as uh, places um, in themselves, right? They're designed around actually um, human uh, um, scale and 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 um, uh, human uh, needs in a very um, effective way. But they do produce uh, as a byproduct uh, other things that maybe are less desirable. Mall relies, for example, on uh, an incredibly extensive amount of surface parking. They are not reachable unless the automobile, they disconnect the communities around it, depending how you're looking at it. So how do you go about those byproducts in your kind of mall utopia, right? Um, can, the, can what is good about the mall um, uh, continue to live on while we solve some of those uh, problematic aspects around the mall? So that would be, that would be my, my question for you. But nevertheless, very fascinating project. And I think, um, yeah, the kind of project that we need to see more of because they are kind of taking us off guard as, as instructors and, and reviewers and, and really opening um, our point of view in many positive ways. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I know that we're going a little past the, the, the allotted time, so... I don't know if there's any, uh, especially I know that, uh, John, you, you were able to, to connect after some difficulty, but uh, uh, we, I think that we have lost. I think we lost him. I think yeah. he said he had to leave. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know. I mean, David, thank you very much. I mean, I don't know if you have any final comment. Gigo, uh, thank you. You're going to stay for the next round. Uh, David, you, you, know, you know that we had, basically, we took one hour to connect right. in the first session. So we had to drag a little bit onto the second. So thank you for being patient with that. Unbelievable. I, I just wanted to say one last thing about, about Brittany. I really appreciate uh, Brittany. I've seen your project now two semesters in a row. And I, I actually really appreciate the intelligence you bring 
to this kind of dispassionate stand back, assess the problem and define what I want to do, even if it's not fully responsible in a way. I actually really appreciate that. I think it's a it's this thing we want from students and I find it very heartening and I wanted to congratulate you on it. It's actually a pleasure to see your work two semesters in a row. I do think for me, all the projects we saw today, I, mean, I understand the work, I understand the difficulty of the semester. It was an incredibly difficult semester. But for me, the biggest the biggest dilemma that I've found in the projects of it's look, it's not a dilemma that we have an answer to, but it is a dilemma, right? Is the definition of public space in America like what is civic space? What is def, you know, what is it? How do you define it? How do you make it? What, how do you, I mean, I, I mean, right now, the strongest argument, uh, you know, the strongest criticism of American public space is this is the first chapter of that book, what is it, the possibility of an absolute architecture by, by Araeli, where he basically talks about our our urbanization assumes that like each cluster or block will, will, will theoretically define its own public space, but that public space is entirely defined by the private realm, right? It's entirely defined by, by private interests as opposed to public ones. So what, what I appreciate about Brittany's project is the idea that already engaging in a private development of public space and a history or typology of it allows you to begin to theoretically conceive just Brittany, what your building is missing is three or four 20 story slabs of various other kinds of, you know, various other kinds of, because if you look at that infrastructure, it will look a lot like Las Vegas, right? It shortly, that that crazy mall that's lit at night with all the, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, but I, but I, I think that for me, that that kind of question was a question that, 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 that troubled earlier projects. I appreciate the fact, it's, it's such a funny mix. I appreciate Brittany you being really irresponsible because it, it allows you to get to a certain kind of point. And then I appreciate the other groups for being highly responsible, but then having to sidestep the fact that in order to begin to engage this problem, you need to take at some point a really irrational risk. You have to, you still have to kind of make a claim and then you have to go down in flames on it because it's it's not a problem that's been solved. It, it, you know, architects, I was raised in the generation that said that if you could get Midwesterners to haggle over the price of garlic in essentially a, an Italian piazza, you would solve this, the public space. And that that argument, you know, collapse of its own accord, you know? I mean, Brittany, it's there a little bit in your own project. So I, I, I think it's not that there aren't architects who have made powerful right, arguments for public space, uh, but th that was the one thing that I found in the project latent, but not fully developed that I, that I would love to, have liked to see more. I do, uh, what I, found, I do think that the presentations were spectacular. They were really clear. They're very concise. I admire the amount of work. This was such a difficult semester, you guys. The students, you lived through it. The faculty have literally been flossing students' teeth, trying to get everybody's momentum back up again. It's been such a tough semester. So I, I wanted to say thank you. For, for the presentations because they, they allowed you to kind of quickly kind of hone in on, on what things were strong, what things were weak. Thank you, David. No, yeah, all very pleasure. important points. And we're gonna, we're gonna keep, keep, keep basically those kind of questions that you bring you know, are very much at the heart of what we should be discussing in the school. What is the concept of public space and you know, what is different in one place and another? So the, the, the 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 topic is definitely something that we have to keep working on. So, and I agree with you that there are a lot of issues that need to be discussed. And I, I know that Gigo has a lot of ideas about that too. So, we're going to Gigo, continue. I'm passing over to you then. Man. Yes. <laughs> so we, we we're going to continue in that in other studios, but uh, we need, we're going to have a, a break now, Gigo, uh, uh, Dean. So thank you, David. We're going uh, students. Let's let's do that. Let's get together, Dean. I think at three, and then we we assign the breakout room for, for the two groups that we're going to run in parallel. So, Gigo, what we're going to and do is... And we should be back on time now. Yes, so we're back on time. So, Gigo, the idea is that we're going to have two. You're going to be with Juan Luis and you, uh, with uh, Ju Ju Juliana Felkner from the school. And then I'm going to be with... Uh, and Dean is going to stay with you. And I'm going to be with Rene Davids and, and Charlton Lewis and, and Kevin right. Sullivan in the other group. Right. So, we so, have to do it this way, Gigo, because that's the only way to see everybody. Of yes. course. See, see you in 15 minutes. Is that right? Yeah, we'll be we'll be back at three. Let's One, be back at three, okay. whatever time is now. Yes. Okay. Okay. See you guys. See you in a moment. Bye.
Renee, we're um, we're on a little break. We're going to start again in about eight minutes, and uh, we're back on schedule again.
Juliana, how are you doing today? Pretty good, Dean. How are you doing? It's been a little bit uh, difficult. We've had Zoom issues all day. We, we, we started oh. an hour late because we couldn't, you know, like Harvard block their Zoom and UT blocks their Zoom and together they don't play. And we had the same <laughs> issues with Berkeley. And so and I killed our whole um, studio link and just started another one. So the one we're using right now is the one that we normally use to teach our Mm -hmm. class in and mm -hmm. for some reason the settings are different so we have oh, that okay. issue and you know <laughs> we have a student who's sort of taking the class from eastern russia who had oh, wow. some issues with lag and anyway yeah. it's been difficult um but we're here and we're <laughs> back on schedule again awesome um and welcome charlton and um because juan and i put our and nice map there um, because Juan and I put our studios together, we actually have 25 students mm -hmm. and they are a mixture of, you know, advanced design undergraduate students, uh, advanced design MARC 1 students and a few urban design students and a couple dual degree students that are really coming from the planning mm -hmm. CRP side. So it's a, we're, it's, we're bringing them all now. It's a mixture. Oh, we're nice. Doing, um, we're all doing 25 in two hours? We are, we are doing, what we are going to do is um, we're going to break this last session into two different groups, one of which will stay on the main I'll Zoom to link, send a doodle. Uh, uh, the kind of broadcast link, and then one of them will be um, in a breakout room which won't be broadcast, but we'll record for later. Um, one will go with one group and I'll go with one group. And then you guys will split up. So okay. um, let's see. Well, Dean, my only concern is whether Juan Luis has connected or not. I have not seen Juan Luis yet. Did he get the email from you with the new address? You know, that's a good question. Um, I will send him a new one now anyway. Let's see. Yeah, because, you know, he may not have. Let's see. I got too many windows open here. So but it's, not, it's not quite three yet, but uh, whenever it is on, I would like to introduce well, anyway. the reviewers. I'm sending him the new link right now. I send it. I send a new link to Bea. Bea just realized that Juan Luis was going to be, and she wanted to join. And I sent her the new. Oh, link. of course, sure. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, hold on one and second. Then I don't know if Kevin. I sent. I sent. Well, Juliana, Charlton, and Kevin, the new link just. Oh, before. okay. So then, then Juan Luis probably didn't get it. Juan Luis is the one that I may not have done. So I'm doing it right now. Mm -hmm. I'll send him a WhatsApp also to let him know that. All right. I just sent it to him. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, let me let me just send this to, to him via voicemail. So Juliana, you and um, we'll make introductions before we split up but exactly uh, let's do that let's do the introductions all together and then we can split up yeah but juliana you and and gigo di tomaso uh and i guess juan luis will be with me okay and renee and charlton and kevin will be with uh juan miro <laughs> And then we have one, two, three, three or four projects to do, depending on which group we're talking about. Um, Sí, 
I, he's I speaking in Spanish, but we all understand Spanish, so we're, we're no, good. No, uh, the, the, <laughs> what's happened is that he was trying to connect to the old link. And yeah, okay, so so mira, a ver si puedes conectar con ese. So he's trying now the new one because he was having the same difficulty that Rene and, and John were having. So, I mean, we need to we need to see, okay. He should be in now. I just, I just admitted him. Ah, o sea, te estás entrando, Juan Luis, porque te acaba de emitir en la, en el. La... Okay, perfecto. Okay, so I think that I, I don't know if Kevin is already in the call. Uh, Kevin got the email from you, no? He got the email from me. I'm not seeing Kevin yet. Uh, Juan Luis needs to unmute. No, Juan Luis, he, uh, Juan Luis is connected, but muted. El, el micrófono, Juan Luis. Now, now. Sí, claro. Fenomenal. Excuse me, because I, I, I spent a half an hour trying to connect. <laughs> that's that's our fault, Juan. No, 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 no. Is is I, we, I changed, stay... we changed the we changed the link because we were having technical difficulties no this morning. So my apologies. Yes. We are here. <laughs> okay, right. so I think that we're only missing Kevin, but I think that probably we can go ahead and start. I think I would like to introduce. I think that we can do uh, uh, introductions while we are together. So Juan Luis, we're going to split the the jury into two 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 separate presentations. You will be with Gigo, with uh, Juliana, and with uh, Dean, and I will be with Rene, Davids, and Charlton, and Kevin when he joins. Okay. But, you know, let's. So many of the students know some of the. We have about half of the reviewers are from the school and half are from outside. So the ones from the school, probably all the students have encountered them at some point. Charlton Lewis is the. That's not necessarily a good thing either. <laughs> Come on, Charles. Oh. You're 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 the one who takes care of the students of the yeah. school, so so they need to interact with you. So, Charles Lewis is a professor at the school, and he said, uh, "I think the official title is uh, uh, how how is it called for student affairs, associate dean for student affairs, emperor, okay. emperor, emperor of student affairs." Yes, you are in emperor. Rome. You are in Rome. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Kevin. Kevin has joined us now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, and when we have also uh, uh, from the school, we have uh, Kevin Sullivan. Kevin is uh, uh, teaches regularly at the school. He's a, a landscape architect, but with an eye for, I mean, I think that you study biology, if I remember correctly, in your undergrad, right, Kevin? Yeah, biochemistry. Yeah, biochemistry, yeah. And, you know, I remember when, when, when Kevin was a student of mine, you, you know, he came to Spain and, and I was saying, Kevin, you, you move in scales like no one else, you know, in terms of the, <laughs> the city, the scale. So I think it's, he has an incredible ability to operate at every scale. And uh, uh, we have, and so he teaches uh, studios at the school, but he also practices here in Austin. Uh, uh, Juliana Felkner is, uh, is a professor at the school. She, she came after spending some time in Switzerland and uh, oh. she teaches uh, uh, environmental uh, environmental design and the the, the kind of uh, technical aspects of uh, um, all the environmental design, but connected with the structures and the urban scale. So very interesting. Also moving at different scales with very interesting connection between between the performance of buildings, the performance of cities, and then. <clears throat> We have uh, also from outside the school, you already met Gigo. Uh, for those of you that are not, uh, well, I mean, come on, Dean, maybe you need to introduce Gigo because you, you know, I feel like you introduced me to Gigo. So you should be the one who introduced oh, Gigo. Well, already. whatever. Uh, so, so Gigo is a director at GEL, uh, the San Francisco office of GEL. Um, he's a, an architect um, and he also has a PhD from the Escuela Tecnica Superior de Barcelona, um, and uh, I think did a lot of really interesting work when he was there, including work on uh, your dissertation was on sort of the American concepts of the American wilderness. Is that correct, Diego? Yeah. Um, yes, that is correct. Yeah, uh, 
and prior to joining Gell, he also uh, worked with a with a kind of provocative and maybe even revolutionary agency called Rebar um, out in San Francisco. Uh, that was together with with John Bella, right? Yes. Um, and uh, Gigo uh, has been very generous with his time um, in in teaching. Uh, co-teaching with me the Monterey studio about a year ago or so and um, also sort of engaging with our studio this semester as a um, you know on a review and, and, and giving a presentation about Gail's approach to public space. Then, then we have uh, two other reviewers from outside the school you also know Juan Luis de las Rivas because he spoke to the class uh, and uh, he's uh, urban, you know, he's a professor of, of urban design at the Escuela de Arquitectura of the University of Valladolid in Spain. He's, uh, he's uh, practicing his ideas and his teaching because he has uh, the practice side, but also the, the academic side. He has uh, authored some very important books. I think one that is called Intelligent Territories. I think Dean knows about it. It's a fantastic you know, book to tell the story of urban design in the 20th century that I think is the best that I know to telling that, yeah. that story. Seriously, Juan Luis, I know, let me tell you. And uh, uh, he, he also is unusually familiar with the Americas for compare, you know, we have two kind of cases here with Gigo and Juan Luis that are, you know, European urban designers that are very interested in the Americas, just from seeing the thesis the, that Diego focus on. The concept of wilderness in the Americas is also something that Juan Luis is very interested in. So it's good to have uh, both of them together. They're, you're going to be in the same group, so maybe you can, you know, you know reflect on it's those. Also, it's also part of the topic of my master's thesis on mm -hmm. the urban garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good. And it's, it's very important in the Americas. And, and we our last uh, outside reviewer, some of the students already heard because he joined us this morning, is Rene Davids, is a professor of architecture and urban design at the, uh, the Department of Architecture of this, uh, at Berkeley. So uh, at the University of Berkeley, he's uh, originally from Chile and he studied architecture there in Chile and, and a scholarship brought him to the to the to Britain, to, to London, and he studied there. I mean, in a way, I feel like we crossed paths because I studied in Europe and came to America, and then he studied in America and he went to Europe with one grant after finishing his studies. And then he stayed there. He taught for a while in, in, in Britain, and then he came back to the US. He has been at the University of Berkeley for, for a long time. I mean, in California at Berkeley for a long time. And he, he, uh, he has also a very successful practice he practices uh, uh, at the urban scale, but also at the architectural scale. Uh, some of his projects has been, have been uh, recognized with the national AIA awards. He's a fellow of the AIA as well. And he's, uh, he's an author as well. And I wanted to specifically mention for the rest of the reviewers, uh, a book that I enjoy very much because I was lucky enough to read the manuscript, Rene, I don't know if you know that, but that's what, I was one of the reviewers of the book when the, man, when the publisher sent it to me. And it was fantastic to read one of those uh, books before it's published and feeling like oh, this is going to be a great contribution to the field. The, the book is called Shaping Terrain. And I, the subtitle is American, uh, Latin American Cities. Is how, how, what is the subtitle, Rene? I forgot. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> You're muted, uh, Rene. I I forget the exact title myself. Shaping terrain is. Yeah, I love I love the title, <laughs> shaping terrain, and also it's very interesting when we talk about wilderness. And so this is a book that covers many Amer Latin American cities, but it's basically this awareness of how the the relationship with the natural environment is such an incredible driver in the way that the, the cities in the Americas have been shaped, and it's a very unique American. Uh, way of thinking about the cities that is not necessarily similar to the way that cities have developed in Europe. So it, it, it is a fascinating story of how these different cities have encountered this type of uh, relationship with the wondrous American uh, landscape and, and the forces of nature. So a very recommendable book for everybody. And we're very happy to have you, Rene, again for the second session. 
And uh, I think that Dean, if we if we are ready, I think that we can just go ahead and and uh, move on to the breakout rooms. So are you going to create a breakout room, and then we can uh, Renee, uh, Kevin, Charlton, and I can go into that breakout room with all the students that are going to be reviewing that uh, breakout room, and then you guys stay in the main session, uh, Dean, if you prefer. I'm going to do that, and I'm going to put let participants choose room. So yeah. those of you. Um, Let's see, Anahisa, Ryan, Brittany, Victoria, Will, Cassandra, Vicky, and Danae, I think you're all with me. So you will all stay here. Michael, Andre, Han, Bowen, Adam, and Nick, you go with Juan into breakout room one. Um, and then uh, Renee, Charlton, and Kevin, you go with Juan into breakout room one. Juan mm -hmm. Luis, yep. Sorry, could you? Uh, um... I don't have the option right now. It, I haven't uh, opened it yet. Oh, all right. I'm about to do it. Um, and I'm and I'm. The setting is let participants choose rooms, so okay. you guys can move yourselves to the breakout room. And those of you who've already gone uh, today, you have the option of going back and forth. Yeah. However, you choose to be kind of voyeurs. Um, that's up to you. So anyway, I just opened the, all that up. Um, and I'm going to say, Renee, you and Gigo must know each other since Gigo also teaches at Berkeley uh, in the falls. Yes. Yes. We have, we have met in, uh, in, in, many, in, in more than one reviews at Berkeley. Even okay. if I don't think we ever talked together, Renee. No. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I think I will remember. Okay. So, uh, Dean, I don't see anything in the breakout room. It's, it, I guess. It, it should be... They should be. I opened one breakout room. Yeah, I saw it for a second, but then it's not there anymore. I don't know if I did something or it says in progress. Are other are other people seeing breakout rooms? Yes, as I am. Yes, I can see it. So you should just be able to move yourself to a breakout room. Um, yeah, no, I, I for some reason I, I don't see, but there's only room one. That's right. So there's only that. That's the breakout room. So oh, there's okay. this main session, and then there's one breakout room. Yeah. The only thing is that uh, Dean, I don't see the the in the when I open the the breakout rooms, I, I yeah. see I, I see it blank. It, I saw I saw breakout room for a second, and then it disappeared. Huh? Because other people are starting to move into it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what it is, but. Well. I would just click on it again. Yeah, well, I, mean, I have the option of closing all rooms, which I don't want to do. Basically, it's, it's not showing anything. It's, it's showing breakout room in progress, it says. Well, do you see people in it? No, no. I, when, I, when I click breakout rooms, I see a blank, like blank image, and it says at the top, breakout rooms in progress. Oh. Yeah, I, you know I, what I'm going to do? I'm going to close it and then I'm going to reopen it again. Yeah, so, so, sorry if we, if, if technology has. Uh, that was fun while it lasted. The whole day has been a little bit like this. Um, hey, I started out being a, at your, um, your sneak preview, but I was the only one there. Oh, really? Well, Sorry, maybe we, we should have said something because we were we oh well you were the only one there because almost no, no actually one, a couple of students I think a couple of students were there too but yeah no I I I, I guess that Dean and I talk about that that you know we we send you a very lengthy email with the information about the studio and we say hey just that's all you you need to get started that's right yeah I, I figured that was probably the case well I'm trying to close the breakout room and open up a new one but I have no. It's, it's 11 seconds before the breakout rooms close, and I can't do anything about that. So in five, whatever, it'll close, and then I'll open it up again. Okay. So, and then, you know, Charlton, Kevin, you, you move to breakout room with me and Renee, okay? All right. I just opened it up again. Do you see okay. it, Juan? Uh, now I see it. Now it's good. So I'm going to join... See you guys. Good luck, everybody. We'll, we'll reconvene at the end. Okay. Nice knowing you. <laughs> One, record, record your session.
Okay, we are going to start with Anna Hissel, Ryan, Brittany, and Victoria. So, hi everyone. Um, we're going to talk to you about our Beggar Lane Sustainable Network. We are a group of four. Uh, with Ana Giselle Toscano Ramos, who is an MRC student, uh, Ryan and uh, Brittany, who are a dual degree program, uh, urban design and uh, planning. planning community, yeah, sorry. community and regional planning. Yeah, that's the one. And myself uh, as urban design uh, program. So we hope you enjoy your presentation. So before showing our, uh, you our project, we thought it was important to give some context of the area and to talk about the aspect that we thought were important in order to, uh, to develop our project and apply it on our, our development. So one of the most important aspects that we noticed was how uh, this landscape has like a, a whole bunch of uh, diver diverse things. Uh, as you can see on the left side of the Lake Decker Lane, uh, there's like the power plant and the uh, expo center while on the right there's like these orchids and several housing uh, development happening on the area while also having wildlife uh, in weird uh, locations uh, happening all over the place. As we were there we also uh, were able to identify that there's like a huge lack, lack of accessibility to the area where public transportation is not even available. So that was one of our main concerns. So as part of our design, we established four, more, four main core values that we want to implement through uh, the whole project, which are equity, accessibility, diversity, and resilience, which will have as a goal to integrate the community on the area, as well as improving their lifestyle, lifestyle by implementing a better sense of belonging to this East Austin area. So we will show you how our sustainable network develops at different scales and locations through all this uh, area. First, we develop this kind of like urban framework where we define all the potential areas that we thought uh, have like uh, that need that could provide uh, better access and connection to and from our community to other areas while also having as main driver this uh, resiliency aspect and adaptability towards agriculture and uh, neighborhood uh, growth. So after having this analysis uh, of the main things, uh, we identify four main areas that will work as anchor points for our network in, in a big scale. Uh, focusing on the two areas, uh, that on each side of the of the lake that we thought were more interesting and with more potential to create a strong connection of this area. We labeled the first one as the Decker Lane connector and the second one as the CSI neighborhood. Uh, the main drivers for these neighborhoods are going to be the relation between people and agriculture while also having developing a sustainable housing for the CSI while having prem pre-manufactured uh, homes and accessibility for the Decker Lane connector. Uh, for, all, for us, it was also uh, important to understand and know like the location of the agriculture conservation fields. So we can uh, start to develop a wildlife conservation network within our area that will preserve and give a better habitat for different species, uh, wildlife species coming to the area, uh, while also uh, relating uh, relating all of these with a uh, water catchment uh, and water flow and floodplain on the area. So uh, in a more closing, closer look, and um, since accessibility was lacking so much on the area, we established two main bus services that will run on two intervals, one being rapid transit with less frequent stops and the other a typical bus line with stops every a quarter of a mile. Uh, we also uh, keep the Metro Rapid um, Railroad that is being proposed to provide a better access to the community on this east area. And also develop a, a small scale cable car line that will connect the two sides of the, of the lake and our two neighborhoods, 
having one of the stops where the power plant is currently located and the, and the other two having, having them on the other side of the CSI where the main farm is and where the main commercial core of the area is. Uh, this structure will also help us for irrigation and water catchment purposes. Uh, so the car network is also important as well as the bike and pedestrian network uh, as part of our accessibility network. Uh, this will connect uh, within the different areas uh, while also considering all the uh, green and public areas that are uh, currently existing and that we are proposing to provide a different uh, transportation experience and a different sense of belonging to this area. So after all of these uh, analysis and con uh, accessibility uh, ideas, this is how our site plan will look with our green and sustainable network embedded on, these, on the area, uh, providing a strong connection with the three main develop developments that we are gonna uh, show you in more detail, while also providing accessibility to the, ar to the area at different scales with different uh, types of transportation. Uh, we also took into consideration all the existing green areas to develop some of the accessibility networks. So the first area that we're gonna get into detail is gonna be the Decker Lane connector. And the other two are gonna be within the CSI uh, neighborhood, having the coll collaborative uh, living neighborhood and the home ownership, sustainable home ownership neighborhoods within the CSI. Um, as part of our site plan, we developed some floodplain regulations, such as having some specific range of setbacks from the floodplain to the built area, uh, as well as having a riparian buffer working as pollinator for wildlife attraction, while also working uh, as a buffer between built and natural environment. Uh, we also provide some of the highway regulations uh, where there are a specific right of way that needs to be permeable as well as having an infiltration swale within the, uh, in the middle of the highway, both of them helping for irrigation and water catching purposes. And the riparian buffer uh, is gonna be extremely important also to provide a, some privacy for the, for the neighborhood as well as uh, having some noise control of the area. So the Decker Lane is a central quarter in the Decker Lake area. Decker Lane is a, already has a sizable concentration of residents and development along it. Um, additionally, there's, our, there's already a strong concentration of civic institutions and neighborhood assets, uh, park schools, and a sustainability nonprofit, the Center for Maximum Potential that we wanted to give advantage of. Along this uh, Decker Lane corridor and Greenway, the neighborhood is ripe for an effort to restitch and connect these auto-dependent islands of development that exist. By infilling opportune sites, we created amenity for both new and existing residents, uh, creating a complete community for both. In contrast to these disconnected islands of development, future development will maximize access to recreation, pedestrian and bike trails uh, by creating strips of program and parcelization patterns, alternating private development with public access. Decker Lane neighborhood will be centered on a high frequency bus stop um, and have an indoor outdoor food market with community event space and also have retail and live work micro retail opportunities. Depending on sun orientation, there are two prototypical linear block configurations. Both types have a balance of public, semi-public and private outdoor space, uh, quickly, quickly accessible from your front door. The block of either type has a live work mixed use street frontage uh, at the head of the block. Uh, and then with their, uh, behind that, there will be a series of compact single family homes, uh, which can vary between one and three stories. The neighborhood will be anchored by a multimodal boulevard, creating a transportation spine for all future development. This is made possible by the generous unused right of ways on the roads in this whole area of East Austin. So from here, we're gonna take a closer look at that CSA neighborhood. 
Um, and it's uh, located north of Decker Lake in an area that currently houses a 207 acre plot of land um, that's designated by the city of Austin as um, for agricultural uses only. And so we kind of wanted to build off of this and we propose creating a neighborhood that incorporates agriculture as a central component um, and also integrates nature and food production into the built environment. The name CSA or Community Supported Agriculture uh, refers to a program where residents can essentially opt in and have fresh fruits and vegetables delivered to them um, from that 207 acre farm. Surplus items that aren't distributed through the CSA program um, will be sold at local farmers markets. Um, and in addition, the neighborhood is going to include educational programs and facilities that will teach residents and visitors about agriculture and food production. So through this zoning map, we can see um, a variety of uses that exist within the CSA neighborhood. Uh, we have a higher intensity of uses located closest to the agricultural area, which will then um, fade to low density housing as you approach the highway, um, kind of on the, the right side. Um, per the highway regulations that Victoria described, the neighborhood would have um, a vegetated right of way that would also act as a buffer between the low density residential and the highway. A connection is also established between the commercial core and the highway via a mixed use corridor. Um, and going forward, we're gonna look at two specific areas of this CSA neighborhood in more detail. Um, and with these two focus areas in mind, the CSA neighborhood uh, will provide a variety of transportation opportunities. Pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure traverse the neighborhood and connects to hike and bike trails within Walter E. Long Park. Um, the newly constructed cable car would serve as the central spine of the CSA neighborhood and connect across the lake to Decker Lane. Um, meanwhile, bus services would run on um, those two intervals, the one being that rapid transit um, that would have less frequent stops, and then another being a typical bus line with stops about every quarter mile. And this variety of transit opportunities allows for connectivity between these two focus areas of the CSA neighborhood and other neighborhoods that surround Walter E. Long Lake. Um, so now we'll be zooming into a specific portion of the CSA neighborhood, the collaborative living community. So the collaborative living community is focused on strengthening the relationship between people and nature through cooperative agricultural opportunities. Uh, it would have community greenhouses dispersed throughout the neighborhood um, that are available for public use, along with a community center um, where some agriculture and culinary educational opportunities um, and programs would be held. Elements of biophilia also play a role in this collaborative living community where um, ample green space and water catchment zones would allow residents and visitors to engage with nature at a more intimate level. Alongside these sustainable initiatives, live workspaces and a variety of transit opportunities allows the community um, to reduce its reliance on vehicle transit as well. Um, so thinking more about kind of the street network in this collaborative living community, we would have collector streets and throughways that branch off from the adjacent highway and traverse the neighborhood. This scale provides um, space for vehicular movement um, while also emphasizing pedestrian and bicycle accessibility, connectivity, and safety. Meanwhile, green buffers and energy generation technology are also incorporated into the streetscape to support the overall sustainability strategy of the CSA neighborhood and integrate that connection to landscape into this scale as well. Um, alongside that, we have more of an intimate neighborhood street that acts as an arterial off of the major connectors and throughway streets. This scale maintains many of those same principles as the larger streets with that connection to sustainability and energy, promoting alternative modes of transportation, and again, reinforcing that relationship between people and the landscape. Okay, so now we're gonna switch gears and talk about the third and last neighborhood that we focused on, and we're calling it Sustainable Home Ownership Neighborhood. We know from the prompt of the studio that East Austin is projected to receive 500,000 new residents within the next 20 years. And as of right now, there is a clear economic segregation in the Eastern periphery as the poverty levels are noticeably higher in this side of the city. Meaning that there is a need for affordable housing to happen in this area for low and middle class families. But according to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development, any person or family that spends more than 30% of their income in just housing is experiencing housing insecurity. 
uh, because they're basically an accident or an, an unexpected expenditure away from missing their, pen, their rent pay and potentially becoming homeless. But the problem of affordable housing, at least for families that are looking for a permanent, permanent place to stay, is that they don't really like to say that they live in affordable housing because it sounds less dignifying. So we're proposing to change the name of, of it and call it sustainable home ownership. And to create that, the principles of good home ownership that we focused on are um, community by creating a sense of belonging having communal spaces and allowing for people to take ownership of their space. Flexibility by allowing for future growth through the use of auto construction and providing flexible spaces within the units. Resiliency by using durable materials and providing spaces where food production can happen. Uh, quality by developing prefabricated units to reduce the time and cost of construction by, and by using local materials, designing for easy maintenance and providing a wide range of public and private spaces. For safety, by providing enough lighting and walkway connections for pedestrians, as well as 88 access for all residents. And lastly, uh, dignity, arguably the most important one, to provide a space that people are happy and proud to call their home. As part of our precedent studies, we were looking at the Elemental Design Group and decided to explore the idea of having a permanent core and a flexible reserve space for future expansion within each housing unit. The, that way, fam families can finalize their homes at their own pace, giving the neighborhoods the ability to age in place. So uh, this, sh this slide shows the housing scheme with a minimum capacity. And then this shows what would it look like with the medium capacity and furthermore uh, with the maximum capacity as you can imagine how families would grow within time. So as mentioned before, the idea is to use prefabricated units that are either 12 by 12 feet or 12 by 18 feet and that serve a wide range of purposes. The prefabricated modules can then be thought out as Lego pieces that can be arranged differently while creating different housing typologies. At the scale of the block, then we um, did, sorry, at the scale of the block, then the housing units were used to explore different configurations of spaces, each having uh, park spaces, pri private patios, communal gardens, and parking spaces. This is the rectangular block with a main central space that acts as a courtyard. The linear block acts as a, acts as a series of fingers that expands from a central axis and has a higher density. The square block has smaller courtyards and starts to become less dense than the other two. The curved block was developed to take advantage of places with more extreme topography and it's the least dense of all the configurations. So having that in mind, then uh, we decided to create a pilot sustainable home ownership neighborhood within our CSI area. This is the overall plan of the neighborhood. Uh, the gray represents the housing units. The red is for micro retail spaces for local businesses. The purple represents larger commercial spaces and the light blue shows the location of greenhouses for food production. As you can see, the neighborhood features a direct relationship with the nearby agricultural fields, which is why the public and cultural civic spaces share the same age, edge of the neighborhood. Uh, this is an up close view of the rectangle style block with the central um, courtyard. And then this shows the curved style block in a place where the neighborhood is close to the green buffers and the water connectors or the water catchment uh, that is created by the topography. This shows the linear style block featuring a more intricate and variation of the intimate spaces within housing units. And it also shows some, how some of the greenhouses can be integrated with that. To, to the right, um, there's also, we're also showing grow houses that begin to follow the topography and are, cons are concerned with taking advantage of the views toward the landscape. Uh, this is an axonometric drawing that should give you an idea of the height of the buildings and the quality of the space 
is also showing our line of cable cars going and crossing through the neighborhood. This is the view from the rectangle style block and it's showing the housing units with the empty flexible spaces that would eventually be inhabited. Uh, this is a view from the main road and it shows the micro retail buildings and kind of how like the more civic space happens. Then this is a view within the linear style block, uh, which has a taller housing units and therefore it's also more dense. And lastly, uh, this is a view from one of the green public spaces uh, where there's a pavilion that could be used for farmers markets or any other kind of activities, outdoor activities. And that is it for us, thank you very much. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask a question really quickly. Could you zoom out and for the reviewers who are not from Austin, give us an overview of the location in relation to the city center of Austin? Um, yeah, while Victoria goes up, I guess I can um, talk a little bit. So it's um, in a place called like the Eastern Periphery or it's on um, like the east side of Austin, I think it's like two miles or something from downtown. So it's like right on the edge where they're experiencing a lot of development um, and they're anticipating a lot of growth in this area from people who continue to move into Austin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where Victoria kind of has her mouse is like near downtown. And so we're focusing on um, kind of that, that portion that's right on the cusp of like, it's not really in like the central core of downtown Austin, but like there is still some development that's happening there. Okay, my second question, in relation to your development, where is the nearest hospital? It's going to be downtown. Yeah, there are no hospitals in kind of the whole eastern archipelago based on my mapping. Okay, so I want you to imagine for a moment, um, you talk about sustainability and resilience. And whenever we think about these issues, we're thinking about first and foremost, the, the most vulnerable. So imagine you're an 80 year old woman, you cannot drive anymore because you can't see, you've lost your driver's license you need to get to the hospital, how does she get there? Or even to the grocery store, how does she get there? How long will it take her? Does she have to walk to one of these bus stops? And how far from her home is that bus stop? So the idea is like the uh, bus stops are in a, a five, a five minute walk radius. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty accessible for everyone. So that's kind of like the idea of the, like where the bus stops are located on our like area and kind of like, because they like the current bus uh, lane gets just until this, up to this area, I think, but there's no bus lanes in any of this area over here. So that's kind of like idea of implementing and expanding a little bit more the bus lanes into the, all these, all of this area. And how actually, often would it actually, come? Actually, Juliana, sorry, now that I think mm -hmm. about it, probably the closest for all of that is over here where Maynard is, mm -hmm. um, which is this street that goes to Maynard. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking that's, that's going to be a lot closer than central Austin. Okay. But uh, one question related with this. This is an existing are related with an existing metro rapid bus or bus lines or are new all of the, all of the ones that are happening around the uh, the lake those are proposed by us because there there's uh, right now there's none of them but, but in, in 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 austin you have metro rapid bus and has bus lines different yeah different system. Right. and there is a proposed and the cable car what is the cable car there's a proposed urban rail line uh -huh. that the voters have already approved that's going mm -hmm. to go right there. Well, actually, yeah, they've already drawn it. But it's mm -hmm. new also. 
it's not the the rails are there but the the it it hasn't been built yet mm -hmm. we added stops as well and um some of the lines that are proposed we extended them so you have that rail line my question is why you didn't build up high density around that what was i know that it's a provocative um assignment you have but have you, is it just an issue of critical thinking here? Or I'm just trying to grapple with why you don't have far higher density along where there's that proposed rail. I think it's because we were focusing on different skills, each of us, and we, we had a certain interest that we wanted to tackle. And so I guess we didn't get to that specific areas then. I, I'll, I'll, I'm going to defend them for one second and say, because it's in the wrong place, um, there's a lot of topography right here that is actually not buildable. Um, that being said, there's probably a moment here and there's definitely a moment here. And this already has a neighborhood. All these other stops actually, guys, well, maybe that one. Um, you can't really build around it. Um, because of mm. floods, escarpments, all kinds of other sorts of things. Yes, uh, it's very, very clear this weekend. Uh, in, I remember Austin, no, and in general, these kind of sprawled cities, no, and the public transportation is very, very, very um, expensive to develop and to maintain, no, and I believe. Uh, they are the will of create accessibility, connectivity, but uh, you must select the better system, no combine R, uh, and don't com com create competition between uh, uh, similar uh, massive transport uh, systems, no? because uh, the, this, the, 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 the key of, to introduce public transport is the, the use of tra public transport, not no the will. And with this low density, is not in, including the, the Decker Lane, no? the, but perhaps the Decker Lane is the space where the public transport uh, runs better. No? But uh, uh, I don't understand this competition and the, this contradiction in, the, in just a position of, of, of different systems, no? Because it's very complicated to, to develop it. No? Because public transportation network belongs to this, a similar company, different company in competition. I don't know. I don't understand well what happened. But uh, another question, what means radical housing? In, so in this, the... so this radical, well, it's radical housing is because it's supposed to be like the high density uh, development happening on this area, which is not real, really a uh, like high density, but it's like the high density of the uh, area. Uh, and radical because radical, what is radical? It's radical because are outside the law, they are it's because it's the, the higher density area like only, only it's a question of density when yeah, yeah radical in the sense of density no in the sense of the people who are living there no 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 okay uh, the, i don't know i'll me the order with you but uh, well uh, first uh, excuse me for the distance between my thinking and my, my knowledge about your work and, and my approach today. No? Excuse me, please. Uh, all my comments must be relative, relativized, no? No? because I don't know in a deep way your background. Do you understand me? No? Uh, I, I, am, I am speaking about the result, but I 
cannot speak about the process. I read the papers, but um, uh, I, I, I don't know well your references and etc. 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 No, yeah. and for this, all my comments must be uh, suspended a little. Well, it's clear for, for you eh? and for the, the team, for the four people, suspend a little my comments. Well, I don't understand the geometry of the project, the basic geometry of the project, because you have a, a natural network and then you have uh, in the natural network is very relevant. In one moment, per, please, uh, in, in one moment, appears all the little creeks and uh, pass. Uh, in one moment, all, all the little creeks also know the big, uh, the big water, uh, uh, water uh, corridors, but all, all the little, the little courses of waters, no? Relate with the agricultural lands, yes, no? You have, and, and you need uh, to create a real connectivity, you say, no? But I don't, I cannot to, to understand well this connectivity. In my opinion, you develop uh, four projects, very different projects, no? And the connection could be natural, well, no could be another kind of network, is the public transport. But the public transport, when you decide the, the, the stops and the systems, there are a contradiction in between the stops and the spaces because the stop must go to a designed space where I can uh, reside this stop in an affordable space, in a public space, in a relevant space. No, and uh, in a, um, I don't understand well if the public transport is the basic geometry. No, and uh, uh, in in this sense, I don't understand this this global geometry. Pass, please, uh, to the next natural system, please. You have this uh, this other system, but the geometry of this system. To me, it's not clear where we have the old, where we have the new, where, where, and pass please to the next, the, the next image. The, the next image, please. The next, and you, you create another con connection, it's a bike, but these connections seems to be related with nature, no con connectivity, no with connectivity between different spaces, no? And when arrive your uh, places, your development, your, your neighborhoods, no? For neighborhoods, please advance. In this case, it's clear, more clear the, the geometry, but the relationship with the, 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 the image of the new is not uh, the, 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 the new built environment. I, is, 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 is hidden, I don't know where. And please go, go ahead. And you have these Photoshop images with a problem of scale also in the section of the street because the building has several uh, levels but the, the people are in different scale. And this, this is good for explaining the, the flood problematic, the normative, etc. but no, for explaining the habitat, no? And for this, to me, is, is problematic, in my point of view. The general geometry, the general of, of the project, because the ideas behind the, the two, the projects are interesting. You are trying to, the, the, the sustainable uh, home ownership neighborhood, the, I don't know if these are, names made by you or names, official names. The, the, the collaborative living community is an official name or is your, your trade, your, your idea? 
No, yeah, that was our idea. That was from us. Your idea. Well, but looking for um, affordable houses and, and this existing minimum for people, poor people, with these ideas of Casa Crecedera, you remember this Chile, uh, this prize, Prisker Prize from Chile, this architect, no? who explained explain the, the house, who the, this, the house has the possibility of growth, but this is a very, very, very old idea. You have the Abraken theory of the support, so you have the, the John Turner idea of how to create houses for people people with this idea of great spaces, spaces that change in the time. No? Well, and these three neighborhoods, the uh, community supported agriculture, collaborative living community, and uh, sustainable home, to me is, is interesting, is interesting. The Decker Lane connector is more, more. Um, but in my opinion, in my opinion, and in the context of the, the pandemic, you know, in, in our context, we are understanding uh, another relations founded in mobility. A new mobility is less mobility. Working is work at home. And also housing, housing more, housing more with more space, more hybrid housing with more possibilities of uh, the, the housing with the workshop, the housing with the studio, the houses with the greenhouse, the housing uh, with the, the house with the orchard, the house with the little consultancy for a medicine or, 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 or little, little uh, co-working space for several people. No, this, this uh, 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 kind of typologies when you develop your typologies, are, are very rigid. Also, the blocks are very rigid. But you have, in my opinion, re the, ref the, the reflection is good because you define different situations. And this is an opportunity to a deeper uh, understanding of what can happen in the future with, with a house with homes, no? individual homes or, or collective homes, no? not only blocks. No? This is only a reflection because in my opinion, you, you, the group developed an interesting idea of different kinds of neighborhoods to me, is very clear. No? And uh, uh, only the last question is public spaces, no? because we have the green space, the green. In the, in the, in the last image, you, you present several umbrellas in the, in the green, no? this kind of uh, uh, spaces. No? Well, uh, it's interesting, no? it's interesting to create, but uh, 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 in, is the, in the last, in the last, but uh, look, look, the, the, uh, well, excuse me, this <laughs> idea of public space, no, it could be, but you need to understand that the, the public space is created in the relationship between architecture and space. It's not an empty space that needs a singular design. If you go back, to the blocks or to the, the general the plan in this, when you say where we have the main square, we have the, the main street. And the main square could be this space open to the agriculture. Could be. If you have these cabins, these cabins, where are the position of the space where we go up and we, we go down? No? We, where we have the more uh, relevant facilities, the more relevant public uh, uh, buildings, no? uh, not only commercial or not only uh, uh, collective housing. No? It's, it's, not, it's, it's like a monopoly decision. No? This, this little box, this uh, big box, no? this is the green box. You, you know the, the play the, the, the monopoly uh, play is a is a table uh, uh, 
uh, play in, in is is very similar. It, I don't know, Kevin, you need to help me, no? but, but uh, uh, I don't understand the identity of every, every neighborhood, understanding this idea of you, of you sense of place. Sense of place is create common places, not only gardens. And this is mm, in, a clearly, in a clear way. And this geometry, this link between nature and public and transport, and this linkage between different systems could uh, develop another geometry, more complex, more uh, relate with the habitat today and the habitat tomorrow. Do you understand me? In this, in several sense, this is a little uh, old development. But look at me, I don't have references. When I explain the, the idea of support, this is the, the home ownership, no? sustainable home ownership development, no? Or no? This, this, and in, yeah. this is the, the, the fourth, yes, no? Yes, no? Well, mm -hmm. here, uh, this idea of the house, that the flexible house that have possibilities to change is not very, very evident. You understand? Because we need more space for change. Our very um, real this, estate development, no? You, you sorry, understand? I just to you, say you, that this, you want this really time. to adapt. See, you really want to adapt in the space, we need the space for this adaptation, no? No, a little, only in the, in the, in the middle of the house. But well, is is always our uh, opinion. I don't know. I, I am open your, of your comments on your, the discussion. No? Yeah, I just wanted to say that this plan shows the, the whole maximum capacity. And that's why you're reacting to that way that it doesn't seem like you can build more to it because it's showing all of it. Um, I, I originally wanted to do two plants where you could show like the minimum capacity and then how it would grow within time. But yeah, that's what you're seeing right now. Ego, you wanna? Yes, thank you, Dean. Um, I wanna build on uh, uh, what has been said so far and um, add a little bit of uh, uh, kind of articulate what uh, what has been already the comment here. I, I want to really start from what I like about, about your work. And there's actually quite a bit of things. Um, there are several things that I like and there is important things that I like about your about your project. I think that what you do best is to really understand what a master plan is about. Uh, because, you know, we look at master plans that are already designed, completed, maybe implemented, and we see just the final product and we uh, admire them if they are good projects but it's often difficult to understand how they were created, how they were developed. Um, well, master plans, good master plans are created and developed through a very long process that make, um, that create something um, rigorous and, and well-crafted out of a lot of complexity. In order to create something that is rigorous and well crafted out of a lot of complexity and a lot of variables, a good master plan follows a certain process. And uh, uh, often a good master plan would start by identifying what are the values behind the master plans, understand the characteristics of the site, uh, then probably attack, quote unquote, the site, tackle the site by focusing on a series of sub areas, uh, providing identity and form to each of those areas, and then 
continues to progress by giving more resolution to each sub area all the way to the scale of the block typology, the building typology, and eventually the unit typology. So of all projects that I've seen so far, I think that your project is actually the best at laying out this succession of steps. And this is really the strength of your project, right? You, you, you have a good understanding of how you go from this very lofty and vague ideals to something much more concrete. Um, and that's admirable. And I really wanna commend you for that. And I wanna say, don't lose that awareness of what the steps are. What I think your project is still, um, how to say, uh, not, um, uh, nevertheless, I think that if you look at the content of, of uh, some of the steps uh, along this process, there is something to be desired yet with the level of resolutions uh, and, with the, and with some of the solutions that you picked. Okay, and so that is what I think it's a little, a little less strong, and and wanna, what I want to point out, which I think is what, what 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 of of, of a lot of the commentary that you received already is uh, is uh, is really about. So, for example, if you look at this image that we have on the screen, especially when you get to these smaller scales, you talk about all the right things: public space system, the relationship with the natural system. Um, housing typology, but still um, those elements are uh, used for your uh, design, but not yet get to that level of resolution we would want. Um, I see, for example, that very often the way in which you lay uh, buildings on the lot is very sparse. Um, it's suburban in the worst sense of the term, if you will, you know, um, is um, often overly geometric, you know, and a modern movement had, um, has been in part responsible of, 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 of uh, making us the urbanist having this tendency of following geometric rules in the way in which lay out, we lay out uh, buildings on, on, on the landscape that are not informed by actual um, human scale, scale qualities or actual principles in the way in which shared spaces, public spaces really function well when it comes to dimension, scale, orientation, and so forth. So it's almost like you have a very, very good recipe. You have all the right ingredients, but you're still finding your ways to know how you have to use those ingredients. And so this is, I think, is the next step for you. Um, use the same recipe, use the same ingredients, but become very, very good at understanding what to do with these ingredients. So I don't know which among these blocks that I see here on this scene really would work. There is this kind of, um, uh, block here, which has the central space. That central space seems like so vast and somewhat, um, you know, uh, too big. Uh, it's not really compressing the space sufficiently. I find this repetition of, of, of homes here a little repetitive. Also this space here, which is obviously a, spa a shared space, is completely disconnected from this. Right, which is completely disconnected from this, which is completely disconnected from this. So I see a collection of public space, but I don't see a public space system that is made of parts, some big, some small, some natural, some, some more uh, built out, they're connecting with each other. I would want to see you know, something that starts to you know, connect and uh, weave in all of these spaces, right? Um, a little bit more. And this is just an example of how 
you're working with the right things, right? You're working with the natural system, you're working with the public space system, you're working with the block typologies, with building typologies, but you still are learning your way to make those things function. I think you're also looking a little bit too much to the modern movement, which is you know, um, difficult to underestimate in terms of its value, but at the same time, it may be misleading you. I would like you to look more at how historic city works. Mm -hmm. um, what are the scales of plazas in historic city? What are the size of buildings? Um, the fact that you're working with low density doesn't mean that you have to have sparse development, sprawling development. I think this is a lot of what you heard in the comments already. You can create microclimates of density because we cherish density as a way of living. Mm -hmm. We want to live in places where we see our neighbors and what is doing in the morning. Otherwise, we, you know, we, 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 we lose the kind of connection with one another. So I would prefer you to kind of focus more on fleshing out this fine tuning of the right densities, even if the overall density is low and focus on how to use those ingredients because you got the right recipe and the right ingredients. So you are um, on a good, on a, on, you know, you are in a good place in terms of getting there. And once you will be able to also know how to go about these ingredients and mix them together then you you know then you you will be in a position which you're kind of mastering the master planning practice which is one of the hardest thing that we architects may be asked to do so i want you to kind of really take this last push because it's very necessary guys i gotta move us on um are we taking way too long dean yeah we we kind of are Okay, um, <laughs> give us, give us time box, you know, you should time box as, as you need. Okay. Please do. Um, I'm going to move us on to um, Will and Cassandra. And I, Thank I think, you, everyone. I think to set up Will and Cassandra, um, Dave also were working um, within the context of a larger master plan that Sunket had done. Um, he was the first person to, I believe, uh, present this morning. Um, so I think hopefully you guys will show a little bit of that in order to kind of contextualize your project. Um, we don't actually have any of Sonket's imagery in our slideshow, uh, but we will be able to describe uh, relative to the uh, rail line where it is. I'm going to I apologize that it's dark in here. I can't get the. Uh, oh, it's okay. Lights to work. You won't see oh, me no. anywhere. <laughs> That's okay. We don't care what you look like. I know anyway. you won't see <laughs> the slides. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just um, while I'm setting this uh, for just some background on myself, um, my name is Will Van Dusen. I am in my second semester in the M Arc One program. And I graduated uh, in undergraduate um, studies from Texas A&M um, with a background in architecture and product design. My name is Cassandra. I am a fourth year architecture student. Um, so first advanced studio. So excited to present and see how my first urban planning project went. So um, we, our project is called the Pink Line, and when we first approached, when we were first approached with the Eastern Crescent site, we wanted to address how the entirety of the Austin region related to the outer city limits. So next. Um, we found that the majority of the city had already been significantly um, developed and historically encouraged green linkage. So when considering the prospective population gro growth of 500 million people, um, they, the city of Austin really wanted to encourage economic equity um, by developing along the eastern city limits right here. You can see the hatched region on Manor the Manor Block and Weberville. Um, and we can see how Austin starts to evaluate um, 
how they desire to develop this and create an essence of Austin within this Eastern region. Next. So here we see how the main highways are formed with the hazardous waste routes that solidifies the disconnect of the Eastern Crescent. They don't really see um, that part of the city. So they actually require that um, trucks go along this area, um, along um, 180. Next. Here we see the proposal. Oh, sorry. Here we see the city zoning in relationship with the denser roads that show the density of Austin and the city capital. Next. And um, the Austin urban trails that are designed to along floodplains that begin to somewhat connect the eastern part of Austin a bit more. Next. And here we start to see how the Austin metro system approvals and proposals um, show the connectivity, con connectivity of Austin vertically, but don't really expand horizontally. Next. Um, and we can more visibly see how that disconnects extends farther than just accessibility to transportation, but also fresh food. So people who live in areas with gross, um, with fewer grocery stores are more uh, prone to go hungry and have di dietary related disease. Um, so we wanted to denote possibility of ag agrarian preservation to increase local food production and consumption. Um, and lastly, noting that Texas, lastly, noting and encouraging markets in this area so that the Eastern Crescent is less prone to diseases. Next. So in order to address this issue, we wanted to encourage and propose a pink line within the um, Austin Metro system that creates a circularity of Austin that we can start to see um, has more creates this Eastern Crescent to have more relevance to the city center of Austin. And this also connects the, um, the Samsung area up north and um, Tesla down south and the airport. So um, the really several of the driving forces of how we developed uh, this uh, transit line uh, involved uh, a few key factors. Uh, one were several of these landmarks, which are in the Eastern periphery, which we anticipate to see a large amount of traffic as the area grows. Uh, these mainly include the airport, and in this area is the lake that we discussed in several projects, the Walter Long Park. Uh, this is a, a, a public space that is, we anticipate to be developed in the coming decades for uh, many public uses um, with many people traveling from downtown to use it, as well as the community of Manor, um, which is just north of our site and this uh, sort of tech corridor as well. Uh, Tesla is building a new plant here. So if we could somehow devise a transit plan, which upgrades from uh, the current system of uh, passenger rails, which uh, don't currently exist, but are subtly planned in sort of a linear uh, way, we wanted to uh, get to all these places. So in the image on the right, you see the pink line wrapping from the airport to Decker Lane, to Manor, past the lake, all the way to this tech corridor at uh, the north of town, which is gonna sort of create a robust transit system of train around uh, Austin connecting downtown to these uh, landmarks of industry and tech and the Eastern periphery. Um, and in addition to that, uh, we had developed uh, the line in this way, and it was a no brainer for us to select where along this line to develop our community, which was where these two purple uh, Metro rapid bus lines are gonna intersect it. So this is the location of our project due to the factors, uh, what Cassandra just showed of the agriculture and uh, the necessity for transit. This is where uh, we're gonna be putting the focus of our work. And in this image, this is just sort of a, an early diagram uh, describing 
how in this sort of um, area between FM 973, which is the road that we have uh, selected to put the pink line along and how it creates sort of a, a location next to uh, SH-130, which is um, a toll road that uh, is for very rapid uh, vehicular travel from north to south. Uh, we found these spaces within the floodplain, which were potential areas of development. We ultimately chose uh, this sort of spot here because of its proximity to the bus lines and the community that continues this way is more to be bent. So this was gonna be sort of a hub for us with these factors of what transit uh, is going to do for the development as well as um, the agriculture sort of community that we've created. I think it's loading. Okay. Mm, so, I think we skipped a slide, did we? Let me go back to you. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So here we can start to see how um, that pink line starts to form. We wanted to encourage the green line and blue line already established um, and then extend the pink line further up north to connect to the center of Austin. So here we see um, proposed stops that are within a mile to a mile and a half. Um, we can see that they're not really significant. There's nothing really stopping people from coming here. And the roads that are developed are one or two to mainly two lanes, but two to four lanes that doesn't really accommodate the people there. Um, so on the center, we can see how that those stops, those two main stops um, in the center of the page, um, I wanted to see how that can start to take form to become a, um, economic and community hub for the people of the Eastern Crescent that have already been established and along with future developments. Next. So our vision is to encourage sustainability, accessibility, and community. Next. And we wanted to do this by using a variety of different tactics. Um, such as uh, preservation, public transportation, encouraging the already established um, Austin urban trails, ecolo ecological engineering with swales, um, encouraging permaculture by respecting the already established um, site, um, a, food, a food forest, local food distribution and parks and recreation. Accessibility through connective refinement, um, walkability, mixed use, uh, for food forests. Um, I mean, sorry, not food forests, fresh food, tech hub accessibility, commuter rail station, bikeability, and uh, public transit as well. And lastly, for community. Um, we we encouraged um, different types of densities, water consideration, shopping, medical facilities, education, farmer equity, employment, and public spaces. So seeing how that starts to take form um, adjacent to the commuter rail, which is in pink, um, to the right, we see the agriculture that would just be distributed for um, the local community and markets, um, as well as um, a more marketable agriculture for local communities or for the local market. That's more of an experiential space. Um, to the left of this um, strip of building typologies that we see, um, we we project that this area would be developed with um, proposed uh, housing. So for the light blue, we, we propose that that would be housing and the red would be um, commercial. So if you look along that strip, we can start to see that this is um, a larger type of uh, building or block typology. 
Um, so what we wanted to encourage is these longer blocks that really um, had more of a sense of direction along the line. So it encourages people to walk along the commuter rail uh, that is mainly commercial space with also mixed uses of um, apartments for denser um, housing typologies. And then uh, next, we can see how the, those um, start to be more established. So right here on the bottom, you can see those icons taking form. So on the bottom um, corner of the station where the pink is, we can see the, the station with the public transit, transit and public spaces with right next to it, um, density of with hotels, shopping and job opportunities. And then right next to it, there's a conglomeration of four blocks that's just purely shopping um, that also provides for jobs. And then right next to that is mixed housing with um, our mixed residential um, and commercial spaces with water shed consideration. And then right next to that is a grocery store with um, a farmer equity possibilities with markets and jobs as well. And then um, farther up north is education and then um, a park. And then lastly, a medical facility with another station with that connects with the Austin Urban Trail and public space. So if we look on top of that protruded um, area, we can start to see what areas are drivable and what areas are walkable. So um, through the center, most of this is walkable, but with, with the dashed black lines, those are drivable that has more accessibility to the station. And um, the station hospitality, um, the grocery store, and also the medical facility, uh, while most of it does remain, although most of it does remain um, just walking space. So um, following this, Will is going to present the station and how that starts to take form. And we're going to start by looking at a, a short section right through the middle of the station, then we'll be able to describe how this um, area here is going to work as uh, sort of a a market, um, which is going to be sort of the bridge between this agrarian um, space next to the community into the sort of um, hub of transportation. Oh, this um, yeah, so this is a, a la um, seven layers of a food forest that we start to see um, that would be more of a marketable um, space. So this would be for local, it, this is basically like a local attraction for um, farmers. People can come and pick their own strawberries, fruits, um, lettuce, things like that, but it is maintained by local farmers. So you kind of, you get rid of the transportation and selling to a big uh, market and you get to decide or be, you have more access to Sorry, you have more freedom to decide your prices. Next. I'm trying to change the slide. You guys got to pick up your speed a little bit. We're almost finished. I think this is frozen. Okay. So as we look at this drawing, this is a, a section through the station. You can see that the pink line is elevated uh, above the ground plane. And there's also um, an underground parking area. And on both of these um, planes, this acts as a, a plaza and a market for the sort of trade of goods like in these images, as well as next to it is uh, this public space serving the flow of transit and all of the 
people in the community and those in Austin needing to move around the periphery, uh, as well as on the uh, right side is where the bus station can operate uh, for the exchange of the Metro rapid travel, uh, followed by uh, lanes of vehicle traffic and the um, sort of uh, field of crops uh, immediately neighboring the station. And we'll look at the sort of imagery of how this elevated station operates simultaneously to the plaza beneath it and the bus station neighboring, um, the sort of market plaza under the canopy extending out into a plaza in this uh, sort of area of the uh, community nearest the intersection. And we'll look at uh, the other side, looking at the bus station, showing you sort of this access into the station on the first level, opposite of the market, uh, showing you sort of the glimpse into that. Oh no. As well as the front of the station with um, sort of showing you from a point of view of someone at the market uh, before they enter the station, you see the train elevated. Uh, just outside the canopy of shade, as well as under the station showing access to the ground level where a portion of the parking is located as well as uh, the an extension of the market. Thank you. So am I right to say you are not you are not proposing um, single family housing? along this line, is that right? Yes. Okay, so very contrasted to the previous group and your market and your railway are along the same line. You know, I, I think that's what I meant to say for the previous group and what I see more happening in this group is, you know, architects used to design for posterity. It was not about us right now, it was for also future generations beyond our time. And this changed a little bit in the 60s where we became a lot more current time focused and money focused and selfish in a way in our development. But this I see has a lot of potential for thinking about utilizing every bit of parcel of land in a more responsible way. Of course, we can sprawl out legally, but do we really have that right morally when looking at future generations and the climate crisis? Um, there's been a kind of conflict I know in your studio between what is the European city and the American city. Those were not always so different. You know, my grandmother who grew up in Kansas City, which now is one of the most sprawled cities, highest highway mileage per capita of any city in the country. Um, it used to be very dense when she was a little girl and she could hop on a tram and go get milk and eggs for her mother. And we used to have a lot more in common with European cities. When I think about Oviedo in Northern Spain, you know, they have eight story apartment buildings. And yes, you talk about home ownership, they own those apartments and they're nice apartments, but they don't need a second living room or, you know, they're not looking to build on huger spaces because their living room is their town, you know, their walk to the butcher or to the pharmacy or they're meeting each other. So that social component is met as well. And that's very important for sustainability. I see a lot of potential for those ways of life in this project far more than the other one. So in addition to your beautiful renderings, I have to commend you for that. I think it's it's really thinking more into the future because once you do low density, you're locking in yourselves to that. And will that building be there 30 years, 50 years? If it's a single family house, you know, right now I'm working on a project looking into 2100. A lot of these single family homes will just be torn down and something denser in their place. And wouldn't it be nicer to just plan for the future in the long term? So I think this project handles that very well. I, I very much agree with everything Juliana said, and um, I'm gonna to try to keep my comments short, but I wanna I wanna really build on that. Um, there's something that you're getting 
right? I think about the kind of density that you're proposing here. And just because you're making, you know, space in between buildings a little smaller and, and, and you know, units uh, of, a, of buildings a little higher uh, or just denser, um, you're actually going toward that human scale. That is the scale of human connection that Juliana was talking about when she was talking about Oviedo, right? And so just by virtue of making things a little smaller, a little bit more compressed, a little bit closer with one another, uh, you are not only using land in a more sustainable and, resp and responsible way, but you're also creating a spatial framework that is gonna encourage those social connections. Um, I think there's still a little bit to go in terms of making those public space system even more connected, even tighter, even more um, really a system that connects destinations, that generate very um, inhabitable spaces, but you are um, really on the, on the right track. I wanna finish with one comment. Uh, I really like the work that you've done in, on mobility. And you know that's also what is behind your project with the idea of the pink line. I really like that. I think it's a very strong idea. Um, I like how you tied mobility to density. Um, still, I think that you are delivering on, on a project that is uh, in line with the, the premises of the studio. You're not doing something just urban, the classic sense of the term. You are finding ways to connect with the, with the natural environment. You are creating an alternative to kind of a more traditional, dense urban development. On the mobility though, I think that your beautiful renderings about this state, these multimodal stations speak of a kind of a mobility that to me is a little bit too, um, how to say, the, the level of infrastructure is a little bit too intensive is you know a lot of um, different levels and escalators it takes you up and down a lot of massive muscular pieces of infrastructure that's how we did mobility infrastructure in the 50s and the 60s in the us before we stopped investing on public transit altogether um, i think that your urbanism may work better with a softer uh, system of mobility infrastructure. I love to see some of those trains, you know, kind of getting a street level. Um, some of those buses not needing those massive barriers because that would make the uh, entirety of your project even more walkable, even more, na you know, um, easy to navigate. Going back to that person that is trying to go to the hospital, right, and cannot drive. Um, there's no need to uh, make that mobility infrastructure so infrastructurally heavy. It can be lighter, softer, weave, woven into the urban fabric. Other than that, um, I recommend you for your work. This is a great project. Thank you. Well, um, um, good. The, the approach to the context is very really clear. And I, I understand better what are you doing. Uh, to me, is is your first the first part of the presentation is very really clear to me. This idea of pink line, uh, perhaps I agree with with Diego. It could be an obsessive, obsessive, no, uh, because. We are in the city limits, in the city limits. You explain, no? We are in the edge of the city, very close to the agricultural land. And uh, you are speaking about farmers and markets of farmers and, and this kind of um, food forest, no? And this is very interesting also. But uh, when you decide this, my question is, what Im images you have in your mind? Because uh, the solution is very clear. It's a linear city, a linear neighborhood, because it's not a city. But the culture of the linear city uh, is very particular. 
You have, for example, the classical linear city, but you have in Copenhagen a neighborhood, new or stuck, made like this. Just is a, the metro, the, the, the metropolitan elevated and a line density and behind nature and agriculture. Uh, well, uh, the decision is the, the suitability of this project in Austin. You, you understand me? Is, is the, the question. Um, it's a good decision. I agree with the comments. The next, the next week, I, I go to Oviedo to, to make a presentation in the, uh, uh, the, the College of, uh, our College of Architecture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I like Oviedo, but our cities are very different, very, very, very different. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, how to help uh, to review your decisions? You are speaking in, in a very abstract, uh, it's a question. I agree also with uh, you when explain the, the logic of the master plan, no? because man, this is clear, no? but, but when you say the, 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 the main argument is sustainability, accessibility, and community. But accessibility is abstract. Mobility is concrete. Infrastructure is concrete. Accessibility is a quality of spaces. No? But we are creating the infrastructure. This is the suitable infrastructure we need. Uh, you identify sustainability with open spaces, but sustainability is also a question of built environment. Uh, is the, the sustainability is a question of how to do houses, how to build today. Sustainability is not a question of open spaces. It's not only green infrastructure. Sustainability is a question uh, about all the city. And you are speaking about community, but what it means community? This is only one community, two communities, this is a neighborhood unit. One question for everybody. In planning to me, I need the scale in the plans, scale and several numbers, scale and several numbers, little numbers. The density is this, the area has mm -hmm. uh, the, the other group, uh, and also the scale in the plan. This is one, uh, uh, one, one mile, a half a mile, uh, the, the dimensions of the, the things, no? Is, is for understanding better what kind of neighborhood we are developing. Is a neighborhood, is a district, is, is what kind, how many people are there, no? Uh, well, uh, this is a, a paraphrasis, no? But when you say community, you, we need to explain centers and neighborhoods, the centrality, and you develop the centrality. But in the centrality, you develop only the facility of the centrality. It's a mixture at every space, and it's good because it's a market and the station. It's a good idea. But what kind of public spaces have around? And why in this space is mineral? We don't have trees. We don't have nature here. Why? You can create uh, natural barriers in between the, the one kind of mobility, another kind of mobility, no? You, you, you can create gardens. Uh, you can vertical gardens also. We, we can create a, another kind of sustainable, sustainability in the public buildings also. And this hybridation of open spaces with architecture, architecture with public space, uh, facilities with nature, nature with the building, is the, the future. Uh, is, is the future. Is, is the future is hybrid, is mestizo. The, the future is, when you explain, and the farmers, the farmers, where uh, live the farmers? In farms or in homes in, the, in your neighborhoods. Uh, because 
what kind of new farm or farm we can develop also. And you have this linear city, but in the side of, of the linear city appears the landscape. What kind of agricultural landscape you how to control these city limits? Because the tendency always, the nature of a lineal city is to go farther and farther and farther. Don't have beginning and end. This is the problem of linear city because the linear city needs a beginning and an end. You have perhaps a beginning, but usually the station is in the middle, no in the beginning, but you have a beginning. What happened in the end? No, because you need to finish. Really is a, a, a big ship in the middle of the, the field or is a rule for create the future city? Another neighborhood like this, another one, another one. You understand my question, no? Because this is the linearity of the city from, from, from Arturo Soria and the Russian planners, etc., etc. Et but these are questions no, about reference, about nature, about relationships. Uh, to me, the more important appreciation is, is a good work, it's a good work. Uh, and the approach to me is, is very clear. No? The idea, in my opinion, a little obsessive, no? because transportation, you have free transportation, cars, buses, and, and other, and the, 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 the high, the high, the high rail, rail system. And the more important is no think in abstract terms, no think community. What kind of physical community? What kind of typology of community? Where is the center? The center is around where? And what kind of uh, little neighborhood units we have in the district? Where are the limits in between? You, you understand me? In concrete way. And also, when you are thinking in open space, a fantastic, the open, the open space is fantastic, the idea of the forest. But this, this a food forest is big, is little, is only like a square in the middle, uh, is a forest that invades all, all the landscape, is a big forest. I, I, where, you understand, because this is a, a strong idea also, no? related with farms, and uh, uh, in more concrete, because these images are, are, are fantastic, very concrete. No? We need the complement of this image. Here we have this image, but go to the other, go to the other. What happened in the limits, no? In the limits. Well, okay, guys. Uh, what, what, yeah. Sorry, what limits? The limits beyond here? Well, um, yeah. we, were, we were thinking that that would be housing. Ah, uh, 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 uh. you have another housing behind. Yes, that would be like, um, well, we project that that would be an extension of the housing okay. that has already been established. Okay, okay. It's not only a linear. Okay. We're, we're focusing on the linear. But yes. yes, I mean that's that's you know that's the question of locking in Sanket's master plan right into your project because he sort of worked on all of that. Mm -hmm. I do think I've always felt you know and then I, I I'm going to take the last word. I've always felt that the current city of Austin's transportation agenda, their mobility agenda, Project Connect. Um, is focused on the idea that the city is monocentric. And I think that we are growing in a way that suggests that we have to move towards a more polycentric organization. Ooh. And so the idea of the pink line is something that sort of grabs onto the ends of those radial systems and starts to create a kind of infrastructure along the Eastern edge where we're projecting 350,000 to 500,000 people in the next 20 years. Mm. I, I buy into that, you know, and in terms of sort of establishing stations as social 
condensers that could begin to organize urbanism, I buy into that. I also agree that maybe the infrastructure is a bit heroic <laughs> um, at this point, um, but I do really very much appreciate the thesis behind what they're doing. All right, we've got two more to do. They're both going to be looking at the same site. Um, so, Vicky, I guess you're going to go first, only because your name is first. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me share my screen. Oh, thank you guys, by the way. Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you. Welcome. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. let me know if it doesn't change slides because sometimes it does that. Um, but I'm Vicki, I am in my first year of the Master of Architecture program. Um, so for this project and looking at the large Eastern Austin um, site that we had, I chose to focus on what I call a cultural community condenser. So a space where a community can gather and have activities that really make their place their own. Um, so I started out, did the slide change? Not yet. No, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and reshare. I think I need to share my screen or my like, not just the PDA. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Wait, okay, okay, so do you see the map? I'm sorry. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so this is the map that, um, I started with and the important um, parts that I looked at were these different um, suburban or housing developments that started to kind of pop up as little islands. So those are located in the pink and they're very sporadic around East Austin. And then also in the red circles are different schools that relate to those communities. So um, a lot of it is very remote from each other. There's no really connection points that bring them together um, and then um, looking at a little bit closer in, I looked at the urban grid of the city and how there definitely is this patchwork between um, central Austin and then eastern Austin, but it does stop at the highway 185. So there definitely needs to be bigger or more corridors that lead into eastern Austin to make this more um, connected. And with the population growing at the rate that it is, um, East Austin does tend to feel a little bit more disconnected and not have a sense of community that's connected to central Austin. So going with the um, corridors in the urban plan, Austin does recognize this as the corridor Mo mobility program plan, and they've recognized 17 quarters that they find um, relatively important that they're gonna be working on. So um, I'm looking at number 13, which is also known as Colony Park. And it is um, all on its own. It's one of the few that kind of are little islands. Um, and this plan will add a different street or will add a connecting street, um, bike lanes, sidewalks, traffic signals and things like that. So looking closer at the corridor, it does connect to suburban developments. And then the really interesting thing that um, connects these developments as well as this cultural aspect of the school and um, how the school is so important because the community around it does grow up with the students in the school. And you do tend to live your life with the people that you meet throughout um, your elementary school, middle school, and high school. And then because um, Colony Park is also so up and coming, the city has developed a new Colony Park plan. So um, this is their plan for development. Um, it hasn't been built yet. It's not in the construction phase, but they are planning to um, expand the residential areas and then also add some neighborhood blocks or mixed use blocks and things like that. In addition to their plan, um, they have this education center and it's highlighted in the red circle. So a place where they could add a school. Um, however, I don't think that would be the most successful area for this school. So I wanna try and take my, I wanna propose um, a new plan for integrating a school to make it more of a community condenser that everyone in the community can use. And it's not just sitting on the intersection of a street. And so my site will be Colony Park. I'll be using the city's plan. Um, so not what is currently there. Um, and on the um, site, there are three existing buildings. There's an elementary school, 
Overton Elementary. Um, it sits next to a recreation center that is also connected and then another neighborhood um, recreation center as well. It's off of Loyola Lane. And then looking at some photos of the site. So up top is Overton Elementary School. Um, it is connected to Turner Roberts Recreation Center. So they do share similar facilities for gym classes and things like that, which is a great resource to think about when um, starting to program the site. And then the middle image is showing um, the buildings kind of combined and the two bottom images show the suburban developments within the two um, subdivisions that they're trying to bridge together. And so to start off, I looked at a lot of the cultural spaces in this site. Um, I found that schools, libraries, food and entertainment were the most important cultural spaces in regards to they shape where people go to eat, they shape where people are going and hanging out and things like that. So there are um, a lot of food retail across the highway, which makes it very inaccessible if you want to walk or do things like that. So most of that is um, you can see the black up here. And then there is one library in the area, which is the red um, below it, which makes it even more inaccessible if students want to walk from existing schools, which are the other red um, buildings to do their homework after school or to meet there on the weekends, things like that. So um, it is very spread out. There are a few smaller grocery stores next to Colony Park site, which is right here. But other than that, they don't really have this cultural resource. And so I started thinking about um, education in the program itself and the population growth for the site. And so the Austin, Texas government website says that the absolute number of children in the city is going up and school systems will have a hard time managing this increase, which um, is definitely obvious. Our site is located known as the LBJ site. So it is next to Lyndon B. Johnson High School. Um, it's in the green. So it means that 85 to 100 percent or 110% will be residing in the area by 2026, which is a huge increase. And then also um, the census map does show that most of the homes in the area, um, it's highlighted in blue. There was no color that really stood out better, but um, most of the homes, 40% or more are have children or households. So um, definitely it's important to start thinking about expanding the schools and um, getting more of a community center. So diving in just to look at the house, the housing really quick, um, there are these archipelagos of sub suburban development. So as you can see, they seem very disconnected. They're only really connected by roads or streets, which are very inconvenient. Um, you'd have to walk across a large park or drive to someone. So um, I really wanna try and solve that problem as well. But this park is also connected to the city center, which is great. So like you heard previously, there is a green line. Um, the tracks are built, but it is not operating yet. So it does run um, north of the site and there will be a stop um, at the Northern edge and then there are a lot of Austin City bus stops along Loyola, more so than um, most other streets. And then another form of transportation that tends to be overlooked are school buses. Um, they do bring a large demographic to the site in the mornings and can take children home after school or after school activities. So things in the evening, things like that. So it is very accessible to a lot of people, um, which is great. And so when thinking about making this community um, condenser, I thought about, I wanted to reference kind of a historic cultural form from Texas and the town square or courtyard square really stood out to me because it can be a prominent small town feature in Texas that has been really successful in previous years and has really brought together um, smaller developments which can relate to these kind of archipelagos of housing. Um, and so I feel that this would be a great step towards creating something that would allow the community to gather. And so zooming out, this is just kind of showing how important these squares are to Texas and how the history of Texas has been kind of shaped by them. So this is only a few. There are so many more. If you go on Google Earth, there's thousands, not thousands, but hundreds, I'm sure. Um, so it is very important to Texas and it has been obviously very successful. So when starting my design, I began to look at um, 
different projection lines and connection points that I wanted to make. So right now you're seeing a lot of the pre-existing buildings or the buildings that are planning to be there with the Colony Park plan and the sidewalks. So I looked at these different um, sidewalk streets and infrastructures to develop um, different projection lines that would try and shape my project. So the most prominent projection line that I made was um, on the facade of these three existing buildings. And this um, started to shape the square for what I wanted the school to be revolved around. Um, and this is just because I feel like the school could benefit from sharing similar resources and things like that. So um, like I said, these share for gym classes and um, for other activities. And so after making these projection lines, um, they started to form their own shapes and give them kind of smaller parks or um, uses for different programs. So for example, there's one with a baseball field or a football field or soccer field um, and different seating elements and things like that. And so two key aspects to my design concept were park expansion from the Colony Park plan. I didn't want these parks to just stop at this Austin corridor. I, that they were planning to build. I really wanted them to integrate into the site. Um, and then also the residential connection. I really want parents and kids to feel welcome to walk um, to the site and not feel like they have to drive. So more paths and things like that. And so when developing the overall plan, I started looking at different programs. So there's going to be three different programs on the site. There's neighborhood centers, um, education spaces, and then retail and commercial space. So I started developing um, what buildings I thought were most essential. So I looked at the different neighborhood spaces and um, what came to mind were public libraries and then recreation space. And the great thing about the site, like I said, it already has the recreation space, but the library is um, on the other side of the highway. So I thought it was critical to add a library to this site. And I thought that it would be best to place this in the center of the square, just because not only is it a prominent neighborhood center, but it also can be shared with the education buildings that surround it. And so this proposed library is around 80,000 square feet. And just to compare, the cent central library is 120,000. So it is relatively smaller, but it wouldn't necessarily just be a single story building. Um, it would definitely be more prominent for East Austin. And then looking at um, the education space, I wanted to look more at a high school because there is only LBJ in the area and there are a lot of other elementary schools and middle schools. And so LBJ is highlighted in the red. Um, and I got this um, idea to kind of split up the buildings and make it more campus-like to incorporate the landscape and maybe walk to class outside or things like that. So I wanted to give it more of a campus feeling um, along the square. And then they can also share the same facilities like I have been saying um, around the site. So this high school can hold up to 1500 students. It's around 200,000 square feet. And in comparison, McCallum High School is around 265,000 square feet and has a capacity of 2000. 2000 students, but it can definitely grow. Buildings can be expanded over time and things like that. And then last, the last program is um, retail and commercial space. So um, a lot of this cultural food and um, entertainment spaces are on the other side of the highway. Um, in the Colony Park plan, there are a few blocks that do um, call for retail and mixed use space. So they are highlighted in blue. They're a little bit less opaque just because they're not built yet. So it's just the city block, but I wanted to expand that and try and make an area that um, connected off of that. So as you can see, the buildings start to form from these city blocks. Um, on the Colony Park plan. And this is then geared more towards community businesses for neighbors to support neighbors. It's not necessarily gonna be a target in there. It's, it's more just um, like a graphic design studio or a coffee shop or things like that. And so when looking at these programs, I really wanted to make sure they weren't um, gonna distract from one another. I don't want an elementary schooler to be distracted looking out the window and seeing a coffee shop during the day or things like that. So the views to and from the site were really critical. Um, so a lot of it does look into more of the landscape um, and depending on the program, but a lot of them do share the same um, views to the football field and community spaces that they can both share.
And so this is just kind of the plan with the Colony Park um, development plan. So you can see um, how all of them start to mix together. But the final plan does look like this. Um, and you can um, see how all the buildings start to shape in the sidewalks. And then another key element, because it, this is a school and because there are so many different aspects to it, it really is important to add infrastructure that increases mobility. So um, I do know people will be driving to the site um, to and from school for pickups, maybe even to go to the shops or things like that. So I added another um, street through the site um, next to the school's front facade. Emergency vehicles can also go on the square or um, throughout the residential, or not residential, I'm sorry, um, retail space as well. And then I really wanted to encourage a lot of walking. So a lot of it is pale trails and pathways. Um, I really wanted to encourage that people don't need to use their cars everywhere that they go. And so this is an axon um, just showing kind of how it all starts to play out in the public spaces that are created within the parks. And so this is a section of long ways of the site. Um, it does slope quite a bit in certain areas. So as you can see the taller areas, this is where the school is. And then on this side, this is where the resident, or I'm so sorry, the commercial and retail areas are. But in the smaller valley is where I place the football field in a critical point because I wanted to use this slope terrain as maybe seeding, grass seeding for graduation ceremonies or games or things like that. And this is um, looking up from the valley up into the um, quad. And this is just cutting through the baseball um, diamond. So it's next to the Overton Elementary School. It's relatively flat up until um, you get to some of the high school buildings. And so um, this is the school square that I'm envisioning. So like I said, I want this to be used more as like an outdoor hallway from class to class or as a gym class could maybe practice yoga um, on the park or maybe there's an off-campus cafeteria out there with food trucks, things like that. An activity fair could go on. So it's very student geared and really encourages student connection. And then this is the sports field that's in the valley like that I was talking about. It can be used for football, soccer, track, all those sorts of things, but also um, band concerts or graduation ceremonies. So it, it is very versatile, just more of a gathering space between that bridges the education and the community together. And then this is what I call the commercial square. So it's by those retail um, buildings. And this might be more of a light, nighttime, lively, um, event with maybe a concert or farmers markets, things like that. And lastly, I feel that a lot of these communities could benefit from this um, idea. So I started to look at how other schools can implement this throughout Austin, and I have highlighted all the schools. However, the red schools with the circles around them are areas that I feel that could use a better sense of community or could implement some of these similar concepts to them, just so we can start really engaging in these condensers. But thank you, that is it. Thank you, Victoria. That was an excellent presentation and I really have to commend you for your intention to really think about the children and their elementary school experience. You know, we have an issue in Austin, for those of you not from Austin, where I was working with the AISD, the school district on renovating their buildings and what they're doing is closing down neighborhood schools where children used to be able to walk to their school and they're centralizing them miles away where they have to have now this phenomenon that I didn't grow up with, which is drop off and pick up by your parent. And I, I want you to think about what if you're an eight-year-old child, you live in a single parent household, that parent is working two jobs. Can that child walk to his or her elementary school in this master plan you're thinking of right and yeah, did you do residential design in order to assure that because they go hand in hand you can't have a school well, without enough students was, oh sorry um the residential I was thinking was more from the colony park plan that the city was developing okay so that's 
again, going in a way you're shooting yourself in the foot because I like the idea, but it, as soon as you start to say a campus for a high school, I'm thinking, why not a tall building for a high school? Why make them walk outside from class to class um, when you could preserve more land for them to go into the woods or into nature? So you're going to take up a lot more land if you implement that across the city. I'd much rather see you look at that that child. It's crazy in American culture that we are having parents go at eight in the morning and three in the afternoon who can take off work at three, not many people to pick up their children because they cannot walk to their schools. And you mentioned so sensitively, 40% of households have children and this, this is going to increase. I think looking at that is a really good point of view. The high schools, I'm not worried as much. The high school students don't need their parents, but those younger kids at the moment are re relying on grownups to get to and from school and that's hurting them and it's hurting their parents. So I really like that you started with that and I would have challenged whatever development you looked at. I know you don't have the time in the semester to do that, but I would challenge those city plans. And when you go out into work as well, challenge your employer to really speak to what you kind of had the idea of these paths where children can walk to the school. Um, think how you could actually make that happen. To have an elementary school, you need a critical mass for them to build that building, which means you need the neighborhood around it and enough people. So you can't really get that unless you do densify. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Wait, I think you're muted. Well, um, um, well, be, mm, good presentation, good presentation, very, very well done. Uh, um, this, the last image, the last image, to me is, is this idea of creating places by schools, no? or the, this capacity of, of replicancy of this project, to me is, is, is a good idea. No? How, in, in the past presentation, uh, Dean said me, uh, we are trying to develop a more decentralized uh, uh, development. No? Uh, the, 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 I understand better with this the idea of linear city in transport, but in your case, this kind of infills, infills uh, uh, around these uh, public uh, or private facilities, but condensers, you, you say, you know, is, is, is the replicancy of this idea, to me, is good, because it's not only a little project. You know? To me, it's... Um, well... Uh, only um, if you, I agree with the, the, the previous comments, no? uh, but the, the solution is not only a campus, well done by you, no? and with connections with uh, the commercial square, with the city, etc., etc., no? the urban uses. No? I would like to be more invasive and more, more idealistic, perhaps, no? transform it also the uh, real estate production. And in this, uh, like it, it, the, the potential of this condenser to catalyze the change around is the function of this, this, this uh, uh, acupunctural action in the city. One, another, little, 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 little neighborhoods can infills, can change with the idea of campus, an hybrid campus, also with commerce, etc., etc., more urban campus, but like an octopus, like a network, introducing uh, connections with housing with the public spaces, with you explain mixed uses, where are the, 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 the structure of these uh, places? No? You have open spaces, triangular spaces, this kind of, the Italian name Largos is an square, but, but is, is a square with 
with its little, little, uh, uh, without form, no? but, but um, you need to create connection and create an hybridation also in the uh, real, in the, in the housing development. You explain, go to the, fair, the, the, the housing development, uh, the, the, when you, the master plan, no? because I, I, I like this, when you, your project in this image seems, is, is very similar to the others. If you don't have the idea, the first image, I don't know where is your infill here or here or, or is it there? You understand me? You need to create connections. You have the open spaces, but not this kind of parks, also public spaces. You, you manage the centralities. I don't know if, if I can, the central spaces, no? I don't know, I don't know, no, I don't know if I, 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 I don't, uh, I, I can uh, I can draw no I don't can well uh, uh, the the connection with the other other spaces no the in the north in the, not only houses and uh, subdivisions no also public space little centralities uh, um, selective facilities public buildings no this is the the the, the question, but your project is, is very clear and the, 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 is, to do this is not very difficult. The, the idea of your, your decision of to develop this cultural community condenser is a good idea. The condenser is well done and only I see the replicancy of the idea when you saw the last image is fantastic in the, in the urbanity, in the new urbanity of, 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 of Austin, but you have the opportunity to create more value, creating also neighborhood, more livable spaces. Okay, thank you. Uh, Victoria, I also really liked your project and I also liked the very clear way through which you, you, you walked us along the the process and and um, and the design. Um, a lot has been already said uh, by by uh, Juliana and Juan Luis, but I do want to uh, add a couple of things. Um, I also think, just like Juliana, that this idea of using schools as a motor for activation is very powerful. Is one that is very contemporary in American urbanism. And by com contemporary, I mean, um, it's something we should really look at right now as the right time to do it. Um, and uh, I very much agree with Juliana that, you know, there is really a desire that we all have to um, invert this um, process of, uh, um, how to say, closure of, of our schools in our communities. The experience of you know, dropping off your kid to school is almost becoming uh, militarized, you know, if you think of it the way, and I, I say that as a, as a father of a five-year-old, the way in which like <laughs> drive all the way to, um, to the entrance and then the teacher will open, only the teacher can open the door of your car and take your kid directly from the car seat into the classroom it's the opposite of um what um, what it could be right the moment in which you connect with your community by meeting your teachers meeting the parents of the other kids meeting the friends of your kid um so can we undo that and i think your project is trying to do that um and you do it at different layers with different schools so there's something certainly very very interesting there I, I like your project all around, and because I like it all around, I also have to criticize it. So you, 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 will, <laughs> you will allow me. Um, and I use this point that I'm going to make as a point that I think it can serve also other students. Um, Jan Gell, who is uh, the founder of the firm I work uh, for, a Danish architect, always used to tell me, uh, Gigo, when you are designing a public space, try to find to think hard about the right size. And when you think you have found the right size, 
make it smaller. Uh, <laughs> so there's something about all of your project, you guys, where you think you make things too big. And we, you know, in our discipline, we cannot allow ourselves to not to 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 let scale go out of control. We have to control very well the issues of scales. Public space. It's also the food we eat. Say that, <laughs> say that again, Dean. <laughs> we also eat food that's too big. <laughs> Yeah, there is, there is some there is a problem with bigness, right? That that I see a little bit all around. And you know, when I come to Austin, I recognize that when I start to walk in the streets of your downtown and everything is big, the traffic lights and the street signs. So, uh, you know, I don't want to uh, criticize that, but do you think that tax no. is at the end of the spectrum when it comes to scale of things? You you know, you need to spend. If you live in Austin, you have to spend a month in, in, in Venice, right? To kind of rebalance yeah, yourself yeah. with the city that's at the other end of the spectrum where everything is minute, is fine grained, is tight, is compressed. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think that your project is beautiful, but things are a little bit too big, right? And too big in two ways. They're too big in terms of the, sky, the, the, the size of the spaces, the rendering that you show are very beautiful, but actually I doubt that those spaces would be that vibrant because, because you made them so big that the same amount of people would be sprawling around and would be disappearing from the shot okay. with, with, your, with, with, your, with your rendering. And then the other thing, your campus is also quite big. So it's a very large radius um, that it requires, you know, the feeder, um, uh, the territory that it serves is very big. And I know that you want that people walk there, but again, there's people that walk faster, people that walk slower, there's people <laughs> that walk very little because they're old or, or sick. And so a lot of people eventually would possibly wait for the bus, yes, but a lot of people would drive there. And therefore the campus in order to exist would rely on a massive surface parking, which is probably what you don't want. Because either that a mall, uh, you know, relies on a, on a surface parking, they're usually four five, even six times the size of the buildings themselves. So for every urban, you know, intervention, you need six times as much space to uh, store the automobile. So think about that, think about, the scale of the campus as a, as a whole, the scale of the spaces within and, and, and make everything much tighter. And then I think you will get to the vibrancy uh, that you're looking for. Thank you. Okay, we've got one more to do. Um, Stane, yep. you ready? Yeah. Hey, can you guys see my screen? Uh -huh. um, so I'm Danae and uh, me and Vicky actually did a similar project. We were working together up until a couple weeks ago. Um, so like the prompt of our projects are the same, but I like we took a different direction on how they kind of came to be. Does that make sense? So, um, yep. so we started looking at um, the entire site as a whole, the entirety of East Austin. And one thing that I noticed was that the neighborhoods are all very isolated and they don't really have a lot of connections to each other. And seeing as how Austin is planning on sprawling out in horizontal fashion, um, that obviously would have to change and you'd have to kind of start stitching these neighborhoods together. So that's what I wanted to tackle with my project. And then also, um, with the development of the green line and the bus stops that were already here, this site just seemed to be the perfect place to start like kind of creating that connection piece. Um, and so this is a zoomed in version of the site, which would be over here. And so you can see these neighborhoods are very separate from each other. And so for my project, I wanted to stitch them together and integrate them together, but also create a space that provided amenities and kind of brought a little bit of Austin 
outside of downtown. Um, so yeah, so this diagram is showing everything that's not housing in this area. And so you can see there's not a lot of it. Um, it's mostly like grocery stores and smaller shops and things like that. Uh, so I wanted to tackle that. And then also the schools, because there is um, an elementary school on our site, I looked at the schools that are in this area, and most of them are across the highways, aside from the high school, which is right here, and then a few other elementary schools that are around. Um, so I figured that a high school and adding some pieces of Austin to this place would be the perfect way to kind of um, jumpstart this development of this area. And then again, this is the Colony Park plan for Austin and they're planning on adding more housing around here and coming down into this area as well. So when I figured out what I wanted to do for this project, I started thinking about why people are moving to Austin and what makes it a desirable city over other cities in Texas or other cities in the US. And I figured that it was because Austin feels like a small community, even though it is a big city, there are lots of community spaces around that you can't really find in other cities. And there's an interesting music scene, there's an interesting art scene, there's a lot of street art that's encouraged and murals are encouraged, which you don't really see a lot of in certain cities. Um, but there's also a really big connection and emphasis on nature and having that integrated within the city as well. So I wanted to combine these um, these aspects into my project. And that led me to decide on five different things that I think a city needs in order to be desirable and make people want to live there. So you need a place to live, um, like a place to call your own and to go to bed and to um, just kind of be your own person, um, a place to breathe, which I think of as nature and just being able to go into a untouched landscape without having to completely leave the city that you're in, a place to move, so a place to exercise, a place to work out, play um, sports and things like that, a place to work, so um, a place to basically just shop and kind of go and shop and um, buy things and sell things as well and just like kind of have a purpose. And then lastly, a place to learn. So a place to learn about the world around you. Um, and I feel like this can happen in a lot of different places. Well, all of these can happen in a lot of different ways, but I decided on five specific programs that would facilitate these activities. So a housing, a um, park, a field, a retail area, and a school. So that kind of became the driver for my project. And the school, I wanted to be this kind of tether piece within my larger project. So the high school in my project is right here in this area. And it's basically bringing all of these neighborhoods together into this one space, along with a retail area to shop at and a park to live in, or not live in, but like walk around and experience. And so that brings us to my projects. This is the overall site plan and um, I mentioned before, and a, a big part of it was integrating and stitching together these neighborhoods and also the neighborhoods that will be there, as well as the green spaces that will be in between them. So I created trails that lead down from these green spaces into my project. And these roads go across east to west or west to east and then north to south um, and kind of brings everybody together to the central location. So taking a closer look at my intervention. So this is the housing development here. I kind of diverged a little bit from the original community or colony park plan because I felt that this would fit my kind of presentation better. Um, and then the park area is mostly up here, but it does extend down to the field. And I wanted the field to be connected to both the Overton Elementary School, the high school I was designing, and the recreational center, which is over here. Um, and this is the school. So uh, like Victoria, I did want to break down the school and turn it into a series of buildings rather than just one massive one so that not just students would feel 
like they could go there like more um more of the community could go there and like go to a class in non-school hours or just like see students work or just be in the campus and experience that area and then the retail area is down here and it's connected to Arroyo Lane, which would be here, which is a major street in this area. So I felt that would be the perfect place to put commercial spaces and shops and things so that people who aren't necessarily in these neighborhoods could drive from Austin to here if they wanted. Um, so for the different community spaces, uh, for the field, I also wanted to kind of make this more accessible as well. So, um, if you've never been to a Texas like high school football stadium, they're mostly pretty big concrete like um, monoliths in a way. Like they're very imposing and they're very uh, like they aren't accessible if you aren't specifically going to a football field or going to a football game. You really don't have a reason to be there, and I feel like that's a disservice to the community because it is such a large thing that people from the community should be able to go in there and play a game of football or run around the track or do things like that. Um, so I took away the walls and made it this open field that anyone could go on to. And then for the academic courtyards, I um, kind of stitched the school together with academic courtyards and I wanted the, these courtyards to be more of an extension of the school. So for example, on a nice day, you could eat lunch out there or you could study or you could hang out with your friends, but also it becomes a space where the public can be too. So for example, you could have a yoga class there or another kind of outdoor class that doesn't necessarily apply to the greater high school. And then for the plazas near the south end of the site where the shops and things are, I envisioned having like having the school be integrated with that rather than having them be these two separate entities that don't really mix because I feel like students could easily use these spaces and will go to these spaces since they're right there. So I envision like having an outdoor art gallery for students work or having a stage for performances um, or having a farmer's market or in a market to sell their artwork or to sell like food that they grow in an agriculture class and being able to manage food trucks and cook food for people. And just creating like a giant space or a large space for neighborhoods to go and to be among each other, to be and to interact. And then lastly, we will finish with a um, kind of a rendering of the park area. So for the park, I was inspired by the hiking trails of Austin. And those are, they're, I feel like very well integrated into the city. And it's something that a lot of cities don't have, like they feel very concrete and built up. But Austin has a lot of places that aren't like that and are more natural and allowed to just be as they are. So I wanted to integrate that into the project as well and create a space that People could go for a stroll or people could walk their dogs and see like their neighbors or people from other neighborhoods that they wouldn't ordinarily see. <clears throat> and so overall for my project, I wanted this to not be necessarily a replacement for Austin, but to more bring some of the amenities and some of the things that make Austin a desirable city out to the Eastern periphery of Austin so that it also is a desirable place to live. Thank you, Danae. I am so glad you tackled those high school stadiums. Whenever I talk to colleagues who come over from Europe and they see the size of our stadiums for high school sports, they tell me this was the size of what we have for our national leagues or even our city leagues. This is crazy to have such huge stadiums just for high school students. So I'm really glad you opened that up to the city and the community. Um, because otherwise they are empty so much of the year and that's such a waste of land not to share that. So kudos to you for that and for your willingness to tackle that. Um, be careful again, I would say with this campus mentality and view to greenery. Of course, we have a lot of greenery and a lot of view to greenery in Austin, 
and as you're you're intervening in some green areas already, one of the presentations before you mentioned, I think Victoria mentioned, you know, we don't want children to look out at a cafe. My question is, why not? You know, why not have an <laughs> urban scene for the kids, for the high school students to have some lively places they meet for a cafe, you know, in a cafe and talk with, get to know their cafe owners. And, you know, why not a little more um, urbanism instead of all of the greenery and all of the park space, which is very land intensive why not some higher rise um, residential you know if you put even just a few towers here and there in Zurich they do it they'll put a tower maybe it's only 10 stories but for them that's a tower you know it's all relative and then they'll have smaller two and three story um, multifamily housing around that so why not punctuate a few of those around and have some urban center areas for those high school students and elementary students even I know that wasn't the goal of your studio. I know landscape yeah. is, <laughs> you were pushed in another direction, but I just want you to think critically about that. Mm -hmm. no, but I, I think Juliana, what you say is very interesting because uh, in a way, um, I, I think the studio was, was great at, uh, um, how to say, uh, illuminate issues of scale. Uh, so mm -hmm. of course, um, the premise of the studio is such that we, we are looking for solutions that are different from the ones that we would seek in dense urban environments. But the issue of scale and the issue of the human scale remain very, very important. And I think that many of you, uh, the reviewers I've heard today are really hitting on this point. Be even if we are creating something that is overall a lower density doesn't mean that we can create pockets of spaces that have greater density and intensity because that is how we create the vibrancy that we're looking for. Thank you, Juliana, for saying, what's wrong about looking at someone that is drinking in a you know, coffee in a cafe if you are in a school? I very much agree. I think that actually what makes cities interesting places is our ability to see one another, to watch one another. You know, the people watching remains one of the most enriching activities that as human beings we can we can we can really experience because we this is how we we understand one another, right? Mm -hmm. um, so in your project um, so, so to get to this you know to talk now about the project I think that I really, really loved um, all of your um, uh, initial diagrams, sk sketches through which you're explaining your narrative is very, very well um, described. And uh, you have a very nuanced and subtle way to talk about what you're trying to do. And what you're trying to do is very, very compelling. Finally, when we saw some of those images, again, I really wished you pack things a little bit closer together. You um, layered more programs in order to get to some of the things that you had, you know, outlined as, as your goals in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want to end up being labeled as, oh, here's the Italian architect that says that everything should be like Venice. This is, <laughs> not, this is not what I'm trying to do. And actually, as I was listening to you and I, and I, and I was listening to Victoria, I was also thinking, you know, about this Texan, uh, public spaces uh, that actually have a smaller scale. And Victoria speaks about the Texan Square, um, which is all about a very um, active crust and a compressed open space with, you know, that has construction around and then the building in the middle. But I also think of, you know, the, the old idea of, of, of Main Street, um, the adjoint buildings, the active ground floor. Um, I think of the neighborhood uh, 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 playground. So you have looking at actually at the uh, history of East Austin specifically, um, um, a series of examples of open spaces that have a human scale. Um, so my encouragement in order to make justice to your uh, beautiful project, try to really work on, on that, on the scale and on the layering of diverse activities as a way to really achieve the goals that you're, you are um, trying to uh, work for. 
Thank you. Can you go back to our site plan, uh, Danae? In this only, only a little moment. Uh, uh, the project share clearly the, the philosophy of the project and, and the, this idea of creating around the school uh, a condenser of public life to transform uh, little by little the city is very clear. No? Uh, I agree with the idea of the study also, this idea of landscape cities, and I respect a lot the, the difference between European and American cities because we have uh, included the more dense cities or more historical cities in America. Our cities are, are very different. Also, also French cities and Italian cities are different to Spanish cities, but or Catalonia cities to Castilian cities, but but in a different uh, with a common ground. No, uh, two only two things. No, um, one 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 thing is when you say uh, a place to work, you go to retail or go to commerce. Home became also a place of work, and uh, this this functionality, this difference between functions. We need to create a mixture in, in this idea. And the, the buildings have sections. This, this is little related with, with the, the idea of geo, no? The, the game of scales, no? the game of scales. I don't discuss the question of this big building, the library, the Texan, it's, it's a reflection. But I agree with the, the, the scale of public space is related with the scale and the activity in the floor, in the first level of the buildings. And if you understand buildings only by blo like blocks, the buildings have the floor level and the floor level is, is in an intermediate space between public and private. You know? uh, we have the, in, in, in Europe this, this, this Mm, eh, eh, street with porticos, no? the, the porticos, the, the, with, with shadows, no? etc. In Bologna, in Valladolid, in Mexico. No? And this difference between uh, uh, typologies is great different. You can create more mixture of typologies. No? And this mixture of typologies permit to classify the public space and create different uh, scales of the spaces. No? Because the idea of campus is very clear. No? And I understand, I like this, this football like a big football field, like a big square open. No? It's under, uh, one Texan friend say me that, that football in Texas is a religion. I don't know, but football is very important. No? And this, this space, introduced inside the campus, not closed by good, but in, in the project, this one unit is little related with the unit, the other unit, and the, this, the game of scales is the relation, is how to game, how to play this game, is introducing a mm, clear relationship be, between buildings, the life of buildings, the floor level, the plan of the floor level, and the different uses. No? But uh, it's a general reflection. No? Uh, this, this idea of infills around the, the schools and transforming by schools the, 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 the periphery of this landscape city is a very good idea. No? Also the, the tramway, the uh, a transformation founded in, in, in public transport is a good idea, no? Uh, uh, yes, uh, these are my, my comments. No? Because, yes. because the students know that, you know, I'm constantly dumping precedents on them. Um, I have two more to mention uh, because I can't let you get away without doing that. And one of them is actually Philip Johnson's um, school in Houston, the University of St. Thomas which actually breaks down the, the, the school into a campus, but it does it by creating a network of colonnades 
that actually starts linking it together and helping to define the space. So that interstitial space that is sort of between landscape and building, I think is actually something that's kind of missing from both these two projects, to be honest. The other one, uh, which is one of my favorite, speaking of football fields, is Cranbrook, the Allele Saarinen's plan for Cranbrook, in which the buildings actually wrap around the football field. And in the case of the, the Todd Williams pro building there and uh, Maneo's building there, they actually open up onto the football field like voyeurs, right? Um, which I think is really interesting. Like, we don't always need to look at these things necessarily as... as separated components, even within the context of a landscape strategy. Um, but anyway, uh, it's been a very long day. I want to give you guys a chance to um, make some final comments. Yeah. Well, great work, everybody. I have to commend you on a very challenging project. You know, you many of you have not worked at this scale before, and it's of course very difficult. There's so much to consider, and um, Texas is challenging in its own way. So you were very brave, and it was very impressive work that all of you, all of you did. Um, my one comment would be to in the next phase, think about the future of these developments, not just 50 years from now, but 100, 200 years from now as we see Austin is growing so rapidly and how do you absorb that population? So what I really wanted to see was um, absorbing people. So looking at the floor to area ratio or um, even per capita issues, like how many miles traveled, things like this, which I know in other studios you will get, but be thinking just in the backs of your minds, how we absorb such a growing population, if it continues to grow and it seems like it's going to. But overall, great work, everybody. Thank you, Juliana. Well, Juan Luis and Gigo have a little different perspective because they have been a little more connected to the studio before. <laughs> the, 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 the issue of the central object is very difficult. It's very difficult, an intervention in this kind of space because the complexity of this landscape city with this in a in, in a city like Ash Austin, you say so the, so dynamic, you no, know, the dynamics of this city, the change, the presence of nature, the 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 relationship between this last paradigm of cars, 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 and create a new paradigm of more human city, more pedestrian city, the scale, the human scale, you say, Gail, you are the defenders, the world defenders of this idea, no? It's very clear, no? And, and, and uh, I, 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 I teach a lot to my students, you, you go live between buildings and other. I like very much this, this was how to, the, uh, the, the, how to study public life. I like very, very, this book is very interesting, no? Because it's the question, is to, to create community, create common grounds, create public spaces, create an, another uh, uh, kind of um, uh, public life, a common, common ground in, in open sense, no? Public realm in the sense of Hannah Arendt, no? To re re recovery the, 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 the public, in front of the social, no, of the, the big, the max city, the massive, no, this kind. I like the, the program of Dean and Juan a lot, but I recognize for the students the difficulty. It's not easy to work. For this, the, last, the, the scale of this project, the argument of the school, create, um, change the scale and, and create another kind of value, no? but we are moving and also in, in, in a project. But uh, to me, it's a pleasure to uh, work with the students and, and I, I believe the challenge of the studio is a great challenge. I believe this idea of landscape city is a good idea, you know, and you need to work uh, more and more and more in it. You know? Thank you very much. For, for your Thank you, Paul Luis. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Juan Luis. Uh, and and uh, also, uh, I want to say, Juan Luis, I, I, I knew of your work, but I had never had a chance of meeting you in person. So it is a real pleasure for me to be sitting on this review with you and, and to hear your words. Um, I want to build on what Juan Luis uh, said today. Uh, yes, um, you guys were thrown a, a curveball. Uh, this is not an easy um, topic for a studio, but I think it is so important that your um, professors, your instructor uh, are venturing with you in this territory. It is really, really important. Um, as a urban designer that was trained in Europe and that has lived in the US for the last 10 years, I think a lot about what is lost in translation as you move from Europe to America, when you take European models and you try to apply in America. And I, it, it's something that is really constantly uh, um, coming back to me and I kind of evolve my thinking about it. If you were to ask me today, I, I, I'm, I got to a point where I understand that, you know, um, there is a lot of European models that are actually forced into American urbanism, and that is a problem. Um, no matter how much I like European urbanism, I was born and raised. Totally I'm sorry, Juan Luis. Totally agree. And you know, and uh, Juan Luis uh, mentioned Bologna, the city where I was born, so I, I could speak at, at length about how mu how much I. I love certain features of European urbanism, but we have to be um, aware that uh, trying to superimpose those canons and those models over the American city is just uh, not gonna work. So how do we uh, move from that excessive um, uh, stress of European models in American urbanism? I think we do it uh, certainly by changing the conversation. And I think that the framing of the studio was first and foremost about changing the conversation by giving you um, uh, a series of premises which will not take you toward um, solutions that are um, certainly well tried, but in a way not sufficient anymore to give a good response to the problems uh, that American cities are facing today. Um, and so it, to me, it's been very refreshing to listen to your work, to your research, to your thinking, because it's been a way to steer away from an excessive um, interest in, in certain European models that has been for, for way too long present in, uh, in, in, uh, in American urbanism. Now, there are certain things that still hold true and that I think you still wanna work with. That's why I insisted so much about the human scale. Even in the landscape city, the human scale is, a, is something we have to strive for and, and it's something that we have to deliver on. Um, even in a landscape city, vibrancy comes from diversity of programs by overlap, by friction, by gentle friction among things. So we have to reestablish the kind of these pockets of intensity. Um, but if we do that and, and we combine that with these other solutions that you guys have put over the table through your projects, we can really get closer to, 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 to um, uh, to respond to many of the challenges that, that American cities um, have today. And I think that is what is most exciting about your work. And really, I want to commend you for, you know, be brave and, and tackle the studio, which was complex and really deliver um, great, great work. So congratulations. Thank you, Gigo. That's, that's what we were trying to do. To, that the, the way you say it is very true, changing the conversation. And we don't talk about this, you know, it's just going to happen. So we may as well confront it because it's, it's, it's happening. <laughs> we can hide and do the ostrich and get, look somewhere else and say, pretend that 
and kind of trash talk trash about it but it's going to keep happening so we better go in there and try to address the reality of how things uh, are happening you know so well dean i don't know if we you know we we can say goodbye to the reviewers this, this is well past the time that we, they were committed to so it's 50 minutes later we were late but we i was i was i was you know thinking that we were going to be later than you but you ended up being yeah. later is <laughs> tomorrow. To, yeah, today yeah. is tomorrow now. Yeah, for Juan Luis is past midnight, so it's, it's <laughs> almost one o'clock in the morning. So we need to we need to be respectful. So Dean, I don't know, if, you know. So thank you, Juan Luis. Thank you, Gigo. Thank you, Juliana. It was thank you. Fantastic. Thank you for all the support during the whole semester uh, for Juan Luis and Gigo. Yeah. Uh, Dean, do you want to do you want to uh, still talk to the students? I know that we have lost several of them. Do we want to? do it in another way via email or i think you know i think we should say thank you and goodbye to our reviewers and then let's spend five or ten minutes um with the students okay well because so, uh, otherwise they're all going to disappear uh, juliana, to juliana yeah. Vigo, <laughs> thank you yes it was a pleasure to meet both of you really <laughs> so nice pleasure. dean and juan good job Thank yeah, you. great work. Thank you for Thank the invitation. You so much. Thank, Thank you so you much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye to all the students. Bye, Juan Luis. Okay, so I think that we are down to nine. We have lost, I think, I think six students. I know Haley had to go. I don't see Nick. I don't see several, but uh, well, it was a long day. They keep calling me. <laughs> I mean, everybody calls after five thinking that we're done but, do you guys want this conversation to be on the live stream still uh, actually